International Research and Educational Society presents Derek Partridge, Jordan Maxwell, and special guest Bill Jenkins. Hello, I'm Derek Partridge. Because of the nature of this program, we felt that it was important for me to tell you a little about my background. I've been a journalist, author, TV reporter, news anchor, and talk show host for some 30 years in England, Rhodesia, and the United States, where I was a news anchor with Financial News Network, hosted Law in America, and Emmy Award-winning PBS specials. I've also been a spokesman for such companies as Bank of America, Transamerica Occidental, the American Red Cross, Warner Brothers, and Arm and Hammer. I've never belonged to any organized religious group, and my personal beliefs are simple and basic, to do the most conscious good and the least conscious evil during my life. Mr. Bill Jenkins. Man's religions, all from the very beginning of recorded time, even into the pre-Cro-Mangan days, is filled with symbolism and traditions as he tried to do something to put himself right with forces greater than he his creator could have been a fire or a cloud or a mountain as man became more sophisticated he became more sophisticated in his concept of really what that power was above him but with all of those traditions came symbolism symbolism for Judaism and Christianity is this the Holy Grail, filled with wine. Or was it blood? To find out more about that symbolism, let's go to Barbara Walker's book, A Woman's Dictionary of Symbols and Sacred Objects, to find out about the cup. Symbolism of the cup is complex, beginning with matriarchal images of the womb vessel and passing on to its patriarchal replacement, another kind of blood-filled chalice of resurrection. The cup remained, the blood was masculinized. The womb's life-giving moon blood was reinterpreted as the blood of a male who naturally had to die to produce it because men never could learn the female trick of bleeding without injury, though it wasn't for lack of trying. In dying, the male victim became a savior whose blood was supposed to give rebirth just as mother blood used to do. Symbolism, symbolism in all of our religious life. But the ancients were right, those that predate even Judaism and Christianity. There is something about having a proper relationship with forces greater than you. Today we'd say there is something right about having a proper relationship with the creator of this universe, our creator. Many believe that there is a part piece of that creator who is a part of us that we need these learning experiences to become more godly. That our nature, character, and personality is naturally the same nature, character, and personality as the one who created us. Now the question is, does that come in myths? Does that come to you through traditions, ritual, rote? Or does it come through doing, really wanting to be that way? Not doing it out of fear. Not doing it because someone told you that if you do certain things, that you will be very godly. That you will be actually fulfilling this great need, which is a part of all of us, and that is to have a right relationship with that force greater than us, the Creator, God. Let's look at this symbol of Christianity, the cup filled with wine. It had its origin in Christian history, when Jesus had the Last Supper with the disciples, and he told them that this cup, which was filled with wine then, represented his blood, which was given for the salvation of all mankind. Here again, the masculine giving his blood, whereas the woman can give her blood without hurting. Traditions, symbolisms. Is there anything magical, really, about a cup of wine? 
Later on, the grail or the cup itself took on great new powers and became known as the Holy Grail, and it was what caused the Crusades to go down and search for it. It's magical wonders. Really. Are we looking for magic when we look to try to improve the quality of our spiritual life? Or are we using tradition and ritual and rote as an easy way out from doing the very hard task of being a loving, caring, godly person? It takes determination. It takes will. It takes desire. And it takes understanding. Do you get that understanding from reading books of myths? Do you get that understanding from reading the story of Jesus, which sounds almost like the story of Krishna, which sounds almost like so many others, as you'll hear about here? Or do you get that understanding from an inward knowing, from the very spiritual voice that you have within you? We're talking about your spiritual involvement, your spiritual growth. It is not done by doing things. It is done by being something special. In this program, we're going to deal in verifiable facts, something that cannot readily be found in most aspects of most religious beliefs. Every one of the world's thousands of different religions claims to represent the only truth, which of course implies that all the others do not. So if you have chosen to be, or through parental upbringing or school education, became a believer, how can you be sure that your particular faith is the right one. Okay, let's suppose it is. Well, that would then make everyone else in the world sinners. But on the other hand, if your faith happens not to be the correct only one truth, then that would make you a sinner, wouldn't it? And if you're a non-believer, does that mean that you will have to pay an eternal price for your non-belief after your death just because you didn't believe? After centuries of human existence, no one has ever yet come back from the dead with incontrovertible proof that there is anything beyond death, which also means that countless thousands of people who have spent their lives preparing for the next life may just have been wasting their time. And even if we suppose that there is something after death, as no one knows exactly what it is, how can you possibly prepare yourself for an entirely unknown situation? Although it must be acknowledged that a great deal of good has been done in the name of religion, it is by far the saddest and most tragic aspect of religion that throughout history, more men, women, and children have been slaughtered, tortured, and mutilated because of religious beliefs than all the people who have died in all of history's secular or non-religious wars. Even more sadly, in today's supposedly enlightened age, the slaughter, the torture, the mutilation, and the deprivation of basic human rights continues unabated. And weren't we taught that religion was supposed to be something to do with love? Despite this, there are still those who will argue that religion, regardless of its origin or credibility, serves a valuable and benevolent purpose in society because of the underlying teachings about being a godly or simply a good person. Again, sadly, the facts contradict this view. As in most countries where religion is widely practiced, there are more social problems and more crime than in many other countries where the practice of religion is less common. So the equation that being religious equals being a godly or good person is a long way from being universally true. And by studying the facts of history, we will find that it has never worked this way. Of course, one must acknowledge that, as with any rule, there are exceptions. But the godly or good persons are distinctly in the minority compared to all the evil that has been committed and continues to be committed, all in the name of religion and God. Consider just a few historical examples. The Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the slaughter of Christians in Rome's Colosseum, the Catholic massacre of the Huguenots in France, 
the burning and drowning of witches at Salem, Massachusetts. And then today, Arabs and Jews continue to kill each other throughout the Middle East. Catholics and Protestants murder each other in the streets of Northern Ireland. Hindus and Muslims assassinate and massacre each other in India and Pakistan. And Christians and Muslims decimate each other in Beirut. As religion is the cause of all this slaughter, religion cannot possibly be the solution. It is not only murder and torture. How about the daylight robbery and extortion through implied threats and induced fear of your money by self-centered, corrupt, and sex-scandal-ridden televangelists? These people, with their artistically groomed and moosed flowing locks, their fashion designer clothes, I'm talking about the men, and the women with their thick makeup, garish lips, and false eyelashes. Have you ever seen such vanity? And religion is supposed to espouse humility. What we will now offer you are facts, not fiction, myths, fairy tales, and allegory. However, as is often the nature of facts, they will probably be very uncomfortable for many people. They will undoubtedly shock and anger some of you as they will challenge age-old beliefs and the very basis of the religious belief system on which you may have based your whole life. But these facts cannot possibly be as shocking and ungodly as the death, destruction, robbery, and suppression of truth that for centuries has epitomized the practice of religion. And please remember that I deliberately said, offer you facts, as it is not our intention to be like so many missionaries and other religious proselytizers, whose purpose it is to force you to change your beliefs under the threats of hellfire and eternal damnation if you don't. We just want you to listen, watch, and make up your own minds. In order to better understand what we humans are today, and so what we are likely to become tomorrow, we need to look back and study our origins and where we came from. Try now to imagine Earth in prehistoric times, a place filled with a multitude of dangers, giant animals and reptiles, huge predators, earthquakes, volcanoes, tornadoes, and meteors, and the subsequent fear and hostility such an unfriendly environment would breed. If you could be a time traveler and be spirited back to these ancient times, complete with all the sophisticated modern knowledge you now have, admit it, you'd be scared to death, I know I would be. Now try to imagine what it must have been like for these ancient people, totally devoid of all the knowledge we now take for granted about the awesome forces of nature. A volcano erupts, destroying everything in its path. The sky reverberates with thunder as a violent electrical storm hurls thunderbolts to Earth, which start fires. Tornadoes sweep people, animals, and trees away into the sky. The Earth opens up, and an earthquake swallows a village in the twinkling of an eye. Pretty scary stuff, still is today. But try and think of it as if you had absolutely no understanding of these natural occurrences at all. Then at night, gazing up into those fearsome skies filled with infinite numbers of stars, not to mention shooting stars, without having the remotest idea of what they were. I've slept in the desert at Petra in Jordan. The stars are not above you. They surround you like a giant canopy and in the crystal clear air, you feel as if you can reach out and pluck one from the sky. However, lacking any form of scientific explanation, is it any wonder that these ancient peoples created a myriad of all-powerful nature gods and the countless myths that surrounded them? The gods which have been worshipped and sacrificed to for thousands of years since? For example, it was the mighty Thor who, when angry, struck his anvil with his hammer and created thunder. And the same Thor who, from his abode in the clouds, or heavens, from his lightning bolts at the terror-struck mortals below. If, alone in the dense forest, you, hardly surprisingly, felt fearful, and you sensed the presence of an unknown threat, well, that had to be the forest god, Pan, from whom we get our word panic. And at night, when it became cold, dark, dangerous, and downright frightening, without a convenient and comforting light switch, who else came out to rule but the fearsome prince of darkness? Then came the dawn, and with it light, warmth, and new life. And who brought it, and in so doing defeated the prince of darkness? 
none other than the sun, which became known as God's sun, the light of the world. Human beings are the only creatures capable of the process of logical thought, of imagination, and of questioning everything around them. In fact, the very evolution of humans has been dependent upon our ability to seek, find answers, and adapt. However, a small weakness has been that if a logical answer was not readily available, human imagination often invented or created suitable and at least temporarily satisfying answers, such as the very basic need to have a reason to explain our existence, and the equally important need to feel that life must be for some purpose, and that it cannot simply end at death, but that there must be something beyond. This remains as true today as it was for ancient man. Consider again how little ancient man knew compared to us. In order to create some livable with explanation, gods and myths had to be created. All questions require answers, real or created, so that we can get on with life. So perhaps we can also understand why people sometimes killed or sacrificed other human beings to satisfy or placate the angry gods of nature example, to, uh, to try and stop Thor from hurling a thunderbolt specifically at you. At the time, man didn't know any better. Supposedly today, we do know better. Sometimes you, like me, may wonder if we really do. Despite the existence of many larger and more powerful creatures in the jungles, man became and remains today the undisputed ruler of the earth for one simple reason, his mind. To make the closest analogy, we are both smaller and weaker than gorillas, but our minds are considerably more powerful and sophisticated. And yet, we continue to shed blood today, perhaps even more than before, and still in the name of the same god or gods and the same myths. Haven't we learned anything? Ancient man had to contend with countless areas of ignorance, which over the centuries gave way to informed enlightenment with just two glaring exceptions. We still persist in the ancient ignorances of religion and myths, two words which have one definition in common. They are both nothing more than beliefs. Look at it this way. Would you consider running your business according to an instruction manual written some three to 4,000 years ago and then translated 20 or more times before you read it? I very much doubt it. Yet many of us unquestioningly base the entire conduct of our lives on just such a manual, a collection of stories called the Bible. It is not merely having a superior mind that has allowed man to rule or dominate the earth, but by using it to create the ever-increasing array of technical wonders, sadly all too many of which are devoted to the sole purpose of destroying fellow man. That mind has not really changed much over the last few centuries. But because some brave people refuse to accept invented, convenient, or expedient answers, such as the earth being flat, you know, it was once religious heresy, punishable by death to believe otherwise. And instead, they continued to question and explore until such time as a logical and provable answer could be ascertained. Because of that, we have been able to progress from caveman to modern man but still with the previously noted and glaring exception of religion, where we still stubbornly cling to unproven and unprovable centuries-old myths. Moreover, many religions tell their followers not to think, but to blindly follow their moral dictates, just as soldiers are drilled not to think, but to blindly follow orders. Isn't it strange how the orders issued by both religious and military leaders are often exactly the same? Go out and kill some of your fellow human beings. And both of them justify their killings in the same way, as being in the name of God. Surely our inbred, unique ability to think and reason was intended to be used to its fullest extent and capacity. So why the exceptions of religions and the myths on which they are based? Religions which still set out to keep people in ignorance. For instance, the Jesuit Index of Forbidden Books was described by Catholic brother Paolo Sarpi as the finest secret device ever invented for applying religion 
to the purpose of making men stupid. Religion which caused Cardinal Gaspari Contarini to state, I cannot hide my indignation that some of the most illustrious Catholic cities are tainted with moral plague and loose ways to such a point that many monasteries designed to shelter virgins have now been turned into brothels. Can there be anything more abject and infamous? Religion which caused Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre to comment in 1977, the church is full of thieves, mercenaries, and wolves. Religion that, as reported in Time magazine, Catholic institutions have recently paid out some $300 million in the United States in settlements of cases where priests have been accused of sexually abusing underage boys, and there is no end in sight to other pending cases. Notre Dame philosophy professor Ralph McGinnery said, we, the Catholic Church, could be sued out of existence. Religion where in Saudi Arabia they have a special religious police force to enforce religious laws, and where religious leaders this year called for the execution by beheading of nine women whose dreadful crime was that they actually dared to drive cars, and where the same religious leaders also wanted to behead every man who did not wear a beard for the purported crime of secularism. Religion where, according to Reuter, a resident of an ultra-Orthodox quarter of Jerusalem was excommunicated by his local religious court for the sin of possessing a defiling and disgusting object, a television set. I could go on citing examples like these for hours, but I'm sure you've got the idea. If this is what religious beliefs can lead to, violent intolerance and murderous behavior that would simply not be tolerated in any normal, non-religious society, I wonder if I could be considered guilty of what is termed British understatement if I were to suggest that maybe, just maybe, something might be wrong with religion. But rather than even hint at an answer, I would rather you form your own opinions and draw your own conclusions as you watch what follows. If there is an answer or a truth, surely it should not be based on myths thousands of years old myths which have caused so much death, suffering, and intolerance. There must be something more positive and benevolent than religion's enslavement and brainwashing of its followers with fear and threats of eternal damnation. Yet since the dawn of history, man has stubbornly maintained his beliefs in religions and the surrounding myths and superstitions. In this one area, he has barely progressed since the Stone Age. Surely, it is finally time, in fact long overdue, to open our eyes and take a good hard look at the facts, and only the facts, of what we call the naked truth. Most people understand that Christianity is an outgrowth of the earlier Hebrew faith. Consequently, you cannot understand Christianity correctly unless you first understand the faith of which Christianity is an outgrowth. That is why we have the Old and the New Testament. However, that's where most people leave it. An intelligent person who has done his homework knows that this is not where it stops. One cannot have Christianity without its parent Hebrew, and we cannot have Hebrew without its parent, the many more ancient Semitic religions. Hebrew is merely a recent occurrence in Semitic history. There is a Semitic religion behind Judaism, and behind the Semitic is Egyptian, and behind the Egyptian is Sumerian, and behind the Sumerian is a more ancient one. It's all a long Semitic bloodline coming through history. So let's start way back in ancient times where it all began. To get a better understanding of where religions come from and where we are now in the 20th century in terms of our religious life, we have to go back a long way in time. Back all the way to ancient Egypt, in fact. To an Egypt that had never heard of Moses or Abraham or the rest of them. Because it was in Egypt, as you will see here, that the very basic roots and rudiments of both Judaism and Christianity was born. The ancient Egyptians realized that once a year 
at the time of the monsoon rains in Central Africa, uh, North Africa, being a desert, waited for the monsoon rains to come to Central Africa, the highlands. And, of course, when the rains came, they would overflow the tributaries flowing northward, which would be downhill into the deserts of North Africa, and the waters would eventually overflood the Nile, so that once a year the Nile Delta would become flooded. And that was a great and terrible tragedy each year, the great flood that came and washed away the Egyptians' world. The, they, were, they called the waters the waters of chaos, for the waters were chaotic and they just went everywhere. And while the waters of chaos were ter terrible and destructive, they also brought new life, because without the waters of chaos coming, the deserts would be totally dry and nothing would grow. So they realized that the waters of chaos were a blessing, in fact, that brought new life. So each, each year, when the waters of the flood would recede, leaving, of course, the fresh minerals and nutrients in the waters, which would then cause the food to grow, and spring would be a beautiful time in Egypt because of the waters of chaos. They celebrated the coming of the waters of chaos, bringing the new life. They call that celebration in Egypt the Arca Noah. Not the Ark of Noah, but Arca Noah. The Arca Noah celebration was the coming of the great flood that washed away the old world and brought new life, and therefore Egypt was born again. And of course, at this particular time of the monsoon rains, uh, the moon was always in the lower quarter. The lower quarter of the moon became known as the Arca Noah, the Arca Noah, or the wet moon. In Christianity, you have baptism. Baptism is, of course, being submerged in water. Because while, as I said, Egypt was submerged in water and was born again, the ancient peoples re related that when a child is carried in a womb, it is sealed in water. And that's the way you know a child's going to be born, is when the water breaks. And so, therefore, water was always associated with new life, being born. And that's why when you are converting from the evil old world uh, to Christianity, you must, be, you must be born again. You are baptized. It's actually a very ancient motif. All that we find in Judaism and Christianity, there is virtually not one concept, belief, or idea expressed in Judaism or Christianity, not one, that cannot be traced back many, many times to many different religions. It's a very old, ancient story. It's the greatest story ever told. To show how ancient Egypt and its religions permeates the Old and the New Testament, here are some examples. During the rule of the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten came an important religious change. Pharaoh Akhenaten was a very important pharaoh. He single-handedly changed the worship in Egypt from the worship of many gods to the worship of just one god in particular and to the exclusion of all other gods. The name of this god was Re. Pharaoh Akhenaten established that from now on there is only one god, the sun, and his full name was Amen Re spelled A-M-E-N-R-A. -E the Pharaoh said that when you pray to God, you must pray through the Son of God, Amen Re, because he represented God. And at the end of the prayer, in the ancient temples of Egypt, they would say, Amen. In the scriptures, Jesus said, if your eye be single, then there will be light in you. This single eye was the symbol of Amen Re, and the eye was always within the circle, the sun, the eye of God. There are at least three different places in the Bible 
where Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. For instance, in Ephesians 2.20, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And this is very important. Ask any architect or anyone who knows anything about the terminology of architecture, ask them, where do you find a chief cornerstone? Now, you can find an ordinary cornerstone at the top of a building or at the bottom. But where do you find a chief cornerstone? A chief cornerstone is translated from the Greek word meaning the peak of a pyramid or the capstone. Why the peak of a pyramid, you may ask? All you have to do is look at the back of an American dollar bill where you will find a pyramid with the chief cornerstone separated from the pyramid. But what is perhaps even more interesting is that on the American dollar bill within the separated cornerstone is the eye of Horus, the all-seeing eye of Iusus, the son of God the eye of Ray, that we pray to and say, Amen. In Isaiah 1919, God says to his people, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. In other words, in the middle of Egypt, there will be an altar to the Lord. Well, in the very middle of Egypt stands Cheops, the Great Pyramid, exactly in the middle. Amazing? Yes. But even more so when you consider that it had already been sitting there for 3,000 years before the Bible was written. In John 10:11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life to the sheep. In John 10:14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. In the book of Hebrews 13:20, Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of his sheep. In the book of Revelation 12:5, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And in Revelation 19:15, and he shall rule the nation with a rod of iron. Well, we've now established that Jesus is the good shepherd who shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. The Pharaoh was referred to as the good shepherd. The people, the royal household, and the religious household of Egypt were called in Egyptian the shepherd's fold. Pharaoh, being the representative of Iusus, the son of God, was called the great shepherd, who looked after the shepherd's fold. The Pharaoh was considered to be the incarnation of Amen Re, who ruled for God on earth. And that is where we get the idea that there would be an earthly kingdom. And the Pharaoh was the king of the kingdom. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now you talk about an old concept and an old motif. That certainly is. Virtually all the ancient religions in the world had a Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, Buddhists today, a very ancient, ancient priesthood, far, far in excess of, of uh, Christianity, existed in the Himalaya mountains where the Buddhists have a religious leader called the Dalai Lama. Dalai comes from the word, Latin word meaning God. Dai, Dalai, God, Lama. A Lama is like a lamb. A Lama is a lamb. Therefore, the word Dalai Lama is God's lamb that takes away the sins of the world. It's a very old and widespread concept. God's lamb that takes away the sins of the world existed far before the Hebrews. Interesting, wasn't it? Amun Ray, or Horus as he was called. He was all that was good and righteous and holy. And he had his adversary. His name was Set. Sound a little bit familiar? Like with Jesus of Nazareth, who had his adversary, Satan. Horus, Set. Jesus, Satan. In fact, the resemblances between Jesus and Amun Ray, or Horus, and all of the other saviors of mankind are just too many. They go on and on and on. In fact, let's compare them, shall we? Let's compare Jesus of Nazareth with Horus of Egypt, with Krishna of India, and with Buddha 
of the Orient. Horus, baptized with water by Anup. Jesus, baptized with water by John. Anup the baptizer, John the Baptist. Horus, born in Anu, the place of bread. Jesus, born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Horus, the good shepherd, with a crook upon his shoulders. Jesus, the good shepherd, with a lamb or the kid upon his shoulder. The seven on board the boat with Horus. The seven fishers on board the boat with Jesus. Horus as the lamb. Jesus as the lamb. Horus as the lion. Jesus as the lion. Horus as the black child. Jesus as the little black bambino. Horus identified with tat or cross. Jesus identified with the cross. Horus of 12 years. Jesus of 12 years. Horus made a man of 30 years in his baptism. Jesus made a man of 30 years in his baptism. Horus the cursed. Jesus the Christ. Horus the manifesting son of God. Jesus the manifesting son of God. Two mothers of child Horus who were two sisters. Two mothers of child Jesus who were sisters. Set and Horus the twin opponents. Satan and Jesus the twin opponents. Horus the sower and Set the destroyer in the harvest field. Jesus the sower of the good seed and Satan the sower of tares. Set and Horus contending on the mount. Jesus and Satan contending on the mount. The star as announcer of the child Horus. The star in the east that indicated the birthplace of Jesus. Horus the afflicted one. Jesus the afflicted one. Horus as the type of life eternal. Jesus the type of eternal life. Horus who comes to fulfill the law. Jesus who comes to fulfill the law. Horus who came by the water, the blood, and the spirit. Jesus who came by the water, the blood, and the spirit. Horus of the two horizons. Jesus of the two lands. Horus walking on the water. Jesus walking on the water. The children of Horus, the children of Jesus. Horus entering the mount at sunset to hold conversation with his father. Jesus entering the mount at sunset to hold conversation with his father. Horus transfigured on the mount. Jesus transfigured on the mount. The seven loaves of Horus for feeding the multitude reposing in the green fields of Anu. The seven loaves of Jesus for feeding the multitude reclining on the grass. Twelve followers of Horus. Twelve followers of Jesus as the twelve disciples. The secret of the mysteries revealed by Tat An, the secret of the mysteries made known by John. Anup and Aon, the two witnesses for Horus, the two Johns as witnesses for Jesus. Horus, the morning star, Jesus, the morning star. Horus, who gives the morning star to his followers. Jesus, who gives the morning star to his followers. Buddha was born of the Virgin Mary, who conceived him without carnal intercourse. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, who conceived him without carnal intercourse. The incarnation of Buddha is recorded to him brought about by the descent of the divine power called the Holy Ghost upon the Virgin Maya. The incarnation of Jesus is recorded to have been brought about by the descent of the divine power called the Holy Ghost upon the Virgin Mary. When Buddha descended from the region of the souls and entered the body of the Virgin Maya, her womb assumed the appearance of clear transparent crystal on which Buddha appeared beautiful as a flower. When Jesus descended from his heavenly seat and entered the body of the Virgin Mary, her womb assumed the appearance of clear transparent crystal in which Jesus appeared beautiful as a flower. The birth of Buddha was announced in the heavens by an ostrium which is seen rising in the horizon. It is called a messianic star. The birth of Jesus was announced in the heavens by his star which was seen rising on the horizon. It might properly be called the messianic star. The son of the Virgin Maya, on whom according to the tradition of the Holy Ghost had descended, was said to have been born on Christmas Day. The son of the Virgin Mary, on whom according to tradition the Holy Ghost had descended, was said to have been born on Christmas Day. Buddha was visited by wise men who recognized in this marvelous infant all the characters of divinity, and he had scarcely seen the day before he was hailed God of Gods. Jesus was visited by wise men who recognized in this marvelous infant all the characters of the divinity, and he was scarcely seen the day before he was hailed God of gods. 
When Buddha was an infant, just born, he spoke to his mother and said, I am the greatest among men. When Jesus was an infant in his cradle, he spoke to his mother and said, I am Jesus, son of God. Buddha, the savior, was baptized, and at this recorded water baptism, the spirit of God was present. That is, not only the highest God, but also the Holy Ghost, for whom the incarnation of Gautama Buddha is recorded to have been brought about by the descent of that divine power upon the virgin Maya. Jesus was baptized by John on the river Jordan, at which time the Spirit of God was present. That is, not only the highest God, but also the Holy Ghost, for whom the incarnation of Jesus is recorded to have been brought about by the descent of the divine power upon the Virgin Mary. By prayers in the name of Buddha, his followers expect to receive the rewards of paradise. By prayers in the name of Jesus, his followers expect to receive the rewards of paradise. When Buddha died and was buried, the coverings of the body unrolled themselves and the lid of his coffin was opened by supernatural powers. When Jesus died and was buried, the coverings of his body were unrolled from him and his tomb was opened by supernatural powers. Buddha ascended bodily to the celestial regions when his mission on earth was fulfilled. Jesus ascended bodily to the celestial regions when his mission on earth was fulfilled. Buddha is Alpha and Omega, without beginning or end, the Supreme Being, the Eternal One. Jesus is Alpha and Omega, without beginning or end, the Supreme Being, the Eternal One. Buddha is to come upon the earth again in the latter days, his mission being to restore the world to order and happiness. Jesus is to come upon the earth again in the latter days, his mission being to restore the world to order and happiness. Krishna was born of a chaste virgin. Jesus was born of a chaste virgin. The moment Krishna was born, the whole cave was splendidly illuminated. The moment Jesus was born, there was a great light in the cave. The divine child Krishna was recognized and adored by cowherds who prostrated themselves before the heaven-born child. The divine child Jesus was recognized and adored by shepherds who prostrated themselves before the heaven-born child. Krishna was born at the time when Nanda, his foster father, was away from home, having to come to the city to pay his tax or yearly tribute to the king. Jesus was born at a time when Joseph, his foster father, was away from home, having come to the city to pay his tax or tribute to the governor. Krishna, although born in a state the most abject and humiliating, was of royal descent. Jesus, although born in a state the most abject and humiliating, was of royal descent. Krishna's father was warned by a heavenly voice to fly with the child to Gakul across the river Jumna as the reigning monarch sought his life. Jesus' father was warned in a dream to take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt as the reigning monarch sought his life. The ruler of the country in which Krishna was born, having been informed of the birth of the divine child, sought to destroy him. For this purpose, he ordered a massacre in all his states of all the children of the male sex born during the night of the birth of Krishna. The ruler of the country in which Jesus was born, having been informed of the birth of the divine child, sought to destroy him. For this purpose, he ordered all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof to be slain. One of the first miracles performed by Krishna when mature was the curing of a leper. One of the first miracles performed by Jesus when mature was the curing of a leper. Krishna was crucified, and he is represented with arms extended hanging on a cross. Jesus was crucified, and he is represented with arms extended hanging on a cross. Krishna descended into hell. Jesus descended into hell. Krishna, after being put to death, rose again from the dead. Jesus, after being put to death, rose again from the dead. Krishna ascended bodily into heaven, and many persons witnessed his ascent. Jesus ascended bodily into heaven, and many persons witnessed his ascent. Krishna is to come again on earth in the latter days. He will appear among mortals as an armed warrior riding a white horse. 
At his approach, the sun and moon will be darkened, the earth will tremble, and the stars fall from the firmament. Jesus is to come again on earth in the latter days. He will appear among the mortal as an armed warrior riding a white horse. At his approach, the sun and moon will be darkened, the earth will tremble, and the stars fall from the firmament. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, is it a coincidence? Or is there something else going on? That's a lot of similarity to say that it's a coincidence. But let's take another look. Let's go back 10,000 years before Jesus and look at the 16 other men that came along who claimed to be the Son of God, who were born of a virgin mother. And the virgin mother had the name of Mary, or a derivative of the word Mary, who were in the temple scolding and training their elders by the age of 12, who the ruler of the land, fearing that the Son of God had been born, tried to put them to death that they were asked by someone greater than they to move from the land they were born into a foreign land to save the life, who began their ministry at the age of 30, who ended their ministry at the age of 33, and who were killed on the cross. This happened in 16 different events prior to Jesus. Let's look at who they were. Krishna of India, 1200 B.C., the Hindu Sakya, 600 B.C., Famus of Syria, 1160 B.C., Ritoba of the Telangonese, 552 B.C., Ayoa of Nepal, 622 B.C., Jesus of the Celtic Druids, 834 B.C., Kechalotti of Mexico, 587 B.C., Kerinus of Rome, 506 B.C., Asiculus Prometheus, 547 B.C., Tullus of Egypt, 1700 B.C., Indra of Tibet, 725 B.C., Alcestis of Euripides, 600 B.C., Attis of Phrygia, 1170 B.C., Crete of Chaldea, 1200 B.C., Bali of Chorissa, 725 B.C., and Mithra of Persia, 600 B.C. It just keeps coming on, doesn't it? Time and time again, we have to look at these similarities. Time and time again, we have to look at these different men who had the same living patterns in life, even though their lives stretched over a period of 10,000 years. We're not dealing with myth. We're not dealing with belief systems. We're not dealing with faith. We're dealing with facts, historical data. It's there. You can't set that aside. Jesus had the same kind of life, did the same kind of things as Krishna and Buddha, and there they were, all 16 of these men. Coincidence? Ah, come on. Think about it. But that then leads to the question of just, who is it that we've been worshiping? Or what is it that we've been worshiping? What or who have we been living for? And more importantly, what or who has man been killing man for. Remember, religion has killed, murdered, maimed more human beings than any other force on earth. Well, the answer gets plain and obvious and perhaps difficult for a lot of people when we take a close look at the New Testament. In order to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have to first understand where the book comes from who wrote it. You have to understand it in the context of the time in which it was written. I'm going to make a statement now that many people who are in denial will not want to hear, but if you give me an opportunity, I think I can prove the point. The Bible is nothing more, Old and New Testament, nothing more than a retelling on the most ancient story the world has ever known. And that's why the Bible's called the greatest story ever told. And a cursory understanding of ancient history will show that the greatest story ever told was the story of the zodiac, astrology. The Bible is nothing more than the greatest astrological, astronomical story ever told. It is pure astrology based on the zodiac. The fact of the matter is, if you've done your homework, you're going to find that the Bible is nothing more than astro-theology, the worship of God's heaven. 
To further understand the connection between Christianity and ancient religions, we must study astronomy. Astronomy is a very precise science that we use today in determining, for example, when we will have the next eclipse or when we will see the next full moon. As far back as we can go in history, the year was divided into 12 equal parts, just as we today divide the year into 12 months. You draw a circle representing one year, which is then divided into 12 equal parts, each one of which is called a zodiac or a house. The sun travels through the different houses of the zodiac. This is where the connection between the Son of God having 12 helpers, as they were called in Egypt, and the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who ministered to him, having 12 apostles. After dividing the circle into 12 equal parts, it was then further divided into four groups. The winter solstice, from the middle of the winter across the zodiac into the summer solstice, then the spring, or vernal equinox, to the autumnal equinox, and there you have the cross on the zodiac. Remember, this is all ancient science, and it has been done like this for thousands of years. Now, as I said, those who would not want to hear this are in denial, but as a teacher, I'm asking only to hear what I have to say. In the book of John, in the New Testament, John 14, 2, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Well, like many other scriptures in the King James, that was not correctly translated. In fact, it is not in my Father's house are many mansions, because in fact that makes very little to no sense at all. How can you have houses or mansions in a house? In my Father's house are many mansions is correctly translated, in my Father's abode are many dwelling places. In my Father's heavens are many houses. Well, of course, there's at least 12 houses in the heavens that we know of. In my Father's abode, the heavens, there are many houses. That's right, at least 12 houses of the zodiac. That's what was being said here. Now we go to perhaps the oldest book in the Bible, Job. And in the book of Job, I ask you to turn to chapter 38 and read with me, if you can, where in 38, 31, 32, and 33, something very important is said concerning astrology. In chapter 38, 33, first, the scripture says, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? In other words, there are ordinances in heaven. And 31 now, going back to 38, 31, God says to Job, according to the scripture, Can thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? What are we talking about here? The Pleiades, an astrological symbol in the zodiac. And God is supposedly saying to Job, Can thou bind the sweet influences? What influences? I thought that that's all evil. That's all astrology. That's that New Age stuff. We don't have anything to do with that. And here God is saying to his prophet Job, Can thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Can thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Now there is a heavy piece of information. God is saying to Job in 32, 38, 32, can thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or can thou guide Arcturus with his sons? We're talking astrology here. Now, if you go to the King James Version, that's the version that God spoke. And if we read from the King James Bible what the word Maseroth means. Here in the King James, in the interpreting interpreting dictionary in the back of the King James, we look up the word Maseroth, and here we see Maseroth means the 12 signs of the zodiac. That's from the King James. Maseroth means the zodiac, and therefore God is saying to his great prophet Job, can thou bring forth the zodiac in his season? That's right, because the zodiac has 12 seasons, 12 houses, and that's why God's Son, the light of the world, could say, in my Father's abode are many houses. 
we're talking astrology here. But I'm going to tell you some of the most, one of the most interesting things you're going to find in the Bible about astrology is the end times. There's not a Christian program on anywhere that is not concerned with the end times, the last days, the end of the world. Jehovah's Witnesses are proclaiming all over the world that this is the end times. In fact, these are the last days. We are living in the end times. But the end times of what? If you understand that the Bible is nothing more than a retelling of astrology and the astrological zodiac, then you understand why it is that Jesus is referred to to have fed his people and his followers. God's son feeds his followers according to Matthew um, 14, 17. We read, and of course this is a very old story. We've all heard about how Jesus fed his followers with two fishes. And with two fishes and five loaves, he fed his people. The two fishes are, of course, the two fishes of the zodiac, which is the constellation of Pisces. Pisces is always symbolized as two fishes. Consequently, God's Son, that thing that comes up in the morning, feeds his people on earth in the sign of the two fishes. Now, if you think we're stretching this point, just continue to listen. Jesus is referred to as the great fisherman, and of course that's why the Pope has the Pope's mitre, or the hat, or the headdress of the Pope, is the fish from Dagon, the fish god, because Rome ruled the world for 2,000 years under the age of Pisces. What house of the zodiac does God's son go into when he leaves the age of Pisces? Because he's been in the age of Pisces now for 1,991 years, he's getting ready since each age is about 2,000, a little over 2,000 years long. What house will God's son go into once he has, once he has served the last Passover, which is the last year, the last Passover, in the age of Pisces, the last year in the age of Pisces. Where does God's Son go for the next 2,000 years? Well, of course, we understand he goes into the age of Aquarius. Well, the age of Aquarius, that evil astrology, the age of Aquarius is symbolized you can get any reference book, you will find the age of Aquarius is symbolized by the man with the water pitcher. The man with the water pitcher or the water bearer, the water bearer. The age of Aquarius. But where did that story of the new age and Aquarius come from? It comes from the Bible. God's son at Luke 22:10, when God's son is asked by his 12 apostles, as to where he will go to the next, after this 2,000 years of the great fisherman, or the fishes is over, where will he begin his new kingdom? He says at 22.10 of Luke, And he said unto them, Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. That's right. The man bearing a pitcher of water is Aquarius. It's very simple. Now, how do we know that the Bible's talking about the new Aquarian age or the old age of Pisces? All you have to do is your homework. I'm going to read some scriptures, and I want you to follow what I'm saying, because I think it's very important. Let's start with Matthew 28, 20, and he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In Matthew 12, uh, 32, the Holy Spirit will not be given either in this age or the age to come. In Matthew 13, 39, 
the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels, and the weeds are pulled up and burned in fire, so it will be at the end of the age. End of the age. That's what we're talking about, the end of the age, the Piscean age, the last days. Here in Matthew 24, 3, and what will be the sign of your coming? The apostles asked God, Sam, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? In Mark 10, we read in Mark 10, 29 and 30, and in the age to come, eternal life. So we're talking about the age to come. And here in Luke 19, no, Luke 18, 30. The kingdom of God will fail and receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. So we're talking about in this age, in the age to come. So we're talking about two different ages. Here in 1 Corinthians, we read again, 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 8. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age. And in 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it. Here in 1 Corinthians again, 10, 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us upon whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. We're talking ages. In Ephesians 1, 21, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Hebrews 6, 5, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the coming age. In Hebrew again, Hebrews 9, 26, then Christ would have come what had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the age. And in Revelation 15, 3, God Almighty is king of the ages. What we're talking about here is ages. The old age of Pisces, God's son ruling for 1991 years under the age of Pisces. And what we're looking forward to in the Bible is God's kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth. And that kingdom is the kingdom which is said, Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall be a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entered in. We're talking about getting ready to go into the new age of Aquarius, the man with the water pitcher. So when you hear Christians talking about the last days and the end of the world and the end times, we're talking about the end of the age of Pisces. We're talking about, yes, the end times, the end of the age of Pisces and the coming age of the man with the water pitcher. Now, when the end of the age of Pisces is coming, and we will be going into the new age of Aquarius, oh, but that's devil worship, that's evil, that's astrology. No, that's the Bible. We look around us today in all of the churches, and we will continually see the two fishes. The two fishes, as we said, are of Pisces. It is an appropriate symbol, and that's why Christians have the fish on the back of the card, Dagon, the fish god of Rome, the pope wearing the, the uh, mitres. The, the pope's mitre is nothing more than the fish head. The fish is a symbol of Christianity. But here again in Europe, 600 years ago, in a church in Europe, many churches in Europe have the same symbols. Here's one classic example of the symbol of Pisces in the stained glass window of a very beautiful cathedral in Europe. And of course it says Pisces. So while we may not have known about the connection between Pisces and Christianity, Middle Ages Europe was very well aware of the connections.
Now, with that look of the zodiac in mind, where does Jesus of Nazareth, or Krishna, or Horus, or any of the other 16 saviors fit into that zodiac? Well, could it be that they are representative of the sun, which is the largest and most important thing that passes in a cyclical way through the zodiac? Let's examine that for a moment. The ancient Egyptians believed that as long as the sun came up every day, there'd always be life on Earth. Therefore, quite logically, the sun became the representation for everlasting life. Put it another way. If the sun comes up every day, food will grow. If food grows, people can live and can reproduce. So that when you die, your son can carry on. And when he dies, his son will carry on, and so forth. So that as long as the sun, the light of the world, comes up every day, there will be everlasting life on Earth. So quite logically, every major religion and mystic belief features the sun as its principal and most important feature. The Egyptians noticed that on their sundials, that in winter, as the sun moved further south, bringing, of course, our winter, that winter represents death, the coldness of death. And they noticed that when the sun went south, that it uh, reached a point where it stopped in its movement and did not move any further south. And they began to notice on their sundials that it not only didn't go any further south, but it didn't begin to move back north either for three days. For three days, the sun sat exactly on the sundial in the same place. Therefore, the ancients said that the Son of God dies for three days and is resurrected or brought back to life once it begins its annual journey back to the Northern Hemisphere. And when it begins its annual journey back to the Northern Hemisphere was on December 25th. Therefore, the God's Son, the light of the world, who is our salvation because He is risen, was born or reborn on December 25th. Of course, the sun represented to the ancient people salvation because they believed, especially the Egyptians said that they noticed that if the sun continues to come up every morning, that life would continue on. When the sun comes up, the children awake, the men go off to work, and the world continues, and the flowers grow, and there will always be life on the earth as long as the sun comes up. As long as the sun is risen, there will always be life. Therefore, the Egyptians said that the sun of God, the light of the world, represented everlasting life on the earth. Not for you, but on the earth, everlasting life. That the Egyptians realized that the sun while burning was giving up energy and that the plants and the food chain on earth was receiving along with the humans and animals were receiving the energy from the sun therefore the sun was giving up its life for us here are a few churches that we drove by they're all completely unrelated but nevertheless they all display the cross but within that cross is a circle the church we're at now is a Presbyterian church, and as you would expect to find on any church, it does, of course, have a cross on top. But if you look more closely at many of these crosses, you'll find that there is also a circle within the cross. The circle is on the cross of the zodiac, and that circle represents the sun, the sun which comes up every day. But over the ages, man began to refer to this as the son of God, and therefore it became God's son. But what a cross with a circle in it like this truly represents is the sun waning or dying on the cross of the zodiac, and not a man. The sun, God, God's sun dies on the cross of the zodiac. The sun, the round orb that comes up in the morning, is what is correctly pictured on the cross and not a man. 
This church tells the whole zodiological story, the dying on the cross of the zodiac, and this small circle surrounded by 12 helpers or houses of the zodiac. Anyone can see that this is indeed a round orb with 12 signs or houses around it. It is the sun that is symbolized on this church and not a man. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 we read, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Let's read that again. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. The Son of God and the light of the world comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Well, of course, there is only one light of the world that every eye can see, and that's the sun. In the scriptures, we can also read how Jesus walked on water. All of us, I'm sure, have seen the sunset. Now, we are also told that the Son of God died with a crown of thorns. No wonder. That is precisely how the sun was always pictured in ancient days, with a crown of thorns, or sun rays. So the crown of thorns on Jesus, the Son of God, the light of the world, are the sun's rays. There is a phenomena that we call the procession of the equinox. It's a very interesting uh, phenomena, a natural phenomena, that the, the sun, while we on earth are circling or orbiting the sun, the sun itself is orbiting through the Milky Way galaxy. And it is going through the different constellations of the zodiac. And each time the sun leaves one of the constellations of the zodiac, and goes into the next constellation of the zodiac, and that's all that old evil astrology. No, it's just history. It's just science. And each time it goes into a, it leaves one constellation and goes into another constellation, it enters the new constellation at the 30th degree. And it leaves that constellation for the next one at the 33rd degree. Therefore, God's Son begins his ministry to each one of his helpers at 30 and dies at 33. The ancient calendar didn't start with the year of January or Janor, the double-headed god of Rome, as we do. Instead, they started their calendar in a different constellation. To be precise, the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin. Consequently, the Egyptians and the ancient Sumerian cultures said that the Son of God, who died on the cross and was resurrected in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born of a virgin. This is why, in front of a pyramid, you have a sphinx. The sphinx has the head of a woman and the body of a lion. This symbolized the zodiac overseeing the pyramid because, as I mentioned, their zodiac began with Virgo, the Virgin, the head of the sphinx, and ended with Leo, the lion or the body of the Sphinx, which symbolically was the complete zodiac. Now, as we have seen, all the crucified saviors were, in fact, nothing more than personifications of the sun. And, of course, that list goes on and on indefinitely back into ancient history. All races, creeds, colors, and movements have always personified their gods as the sun. But what about Jesus? It's true that he is referred to as God's Son, the light of the world, who is our salvation because he is risen. But how do the churches themselves picture their Messiah, this Jesus? Let's see what some of the pictures from the literature of churches, how they perceive their Messiah.
With those developments along the Nile, long time ago, we see some very familiar stories emerging in our religious lore. Later, the Jewish nation, as it came out of Mesopotamia, seemed to have attached itself to those very familiar stories and made them very much a part of the Jewish religion, as we take a look now at the Old Testament. It is at this point I would like to remind that you should always be aware of any authority, institution, government, church, religion, anyone who is in the position of any authority that tells you that you should not read something in particular or you should not look at a set of facts or a particular book because usually anyone in authority who doesn't want you to read something in particular must have something to hide because the intellectual mind of the human being cannot grow if it is not allowed to look at all of the facts. We are told by Christianity that we're not to have anything to do with astrology because that is evil and of the devil. Until we begin to look at the Old Testament with an academic eye and not being swayed by religious conviction, but let's look at the actual Old Testament in the language that it was written in. And we're going to find that the Old Testament, like the New Testament, is nothing more than the entire story of the Zodiac. We have seen the New Testament is nothing more than astrology and some worship. Now we see that the Old Testament is going to be nothing more than astrology. And one of the most important points that we want to bring out, one interesting point that we might bring out is that the Hebrews, when they were in Egypt, were, of course, subject to the religion of Egypt. And at that time, Isis, spell I-S-I-S. Isis, the female personification of wisdom, from whence, of course, we get Mary in the Catholic Church, the mother of God. Isis was the female personification of wisdom, spelled, as I said, I-S-I-S. Later on, with the coming of Pharaoh Akhenaten, or Akhenaten, Pharaoh Akhenaten changed the worship in Egypt from Isis to Amen Re, or Amun Ra. Of course, this is where we get the term Re, R-A, or R-A-Y for Sun Ray. So Amun Ray became the chief deity of Egypt. Now, once the Hebrews left out of Egypt and went north into Palestine, they found a new god there of the Canaanites, a god that is referred to as the Ugaritic god of the uh, Middle East. That god was El, or the planet Saturn. The Hebrews then picked up the worship of the planet Saturn, or El, the Ugaritic god, and combining the Isis worship with the Amun Re worship, and, la and lastly with the El, Saturn, or the, or the god El, they formulate their new land based on the three concepts of God, Isis, Re, El or is ra -el, I -S -R -A -E -L. Mr. Michael Chandler. Solomon, wise King Solomon, is the sun in three languages. Sol, sun. Spanish, sun. The Eastern religions, Om, they chant Om for the sun, and Om, he's Egyptian for the sun. Jonah is an example of the sun going through the equinox. However, in this particular case, Jonah is Semitic for the sun, and Jonah's living inside the fish, inside the whale, for three days, which means the sun is at the winter solstice in the bellies, in the bowel of, of the earth, at the winter solstice, and dying for three days. Now, Samson, the adventures of Samson is equated to the adventures of Hercules. Samson was a solar myth. He had 12 unusual exploits or adventures around the zodiac. His strength was in his hair because in his hair were the sun's rays. When Delilah cut off his hair, in actuality, 
his rays were cut off. In the Old Testament, we are told that Moses comes down from the mountain after receiving the, uh, the law. And what does he find the Hebrews doing? He finds the whole nation worshiping a golden calf. Well, the golden calf was, in fact, nothing more than a personification of the sun again. The golden comes from the golden sun. And the calf comes from the astrological sign of Taurus. So the golden calf was God's son in his kingdom in the constellation or the zodiac constellation of Taurus, the golden calf, or the sacred cow, which is still worshipped in, in India today. And then, of course, the, um, the beginning of the new year, uh, the, and the more ancient Hebrews would blow the ram's horn. The ram's horn was, of course, celebrating the coming of God's Son, the Messiah, God's Son, the light of the world, who was going to come into his new 2,000-year kingdom in the age of, of uh, Ares, the ram, the lamb, ram, sheep of God. The, later on, the ram is called the Paschal Lamb, or the Lamb of God, which is Ares, the constellation of Aries, and that's why the Jews still today blow the ram's horn. And of course, in the old ancient Egyptian calendar, the month of spring was under Virgo, and therefore God's son is born of a virgin. Virgo, the virgin, the astrological symbol. It's really rather simple once you understand the story. The high priests of Israel would go out in the morning mist to find the manna from heaven. Those of you who have had the opportunity to study carefully will know that the word manna from heaven actually means mushrooms. The manna from heaven was actually a mushroom, sasilabin, the magic mushroom. And there's many books have been written about the subject of the magic mushroom in the Middle East. And I think we all know that in the Middle East there had there is the problem with hashish for thousands of years, and the drugs have been uh, floating around the Middle East for thousands of years. Uh, we find it in the Bible, the magic mushroom. Uh, we find in the scriptures that that which is referred to as manna from heaven is a word which means mushroom. Therefore, the high priest of God would go out in the morning, and of course, that's where mushrooms grow, is in the midst in the dew in the morning and they would pick the mushroom the manna from heaven and of course consuming the manna from heaven they began to talk to God in the book the sacred mushroom and the cross Mr. John Allegro who was commissioned by the state of Israel for research substantiates the taking of the magic mushroom by the ancient Semitic fertility cults in their sex worship which predated and influenced modern day Judaism as we see pictured here, a, a drawing of the high priest of Israel. This is what the high priest of Israel looked like. You will notice that he is wearing a peculiar headdress. The headdress is because of the manna from heaven that the high priest consumed in their worship. The Hebrew god El was in fact a more ancient Semitic god, Saturn. And that's brought out very well for us here in Archive Orientali. Here we find in this excellent article that the Star of David, the hexagram, is actually the Star of Saturn. And that's why today Hebrews worship on Saturday, Christians worship on the sun's day, God's sun, the light of the world. And there's, a, uh, there's still a disturbance among uh, s religious circles today as to what the uh, correct day of worship is. Is the uh, day Saturday or Sunday? Well, it just depends on whether you're worshiping Saturn, the old ancient Hebrew God, or the Son of God, the light of the world on Sunday. It really doesn't make much difference. It's all Egyptian. If you go back, not to the Bible, not to Genesis, but to the most ancient writings in the world, 
the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Rig Veda, you will find that in the ancient nations of the world, they had all the same identical stories. They had the story of the young boy that was swallowed by the great fish because he didn't do what he was supposed to do. They had the story of um, Nemo. The Babylonians had the great lawgiver who had golden hair and went up into the mountain of God. The mountain of God was the pyramid. He went up into the great mountain of God and uh, he received the great law, which becomes known as the law of Hammurabi, the great law of Hammurabi. And that law was given to the Babylonians, say, their great prophet, their great man of God, who went up into the mountains, King Nebo. King Nebo, the great lawgiver who comes down from the mountain with the tablets of stone and gives the great law to the Babylonian people. Now, of course, the Egyptians picked that up, and you will find that in Egyptology, uh, the Egyptians had the same story. But their great lawgivers was called Mises. Mises was the great, wonderful man with beautiful golden hair who went up into the holy mountain, the pyramid, God's holy mountain. And he received the law. And the great law he brought down with the tablets of stone. And when he saw, Mises saw that the Egyptians did not respect the divine law. He broke the, the stones and the great law. Now, of course, the Hebrews, taking that story, moving into uh, Palestine with their worship of their god, El, then comes the story of Moses. Moses is Mises. Mises is Nebo. It's the same story. It never stops. And lastly, we would like to touch upon the Dead Sea Scrolls issue. Because if you don't know it, there is a very big controversy around the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, basically, it amounts to this. Those who have the authority and have control over the Dead Sea Scrolls do not want anyone else to have access to them because they are afraid that if outside authorities are able to examine the Dead Sea Scrolls, it might by chance uh, begin to cause questions in the Judaic Christian community about the authenticity of both Judaism and Christianity. And of course, the powers that be would not be very happy with that. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Qumran and they were found, they were a large group of old ancient documents written by ostensibly the, uh, the Essenic Jews. And they have caused much controversy in Israel, chiefly because Israel, the holder of the Dead Sea Scrolls, does not want anyone else to read them. They will read, Israel says that they will read the Dead Sea Scrolls and tell us what they say. But the problem is the world academic community says we want to read it for ourselves and Israel doesn't want anyone to read the Dead Sea Scrolls but themselves. Some 40 years ago, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in caves near Qumran. Just recently, the Huntington Library released microfilm of all the scrolls published so far for scholars worldwide. As a result, apparently the Israeli government is considering taking legal action against them, apparently based on an infringement of copyright. Well, that raises an interesting question. Whose copyright? The copyright of those who wrote them years ago and have been dead for many, many years? Or if they're God's words, then surely the copyright belongs to God. But if they are God's words, then surely the words belong to everyone and there is no question of copyright. Which raises another interesting question. Why would the Israeli government want to suppress their publication? It's interesting that we read from the Time magazine of January 14th, 1991, that Mr. John Strugnell, the chief editor of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the man who was put in charge of the Dead Sea Scrolls by the State of Israel, after spending many, many years as the editor-in-chief, came out publicly to give his view of what he had studied and the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
and he was quoted in a Jewish newspaper as saying that while he himself was not an anti-Judaist, he did declare, and I'm quoting from the Time magazine, that Judaism is a horrible religion with racist origins that in principle should not exist at all. The whole worship of the heavens is the story of the Old Testament. It is an encoded story that only those on the inside know. There is a story for the outside, for the ignorant, for the ill-informed. But the writers and those who are well-versed in Hebrew theology know that there is a second story interwoven into the story of the Bible. Well, we know that for a lot of you, this may have been a difficult experience going through all of this with us. But we want you to know where we're coming from here at TNT. We're not here really to challenge your belief systems. We're not here trying to shake the moral foundation that you built in your lives with your religion. We just want you to analyze and look closely at the data, historical facts, about what you have let your life get into if you're closely involved in all of these things around you that you associate with religion and how that's affecting your life. Every little bit of it. What are you involved in? What are you believing in? What is all of this history we have seen? Does it really relate to you? Now there's no doubt about the fact that a lot of the great things that are taught to us all in our religions have some value that teach us to be good to each other, that teach us to be loving human beings. But we wonder about the religious that bring on rote and ceremony. Does that really do anything to make you a better person, a more godly person? Or are you casting it all under the guise of a myth? Myths got you nowhere. Ritual, rote, ceremony get you nowhere. It's what you are that counts. And can you find this godly you inside these myths? Or are you going to have to search someplace else for it? All we're doing is asking you to think very carefully about the information you have received here. It is valid. It is historical. If you believe some of the things you believe in, we feel that you have to believe in some enormous levels of consequence. But you're right, you can do that. But think about this. It might just change the way you view the entire world and the rest of your life. Now to throw some other light on this very important topic, we've invited Bill Jenkins to join us here at International Research. For seven years, Bill hosted Open Mind, which is KABC's highest rated talk show. It was a three hour talk show. And during those years, he of course interviewed many, many people, including some of the nation's leading thinkers, the most influential people on every topic, including spirituality and religion. Bill, good to have you with us here, and perhaps you could just for a moment elaborate on the, some of the people you did interview, and then tell us something about my comment on the burden of proof. Oh, certainly, Derek, and thank you very much for letting me uh, get in on this conversation. It's so very near and dear to my heart. During those seven years that we're talking about the existence of open mind, I had... Um, probably the greatest education I had received in life. I had all of my belief systems conveniently thrown out the window and a whole new set of values given to me, not only in terms of what is reality, the reality of science, the reality of re religion, the reality of spirituality. That is a very important subject, and we're hearing more and more about it. And so it was an awesome time, I, you know, and almost, I almost overloaded from it. But when we talk about what is the proof of God, uh, let me give you a, a, a different look at that for a second. Let's not, let's not even use the word God, because a lot of people think about this guy with a flowing beard. You know, this is the, uh, the image that's conjured up. Come on, let's talk about something else for a second. And I got most of my information, not from the theologians, not from the religionists, not from the priests or the preachers, not from the poets, but from the physicist, the scientist, who used to be in the forefront of atheism. 
And if you get to them now, you're finding that they're becoming more and more in the forefront of an absolute belief and knowledge of a great intelligence that was able to fashion together something as intricate as the human body or the entirety of creation. So we ask about proof. Just look around you. This did not happen out of happenstance. Little molecules got together and suddenly said, oh goodness, I think I'll be Derek today, or planet Earth, or whatever it was. Certainly there was enormous energy, there was enormous power, uh, there was something that put together the laws of the universe, if you want to call them that, something of incredible intelligence, and something that is that powerful. And look at the power it demonstrated something that is uh, that awesome, I think requires our attention because we are a part of its creation too. We are a living thing. We assume that that is a living thing too. And if that's our father, that's our creator, let's try to be like that. So I think there's a lot of proof that, yeah, there is a creator. I don't want to personify that creator. I couldn't begin to tell you what it is. It's best described to me, possibly, as just a core of pure, loving energy. And the reason it's loving is because it is the nature and character and personality of that character. So we'll just call that love for the moment. Maybe we can get into that more later. Well, I think one of the important points you make there is the term that you will not personify. But of course, every religion in the world has personified that creative entity, whatever it is, mm -hmm. into a being either it has the long beard or whatever. it's whatever. Every religion forms its own concept of what it calls God. Yes. Well, I think it's time to get away from that. That's like being in kindergarten. Maybe this is what you needed to do for children. Bill, you just stressed quite a lot spirituality. Now, some people would or could define spirituality as being religious thought or religious philosophy. So I think perhaps it's important for our viewers, if you'd like to define what you mean by spirituality as opposed to religious thought or religious philosophy. Okay, uh, and, and good question, because it could be confusing. I think a lot of people say, if I am doing my religious ceremony, my religious rote, doing my beads, wearing my skull cap, doing all of these sort of things, that I'm doing something to improve the quality of life of my spirit. I am becoming more evolved. I am becoming more uh, godly. My second nature is becoming better, more in keeping with the, the harmony of God by doing all of these things, which basically is what religion is all about. My point is that the spirit is extremely important. It is, it's the force behind life. And you don't do it by ascribing to all of this religious uh, stuff. You do it by determining that you want to improve the quality of your spiritual life. And you do this by living. Yes, the spirit is important, but to train that spirit, to bring it to a higher level, is something that is deeply important, I think, to the individual and the creator. And it is a job and a task that, is, that goes only between the two. You don't have any side trips. You don't have anybody else that can do the job for you. Mother can't do it. The Pope can't do it. Only you can do it. You will do it or you won't do it. That is evolving the quality of spiritual life. Second to that, of course, it will naturally evolve the quality of physical life. A spiritual man just will not do those things that we see being done under the guise of religion. Bill, my point there was that I believe today many religions and many people take what is written in the Bible quite literally at the face value of the words as they appear today. And I feel in so doing that they obviously create a great many problems for themselves and for the people who follow what they say. Now, these words were written many, many thousands of years ago. Perhaps you could give us some examples of how the meanings can be changed in today's understanding of the words and in the translations which have occurred over the centuries. Let's take the Bible that we're familiar with today as an example. The New Testament, deal in for that for just a second, written basically during the first century by a group of writers. We have the Gospels, we have the Epistles as they were, Paul and the rest of them, and John's Revelation, all written between the years uh, 33 A.D. and about 92 A.D. In the beginning, during those first four centuries, let's take a letter to Paul, for instance, written to the church at Corinth, and the elders at the church at Corinth received Paul's letters. 
And then they very dutifully transcribed that letter and sent it on, say, to the church at Ephesia. And this went on throughout all of the churches. They didn't have fax machines then. Now, during this process that went on for four centuries, who knows how many times one of those scribes altered it or added something to it, wanted to clarify what was said based upon those things that had been going on for four centuries. In the fourth century, there was a Roman scholar by the name of Jerome who put together all of these teachings of the church. Each one of those churches were autonomous, you've got to remember. They were independent of each other. There were no bishops above them, and there was no pope. There was none of this going on, as was the intent of the early Christians. And that was known as the Vulgate, and all of those writings out of Greek and Arabic were then translated into Latin. Now, we have a lot of uh, areas in which there can be a great disintegration of the truth as was originally given by Paul or the writers of the Bible, what we would call the writers of the Bible today. Then in the early 1600s, they assembled about 300 scholars at Oxford University to go to the earliest witnesses, they called them, that they could find, which primarily was the works of the Vulgate found in Rome and in Constantinople, and tried to put that into English. And that was known as the King James Version of the Bible. And that was the very first time that that had ever been done before, and it was then printed on the Gutenberg Press. Two years later, the Catholic Church came out with its own version, known as the DeWay version of the Bible, which very closely said a lot of things that the King James said, but it had a bunch of footnotes, and the Catholics were to read the footnotes and not what the Bible said. To give you an example there, uh, Paul describes his meeting with Mary and Joseph and their children, the 12 children that followed Jesus. Now, the footnotes would say, well, <clears throat> Paul didn't mean children. He meant cousins because it's explicit in the Arabic that it originally went in that Mary and Joseph had children, but the Catholics couldn't accept that Mary had children under Joseph, so they made them cousins, even though there is a specific word for brothers and sisters and cousins. So here we see a degeneration of what was originally said there. And in fact, a specific distortion of the truth. That's, that's exactly correct. That was the Duvet version versus the King James version, which so many Christians use today. But one of, the, one of the best examples there of how words can be twisted all the way around happens uh, when uh, Paul admonished the Christians to put on the armor of Christ. Well, in 1611, when the King James, uh, King James Version of the Bible was written, that meant something very, 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 you're going to get out there and fight. You know, you're very, very aggressive. In today's language, when you put on the armor, that's like getting in a tank. It's very defensive. So Christianity then was offensive, and today it's defensive, which is the reason that we saw new versions of the Bible come up, like the New English Bible, the Phillips Version, and on and on it goes to try to change these changes in language that occur. We've had dramatic changes in the English language, which you and I speak, from the years 1946 to now. Very, very volatile changes in the language we would have a hard time speaking with the vernacular of a 1946 person right after World War II, pre-television, pre-science. The language then was simple. It wasn't vulgar. It wasn't filled with all of the things that the language is filled in today. And it's interesting to note that uh, there are new, two new television shows that are having a very difficult time with their actors and trying to get them to speak the language of 1946. It's changed that much. Can you imagine what will happen 50 years from now? We will well, be able to understand those people. I also doubt. try to understand what would have happened from three, four, five thousand years ago. Yeah, now and we're, we're still trying. And, and this is even without translations from one language to another. We're talking what George is saying is in the same language. In the same language. So here I think you find a great deal of difficulty in trying to uh, say this is going to be the, the blueprint for my spiritual life something that has gone through all of these rigors, and to say that this is God speaking to me. Come on. Be careful about that. Bill, I'd like to thank you most sincerely for being with us today and for sharing your great knowledge and expertise. But there's something about which I'm personally curious, and I'm sure some of our viewers would also be interested in the answer. And that is why you chose voluntarily to involve yourself in something which is, after all, an extremely controversial topic. Oh, well, there are a lot of reasons for that, Derek. First of all, when I heard what you were doing here and was made aware of the level of research, 
that the organization has done and your effort to get this story out, it, uh, it struck me very, very personally. It is a story that needs to be told in its fullness and its completeness, something that I have been involved in quite uh, a long time myself in my own work. And now I see something even more and more important. We live in very, very strange times as we move into the 90s now. And uh, we see people all over the world, certainly here in the United States, but also in Europe, and particularly the Soviet Union, who are beginning to reach out for something that, is, that needs to be reached out for. And that is a way to improve the quality of their spiritual life. If we are not high quality spiritual beings, we will never be high quality physical beings. And we will see the wars continue, we will see the economic degradation of others continue, until we start walking the high moral ground on a spiritual level, because it's physical level doesn't determine spirituality. It's spirituality that determines what you are physically as a man or a woman. And I see things in the Soviet Union where they have relaxed the grip of that authoritarian state over there. And the first thing we're seeing is great collections being taken to provide the Soviets with Bibles. Let's not add to the misery of the Soviet Union, if you don't mind. Let's start giving them something that has to do with their spirituality, not the perpetuation of our own myths, our own problems, our own wars, as we've already gone into here. Why add to their misery? There's a better way. It's not going to solve anything. We have thousands of years of history to show that this is what tears apart nations and lives. So yes, I'm very interested in what you're doing. Let the Soviets think also about what's being said here. I would love to see it. Well, by profession, I'm supposed to be a man of words. But what I've learned during the making of this program has almost left me temporarily speechless. I'm equally sure that for many thousands of you out there, you will find what we've told you as fascinating as I have. And I'm equally certain that many thousands of others of you will be angered by what you've heard. But I hope either way it will have provoked you to think and question what perhaps up to now you've always taken for granted. And if you keep an open mind and bear in mind that what we've presented to you are facts and that religious beliefs are really just that, they are beliefs. And if you'd like to know more, and my goodness there is so much more to learn, Obviously, this has only been the tip of a very, very large iceberg, might even say the tip of a pyramid. The Society will provide you that information. Details of that will be up in a moment for you to call in and ask. And until next time, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us this evening on The Naked Truth. I'm Derek Partridge. Please write to the International Research and Educational Society, care of Lightworks Audio and Video, Incorporated, at P.O. Box 661593, Los Angeles, California, 90066. And thank you for joining us. I'm Derek Partridge. And now you can order this and many other fine tapes on the internet at www.lightworksav.com. That's lightworksav.com, as in Lightworks Audio and Video. This has been a presentation of Lightworks Audio and Video Incorporated. Thank you very much. Uh, always happy to be here with you. It so happens that I have a subject that I've been wanting to talk about, uh, so it seems like this would be just as good a time as any. <clears throat> In the Bible, there are many things that are misunderstood and mistranslated into English that comes from what we call Hebrew. First of all, we need to understand that that which we refer to 
as Hebrew is in point of fact not Hebrew, but Canaanite, Phoenician Canaanite. The bloodline is from the ancient Middle East called the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians, uh, their area, that area in which Phoenicia existed was called Cana, the land of Cana. So today we refer to uh, the Canaanite, Phoenician Canaanite language as Hebrew. Uh, all you have to do is go to reference books and look up ancient Hebrew and it will tell you ancient Hebrew is actually actually Phoenician Canaanite and it develops and, and mutates and comes down through history until today we call it Hebrew but Hebrew is actually a Phoenician language and Many of the concepts and ideas which are expressed in the Old Testament are not uh, original to the Old Testament. They were, it goes back to of even further back into ancient history so that many of the concepts and belief systems in Judaism and Christianity are very, very ancient. And I believe that the Bible is one of the most important books on the earth because it's really telling you some really interesting things, but uh, if you don't understand how to read the symbols, it's never going to dawn on you how this stuff works. Uh, I think the New Testament is probably the most important story in the whole world, but not as history, but as a metaphor, as an encoded message. Uh, but let me go back to this one subject that I'm been very interested in for a long time and that is in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 1 says in the King James Bible in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth but that's not what it says in the old ancient Hebrew or Phoenician language that's not what it says in the original language that's how it was translated from the English in the King's English well, the King's English, uh, the, the, the King James Version, was translated by the best translators that the king had at the time. And it was very well done. Uh, however, they know more about the language today than what they did then. And so there's a lot of imperfections in the King James Bible that could be misleading unless you understand what the words actually meant in the ancient world. And so... When you read in the beginning, this is Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's not what it says in Hebrew. It says in the beginning of the creation, Elohim, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is not the word God. El is a Phoenician Canaanite name or word for deity, El. E -L. We talked a little bit about that last week. Lohim is uh, like adding an S onto an English word. You have C-A-R for car or C-A-R-S, cars, more than one. So adding an S on the end, uh, to the end of most English words means it's uh, plural, in the plural. Well, that's exactly what El Lohim means. El is God, Lohim is plural. So the correct understanding should be read, the Hebrew read, in the beginning the gods created the heavens and the earth, not God. And more interesting than that, this is why incidentally in Genesis 128 when God is creating uh, Adam and Eve, the first couple, and it says God said, come let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Who's us and our? Was God talking to himself? Come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Later on in Genesis, I think it's three, the scripture says, God said, here man has become as one of us, knowing good and evil. The point is, who is God talking about? Us. He, here's man made in our image after looking like us. Here, now he's like us. Who's us? Who's our? Well, it's El Elohim, the gods. So consequently, what we're talking about here is that the gods created us, created the heavens and the earth and all things on it. Now, 
more important to my, uh, and this is the whole subject, of course, you could take this, uh, you know, in many different directions. But interesting in Genesis 1, 2, says, and the earth was without form and void. That's another mistranslation. And the original, uh, it does not say that the earth was without form and void. Actually, it says, and the earth became a waste and a desolation. Not form and void, but waste and desolation. And it was not, as I said, the scripture, if you read it today in the Bible, Genesis 1-2, says, and the earth was without form and void. No. The earth became a waste and a desolation. Consequently, um, if you go to Genesis 9, which is Genesis 9, 1, where God is talking to Noah after the flood of Noah's day, and God says to Noah, uh, now understanding that according to the story, everyone has been wiped off the earth in the great flood, and so God says to Noah and his sons, his three sons, uh, go forth into the world now and multiply and replenish the earth. And you ask the question, wait a minute, the word is re, R-E, replenish the earth, meaning, not plenish, replenish, meaning do it again. Why? Well, simply because before Noah, there was a whole civilization. God brings a flood, according to the story, God brings a flood, destroys the world and all life on it. And now God is saying to Noah and his sons and, and their wives, go now on the earth and reproduce and fill the earth and replenish the earth. Well, that is a correct translation from the Hebrew, and I've talked to rabbis about that. And the word is replenish, R-E, means do it again. Okay, it makes sense that God would be telling Noah to redo it again. However, if you go back to Genesis 128, where God is creating the first chapter of the Bible, where God is creating man uh, and man and woman, Adam and Eve, he says to Adam and Eve, multiply and replenish the earth. Do it again. Replenish the earth. Implying, <clears throat> of course, do it again. What are you talking about doing again? Well, if you just read Genesis 1-2 correctly, it said, and the earth was without form and void. No, the earth became a waste and a desolation. So the rabbis will tell you, and the rabbinical reference works will tell you, that what is being said in Genesis 1-2 and in 128 when man's, man and woman are being created is that God is recreating all over again. And so consequently, the Bible, the Old Testament, is, is a story for this dispensation. This time the world is being recreated. Now what happened uh, a million years ago, 10,000 or 100,000 years ago, that's none of your business. For you right now, this is what you need to understand. And the bottom line is, is that we are not the first creatures on the earth, the, the first time man's been on the earth. We now know that man has been on the earth probably millions and millions of years, and that for us to think that mankind was created 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 years ago is ludicrous because we know better than that. And so consequently, that's what the Bible is saying. God is saying, replenish the earth to Adam and Eve. Do it again. <clears throat> Who is God? Well, the scripture says, and this is a very difficult word to deal with, God, G-O-D, because uh, you know, that, that's a lot of baggage. What are you talking about when you talk about God? Well, God is dog spelled backwards, as I said. This is why churches have dogma and their teachings, because it goes back to Anubis, Anubis the dog star, Anubis the dog, the god of uh, and the ancient Egyptian religion. But when you look at the word, and now I get back to what I was going to say to start with, that in Genesis 1-2, where it incorrectly says, and the, and, the, and the earth was without form and void, 
No, the earth became a, a waste and a desolation. The two Hebrew words that are being translated there is tohu and vohu. Uh, pronunciation, it would be T-O-E hyphen W-H-O, tohu. That's not the way it's spelled in Hebrew, but that's the way it's pronounced. T-O-E W-H-O, tohu. Vohu would be V-O-E W-H-O, tohu, vohu. Waste, desolation. There's only two places in the Bible where tohu vohu is used, and it's uh, and those two places they're always used together. And there's only two places to start with. One is in Jeremiah, and one is in Genesis one two. And the the in the scripture in Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, "I saw the earth in a vision, and the earth was tohu vohu." meaning the earth became, and my eyes, I saw the earth, and it became a waste and a desolation. Well, when did that happen? Well, according to the Jeremiah prophecy, it happened many, many, many thousands of years before. And the prophet Isaiah said, God gave him a vision. And in the vision he saw the earth and tohu vohu, which is the earth became in his eyes. It was beautiful, it was, and the scripture says that, Jeremiah says, and the earth was beautiful, its animals, its birds, uh, its civilizations were absolutely beautiful to see, and then tohu vohu, it became a waste and a desolation, meaning that there, the earth probably was a very beautiful uh, place thousands and thousands of years ago, maybe a hundred thousand years ago, and Jeremiah was given the opportunity to see the way the earth was 30, 40, 50,000 years ago with animals and a whole different beautiful world and then something happened, some kind of a major catastrophe, tohu vohu, it became a waste and a desolation. Now, when you go back to Genesis 1-2, tohu vohu is always understood to be a situation that the earth goes through when it changes from what the ancients called one dispensation to another dispensation or one period of time in God's history, not our history, but in the history of the universal God force, the way it keeps time. And of course, it's, you know, it, it, uh, one, one day is a thousand years. Well, that's probably more than that. Uh, theoretically, using the term God, how does God keep time? Well, my Lord, you know, God's forever, forever, so I mean, how long would that be? So in the, the universal God force concept of time, millions of years are nothing. So consequently, what is being said there is that tohu vohu implies a total destruction on a cosmic level between dispensations of creation between God. Between the time that God created the earth and all these wonderful things were on it, say a hundred thousand years ago, and then when something happened, a comet hit the uh, earth is one, one of the ideas that's going around now, a major comet the size of New York hit in south of uh, Mexico and, and caused the dust to fly all over the earth and everything died because it blocked out the sun. I don't know, but, but something happened because we know that animals, even in the North Pole, the South Pole, they have found animals that are frozen solid with green vegetation still in their mouth. Consequently, something happened many, many, many thousands of years ago, which is translated tohu vohu. Some terrible catastrophe happened on the earth in which the gods were angry and, and the whole thing was just leveled. Well, maybe it wasn't the gods who did it, but the point being is that the Bible is saying that the gods, Elohim, became angry at the creation and Jeremiah was allowed to see tohu vohu, a total uh, destruction all over the earth, a major catastrophe. And that is precisely, as I said, the words and the concept is used for the dispensation of one creative period going to another creative period. 
So when everything is collapsed and destroyed, now theoretically, according to the Bible, God says, come, let us do it again. All right, let's start all over again and let's create a man and a woman and Rabbi Marvin S. Antelman. Some 35 years ago, Marvin Antelman, A-N-T-E-L-M-A-N-N, Marvin T Antelman uh, of Newton, Massachusetts, was 35 years ago president of the American Rabbinical Association. And he and I were very close friends for many years. I used to chide him all the time about his understandings of the Bible. But, uh, but uh, Rabbi Antelman, president of the American Rabbinical Association, said to me, I asked him about that scripture, where God said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And I said to Rabbi, what are you talking about, come, let us? Who's us? Did God get, to get, get permission from somebody else that's working with him or what? And he says, no, it's a misunderstanding on how the sentence is understood by Gentiles and Jews. Jews also misunderstand. They don't know any more than the Gentiles do. There is a correct way to read that sentence. And... The, the correct, the, the normal way people think that the scripture is saying when it says God said come let us make man in our image after our likeness. Most people think that that's, God is saying come let us create a creature. Let us make a, a, a new creation, a creature and we will call him, uh, uh, maybe we'll call him man. So come let us make a creature and we will call him man and woman. Man with a womb, womb man. And that's what most people understand that scripture to mean. That's not what it says at all. Rabbi Antelman says, nowhere in the Bible does it say God created man. It doesn't say that. Go back and read it correctly. What is said is that God said, or our likeness. The correct way to understand that is that God was saying, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Not make man, man's already here. Come let us remake man, do it again. Let us make man according to our image and our likeness. And so the, 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 ancient, uh, the ancient Jews and the Hebrews and all the ancient civilizations that were starting all the way back to Samaria understood what, what was being said. It's just that we don't understand because we, all we get is our news from ABC. We wouldn't know anything about what's going on. But if you go back to the ancient works, you will find that the ancient people, the Sumerians, Babylonians, Phoenician Canaanites, Egyptians, the ancient Greeks and Romans, all of them understood that we are the creation of another, of another entity. We are the creation of the gods. And according to Zachariah Sitchin, and he's not the only one, he's just one that I know personally, but according to the work of Zachariah Sitchin, the Sumerians are saying that extraterrestrials came here from a planet called Nibiru. And Nibiru is, according to the Sumerians, they said that Nibiru is a planet about twice the size of the Earth, and that comes and it is part of our solar system, but it has a huge elliptical orbit. It's not a round orbit, it's elliptical orbit, oblong. And consequently, according to the Sumerians, and now we're beginning to scientifically find out that he was right, the Sumerians are right. The U.S. Navy has even commented on now that there seems to be more than one other planet connected to our solar system with elliptical orbits. Well, that's what the Sumerians were saying. And consequently, this elliptical orbit is every 3,600 years, it comes back into our vicinity and passes through our solar system, then goes back out again. And according to the way the solar system turns in the galaxy, and this thing comes back every 3,600 years, comes back and then goes back out. And consequently, Every 3,600 years, mankind seems to make massive movements on the earth, new things, new technology. All of a sudden, things just start happening. Why? I believe that there's at least enough um, evidence to show 
that there might be something to this story that the Sumerians and the Egyptians and all these great civilizations, not us, we, you know, we have no idea what's going on in right here in our own city, but the ancient peoples knew and said that the gods told them that every 3,600 years they come back through, and when they come back through, why travel a long distance when they could just wait? The planet's going to be in the close vicinity, and when it is, it'll be here for a few months. So they will drop off and see how everything is, and uh, and give you some new up, up, uh, uh, you know, some new concepts and new ideas, uh, depending on how smart you are. If you're still as dumb as last time they were here, you know, why bother? But if you've progressed a little bit they will give you a little bit more to work on. Then they get on the planet and leave, and another 3,600 years goes by, and mankind progresses again. So all of this makes some kind of a, of, of a legitimate sense if you are able to look at science, philosophy, religion, biblical history, and, and be able to you know, balance it all out. There is a lot of, there is a modicum of truth in all of this because uh, scientifically things are being proven now that the Sumerians were saying many thousands of years ago. So the point being is that God said, come let us make man in our image after our likeness. Um, interesting, in relation to that, and again, I go back and, and reiterate that Rabbi Antoman said the correct way to, to, to say that or to read that scripture is that the gods said, come let us make man in our image not make man, but let's make him in our image, after our likeness. Uh, well, that's, that's interesting. You mean we were already here, but for being so great, we weren't that great. Yeah, we were hominids. We were Neanderthal man. We were Cro-Magnon man. We were whatever these creatures were that were digging up all over the world. In the south of France, we're finding Neanderthal who stand upright, uh, homo sapien, but uh, but they were just a little different from us, and but they they had certain qualities that showed that they had some intelligence about how to do things. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, from the Neanderthal period, we pop in. Our our skin and flesh is different than what the Neanderthals would have been. Our our skin is thinner. We can't take the cold like animals do at two o'clock in the morning on the desert when it's like 20 below zero. Animals are out there. They live through it. We couldn't. Why? It's because our our bodies are designed differently. Our skin is thinner. Our systems are more balanced and 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 uh, and vulnerable. Uh, however, our spirituality and our intellect is far higher. We, we can appreciate geometry, uh, uh, sciences, occultism, beautiful music, uh, lasers. I mean, you know, our intellectual and spiritual capacity is phenomenal. But our bodies are very uh, vulnerable. So what happened? in our natural evolution of things when one time you have the, the Neanderthals or whatever these hominid creatures, and that's a word that science use, hominids, these creatures, and all of a sudden we appear. Well, it makes sense to me that perhaps there is something to what the Sumerians said that the gods who came through on Nibiru or whatever the planet was or whatever the story is, the bottom line is that the gods said, come let us make man in our image after our likeness, meaning they must have cross-breeded their DNA with our DNA, whichever the, the normal uh, hominid creatures that were here, take one of the females, impregnate the female with the, with the genetics of the gods, and the outcome would have been us. We are still animalistic, I mean, at best. Uh, we're still animalistic. We're still going around killing people and shooting people, and anybody that doesn't look like us or happen to be our color, we hate them, and we shoot them. Uh, we shoot our own families. You know, We shoot presidents. We shoot everybody. Why? It's because we are actually a Neanderthal ancient uh, a hominid creature. And we have appetites for violence and, and excitement and killing and all that kind of thing. However, we also, uh, as among us, 
those who are profoundly brilliant and spiritually in tune, who give us the great uh, composers, the great poets, the greatness that mankind is capable of. So you have the balance, the animalistic human plus the divinely inspired. So we can, you know, we're balanced. The bottom line on this is that we are created by the gods. Now, go back to Genesis 18, and in Genesis 18, there's a story there about Abraham. And Abraham is standing in his tent talking to his wife, the scripture says. Go read it in the Bible in Genesis 18. And it says, and Abraham was standing in his tent, and three men come walking up toward him. And he went out to meet them. And, he, and they talked with the men, and they said that they were on their way to some business they had elsewhere, and they were just passing through. And it says, Abraham uh, invited them to stay and have dinner at least, because this was a custom in the ancient world. If you have tourists or people coming through, it doesn't matter who they are. That was a custom in the ancient world. You show hospitality by asking them if at least you can stop and have something to eat or something, refresh yourself, and then go. And so that was the custom. Um, you know, we still do that today. You know, friends drop over, you'll fix them something to eat or something. So that was a custom. But it's interesting that in Genesis 18, it says Abraham asked the three men to stay and have dinner and then go. And they said no, they were busy. They had something they had to do. And it said that Abraham insisted. So they said, all right, not going to argue. We'll have dinner, but make it quick because we've got something to do, but we'll stay for a few minutes. So it says Abraham had Sarah make, uh, make something to eat. And after eating, two of the men got up, thanked Abraham for his hospitality, and said, but they really must go. But the third one stayed to talk for a little bit. And then later on, and that's in Genesis 18. In the next chapter, Genesis 19, you find out that those two men are now the two men who are in Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19. And it says that when those two men who were, you know, the day before with Abraham are now in Sodom and Gomorrah, it says the homosexuals thought they were good-looking, handsome men. And it said that the homosexuals that night came to the house where these two men were staying with Lot and, and called them out uh, and, and the two men were able to supernaturally cause the people of the town to become blind so that they started fighting among themselves. And it says that the two men in the Bible, Genesis 19, were in point of fact actually angels, spirit entities who have come in a human form. And it says in Genesis 18 that the one that stayed and talked with uh, Abraham was in fact the Lord God, the creator himself. God Almighty, the creator of mankind himself, was the Lord who sat with Abraham. And I think to myself, wait a minute. You mean Abraham actually fixed dinner for God, for the creator? And he sat there and had, you know, had dinner and a couple of drinks and, and chit-chatted with Abraham and talked to his wife. And he was said to be a man. He looked like a man. He acted like a man. Uh, take that into consideration with later on in Genesis when it says the sons of God. And sons of God does not mean angels. Angels and sons of God are totally different, uh, totally different subjects. Angels are not sons of God. But in the, uh, later on in Genesis it says sons of God began to forsake their proper dwelling place and start cohabiting with women. The sons of God began to see women, that they were beautiful, and, and fell for the women. And this is where we get the idea of falling in love, because they fell from a higher position because of the women. And so consequently, um, I cannot picture myself uh, seeing a woman being talked into bed by some hideous creature from another world. But good-looking, handsome men might do it. So consequently, it makes sense that the sons of God were good-looking, handsome men. Even the homosexuals thought they were good-looking, handsome men. The point being is that the angels, the sons of God, the, the, not the angels, but the sons of God, there were two of them that accompanied the almighty God, the creator, Yahweh, Jehovah. And what is this all saying? The bottom line after everything is said and done is quite simply this. 
that we are told that God the Creator had two uh, accompanying angels with him. He went into Sodom and Gomorrah. They looked like men. They sat down. They had dinner. They could chit-chat with you. And they uh, and two of them left to go, and they all looked like men. And later on, the sons of God, who looked like handsome, good-looking men, they started messing around with women and had offspring. Well, their plumbing must have worked if they had offspring through females. So they must have been, uh, for all practical purposes, a man. What is this saying? It's basically saying this. I believe that there is a modicum of truth in the story that's encoded in the book of Genesis. I think there is something there very important. I think that today there very well could be sons of God still here on the earth. We don't know what their lifespan is. We don't know how long sons of God, Elohim, or the Anunnaki, as the, uh, as the ancient Sumerians call them. We don't know how long they live. We have no idea what we're talking about here. All we know is the Bible is saying that there are extraterrestrials, and I have to tell you this, but that's the word, extraterrestrial, because God and the angels, all the sons of God, do not come from Van Nuys. They come from out there. They come from somewhere out there in, quote, heaven, end quote. So if they're coming from out there and they look like humans and they can mess with women and have offspring, they can sit and have dinner with you, and they look like good and handsome men, but they're not from here and they're not men. They just look like men. That begins to make sense to me that perhaps what we are seeing today in the Middle East having to do with, I with, the, with the Iraq, <clears throat> which Iraq was originally hundreds of years ago called Persia. Persia was called before that um, Chaldea. Chaldea before that was called Babylon. So what we're talking about is the king of Babylon. Now it begins to look like what's going on here is that our world is being run by very powerful men who cared nothing whatsoever about human creatures. Do you care and worry yourself sick when you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and think about how many innocent families were broken up, how many chickens had to die? You couldn't care less. They're just chickens. They're just animals. And so consequently, I think that the uh, sons of God, the Elohim, Anonaki, I don't care what name you give them, they are still here. I am totally convinced that we are now seeing in the Middle East with the United States government doing what it's doing, with the rest of the world preparing for something, tohu vohu. I think what we're actually seeing is a profound, awesome, terrible, tribulation coming when the gods are going to battle like two men fighting over a woman. The gods are going to battle for the ownership of us. And consequently, when you understand that Saddam Hussein is Persian, Persia is Chaldean, Chaldean is Babylon. And we talked in the Bible, the Bible is filled with, uh, in the book of Genesis and all the way through to Revelation, talks about how the gods of Babylon were, were to be cursed and they were evil and that the good God was going to destroy Babylon. I think what we're seeing right now is in, in Israel, America, England, when you begin to look at the symbols, the words, the terms, the national coats of arms, the, the seals of nations, listen to what the president is saying. I am totally convinced for my own self, and I've been looking at this for over 40 years, I'm totally convinced what's going on right now is that the president of the United States has no control over anything. I think that those, what's going on is there are very powerful, awesome creatures on this earth that look like men and they act like men, and they can eat with you, but they are not normal human beings. These people are despotically powerful, murderous in their intent. 
They don't care a thing about human life because they created it. They don't give a damn about nations, races, children, uh, family values. That's all crap to them. They created this creature called man. They are in a whole different world than we are. They don't see the same things. Their, their technology is so far above us. Their understanding of human creation is so far above anything we understand. They are, as far as we're concerned, gods. Consequently, I think that what we're seeing now is a war between the gods. And consequently, tohu vohu. I believe that it's my opinion that we're going to see in the next two and a half years uh, trouble like we have never seen it before. It's frightening the implications of what I, I just think back on the gods and when they're at war. You like, you like war and you like bloodshed? Well, stick around. Now you're going to see how the gods do it. You're going, you, you know, you love, America loves all these war movies? Good. Stick around. You're going to really want to see this one. Because the gods are going to show you what war is really all about. And it hasn't got a thing to do with sparing the children and only dropping bombs on military. And not, no, no. The gods, they don't give a damn about none of it. They're here to do one thing, and that is control and take ownership of us, their, their creation. Incidentally, if the concept that I have, I have outlined that we creatures, we humans, are actually the offspring of the gods, are some kind of a mating uh, action between the extraterrestrials or the Elohim, uh, Anunnaki, the ancient gods, whatever you want to call them, if there is something to this, if there is any validity to this concept that extraterrestrials who came from heaven, yeah, of course, if they came here and they said, come, let us create man or make man in our image and our likeness, you've got a very interesting situation here. You have Neanderthal or hominid creatures, and we haven't even discussed where the hominid creatures came from. We're not even dealing with that yet. <clears throat> but you're talking about an extraterrestrial life forms that look like us, and they have come here from another world, from an, another uh, from another place in time, and they are attempting to procreate with the indigenous creatures that are here, and consequently their DNA and their system, uh, their body system from where the world they have come from is so superior to ours, and yet they are smart enough to know how to blend our DNA, the creatures, the hominid creatures, with them. Is this how we got today uh, uh, the Yetis, abominable snowman, the Yetis? Um, what are some of the other terms that are used for those creatures? Uh, what is it? Bigfoot. Yeah, Bigfoot, uh, the Yetis, whatever. They are hominid creatures. They walk on two legs like, like male. They look like men, but they are animals. But they are brilliant in intelligence and can outsmart anybody. They have obviously supernatural powers to go in and out of, of dimensions. There's a lot of material on that subject. So, and too many races of people around the world, from China to Asia, to uh, North America, to all of the ancient cultures, talk about the, uh, the Bigfoot, the Yetis, those mysterious creatures that live in the wilds. It would not surprise me if those Yetis, Bigfoot creatures, are the original experiments of the Anunnaki gods cohabiting and, and, and cross-breeding with the hominid creatures that were here, but they put too much of something in and not enough of the other, and they came out even more vicious than what they were and even smarter. But they're still animals. Well, they screwed up. Okay, <clears throat> now we got to do it a, a, a something better because this thing was, before it was just an animal. Now it's a vicious animal, and it has supernatural powers like we do. Uh, so, all right, and that thing's already gone. Let's forget it. Let's move it on and do it again now. This time we're going to do it better, 
And so now they do it again. And now they got it right. Now they got it balanced and got the DNA correct and got it right and gave birth to us. So I'm saying, if any of this has any validity, and I'm just putting, I'm just pointing this material out because this is what the Bible says. And so consequently, if any of this has any validity, it very well might be, as uh, my friend um, uh, William Henry has been talking about for many years, and Zechariah and all the rest of them, I think that we might be seeing a war being put together right now, not by men. It is very possible that we in this country and the world in general is being led. We have talked about Illuminati, the secret societies, the fraternal orders, even among uh, the Masons of Europe. When you confront uh, the Masons of Europe and you ask them, who actually is at the top of your organization? At the very top, who are they? They will tell you that they don't know. That is not to be, un that's not to be discussed. They don't know who is at the top, and it's none of your business. And you want to stay alive and just do what you're doing, then you just take care of your business at this level and don't worry about who the boss is. And consequently, the, the Masons in Europe refer to their masters as, quote, the hidden chiefs or hidden masters. Somehow or another, the hidden masters behind world events, today we refer to them as Illuminati or whatever. Uh, I don't think the Bilderbergers and the Council on Foreign Relations and any of those organizations are of any importance to me at all. Those are just the mundane uh, nuts and bolts of how the, the organizations put together to make things work. I'm more interested as to who are the gods behind world affairs? Who are the brilliant minds at the top of the pyramid symbolically? Who are the intellectual elites behind world events? I'm totally sure there's only a handful, a very small, tiny handful, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they were the Elohim, the Anunnaki, the men who look like men but are not men. Consequently, I, you know, so many people have said, how can these people go to war killing innocent women and children, uh, you know, like the First and Second World War, murdering and killing? Uh, how could men do this? I don't think men are doing it at all. I think that there are, par there are powerful entities in this world who look like men, and they give the orders, and you better jump. And I don't care if you call yourself president, just don't matter. If you get in their way, they'd sooner kill you as anybody else. They got an agenda, and you had better jump when they say. And consequently, I think that's what we're looking at today, a war between the gods. It has nothing to do with the human uh, element. It has to do with a, co a, a cosmic, cataclysmic time in which the gods are battling now for our ownership. This is what Steven Spielberg and George Lucas have been telling you. Steven Spielberg and his movie, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. You need to go back and get the movie and watch it. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. What is the Last Crusade? Well, if you don't understand the first two crusades, you're never going to understand the Last Crusade. Do you know what the Crusades were all about? Do you know who started the Crusades? And what were, what were they crusading about? Well, it has to do with the ownership of people, international banking cartels. It has to do with the Knights Templars of the 9th and 10th century. So consequently, what, if you don't understand what the first two crusades or the first three crusades, then you're not going to understand Indiana Jones and the last crusade. What is the last crusade about? It has Indiana Jones looking for something called the Cup of Christ or the Holy Grail. The Cup of Christ, the Holy Grail, uh, there have been many, many stories and many interpretations of this, but basically it goes, it goes back to one thing. The cup represents the holder of the wine. The wine is poured into the cup. The cup, the wine has always represented the blood of mankind. Jesus said, drink this wine, for this is the blood of the covenant. 
So you drink the wine, all of the men around the table would drink the wine. They are symbolically drinking the blood of the God so that they are locked into a partnership with God. You're drinking the wine, which is a ritual. The, the wine represents the blood. And in the Christian sense, it, were, it represents Jesus' blood that's being shed for us. So you're drinking the blood, taking a, an oath to lock yourselves together in a, in a sacred mission. All right, but the, the Holy Grail, the, the lost Grail, is a cup in which you pour the wine. The cup represents the earth, and the wine represents the blood on the earth. So the cup represents the earth. The human blood on the earth is the wine in the cup. Consequently, whoever holds the cup holds the blood of the human family on the earth in his hand, which I believe is a symbolism of the ancient gods who have come here from another world and they are saying, who owns this property down here? You know, well, we created it. Ah, uh -uh, you created it, but we own it. We're coming in and taking it over. And that's why uh, Saddam Hussein has said he believes he is the reincarnation of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, I got a feeling that there's some really powerful, strange occultism going on in the Middle East right now. And we in America and England, the Western man is getting ready to get involved and become cannon fodder. We're going to become involved in a war that you have no idea in the world how big it's going to be. Because this has nothing to do with generals sitting down and plotting out some war plan. No, no, no. This is going to be one hell of a conflict. It's, it's going to be a cosmic conflict between the gods. And even today, Christians are beginning to realize this is the things which are talked about in the Bible prophecies. We are in the time of the end. Yes, we are in the time of the end of the age of Pisces. And the coming age, and by 2012, we will be fully into, according to the reference works, we'll be fully into what is called the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Uh, that is simply dispensations of time, 2,150 years of the age of the fish. That's why Christians have the fish on the back of the cars. And the water bearer, which is, a, uh, which is Aquarius. So what the Bible is saying is that there is one age that's leaving, that's a 2,150 year period, and another 2,150 period is going to begin, and who are going to be the gods of the new age, the gods of the new order of things? Well, it's like a, a prize fight, heavyweight champion uh, prize fight. We're going to have to fight this one out, see who the best man is. You know, the two guys fighting over the woman. So consequently, I think what we're beginning to see and what we're going to see very soon is an all-out cosmic war in which we're going to also see, I think we're going to be uh, privy to see supernatural things going on, not just in this war, not just in war. I think we're going to see some really strange phenomena being able to, uh, you know, people are going to see it for themselves. Nori Hayakawa, dear friend of mine, I just spoke uh, this past week at the Japanese uh, Friendship Club in, in uh, Little Tokyo uh, for Norio. Uh, but Norio has been saying for many years, Norio is famous for his work with Area 51, but Norio Hayakawa has said so often that he believes that the United States government and probably the world government behind it is planning on having some kind of a UFO uh, extravaganza that they're going to do themselves. It's going to be a show and it's going to be the aliens landing here from another world and they're going to cause this and that to happen and therefore all the nations are going to have to get together to fight this alien race that's here and the whole thing is a show to fool everyone into joining a new world order collectively. Uh, and, and the whole thing will be a trick, and the trick is going to be so well done, the, the most ardent skeptic is going to believe it because it's really going to be a hot show. But nonetheless, as, as, uh, as Norio says, the whole thing is a put-up job. Well, I said to Norio one night at a dinner at, after one of the lectures we were doing together, 
at the table, and a bunch of the speakers were there, and, it was in, and I said to Norio, Norio, I can take the same facts that you enumerated tonight that back up your theory. I could take the same exact facts and come up with a different theory that fits it equally as well. And I would say, it's just my opinion, but I could take the same facts you've come up with. You said that they were here, that they were doing this and that, and that they're going to land and make it look like. I wonder if it isn't going to be an actual, in fact, invasion of extraterrestrials invading us. I, I would be, not be a bit surprised if the U.S. government knows that it's going to happen. They've already been told that these gods are going to do battle with other gods who are coming here for the ownership of the earth and that you are, and, and the governments of the world of this earth are being told either you're with us or you're with them. And you had better be with us because we're already here and they're coming and they are our enemies. And so it's a war between the gods for the ownership of the earth and consequently if that be the case you better sue for peace with one of the two. And logic would tell you that if one of them is already here, that's the one you better sue for peace with. And so I said to Norio, it may very well be that it's not going to be a staged event. I think maybe they're actually going to be a, an extraterrestrial uh, intervention into our, uh, into our civilization. And we might be seeing things from another world that are legitimately real. So I, and these are all the things which were prophesied in the Bible. They're prophesied in the ancient uh, Hopi um, prophecies. In the Mayans, the Incas, all of the ancient peoples uh, have prophesied that the gods would come back. They're coming back. Well, what are you talking about coming back? Every 3,600 years, Nibiru comes through, a planet comes through, in which we are told by the Sumerians, those people from Nibiru, uh, who have come from another planet and another world look like us and they created or recreated us and they're coming back and they're not very happy with us and they're not very happy with the alien life forms who are here who have been manipulating us and using us. It's like one gang coming in and finding out another gang has set up shop here and they say, hey, wait a minute. You know, just because we went down to the store, that don't mean you come in here and take over. Well, we're already here. What are you going to do about it? Well, we'll show you what we're going to do about it. And now all of a sudden, the people in the neighborhood, they better get out of here because there's going to be a war. And it's not because they're trying to protect you. It's ownership. Somebody came here and created us. And they're coming back, and they're going to find out others are here. And they're taking over our planet. So I'm saying that there's a very good chance that there is a whole nother story in the Bible uh, encoded and from my talking with rabbis and, and looking at the subject I think there is something legitimate about all of this I do not discard the Bible both Old and New Testament I think there's some very interesting and important material in there I just don't think we have fully understood it yet it's a lot of encoded stuff again tohu vohu means cosmic destruction on a cosmic level and if we, in fact, if, if we, in fact, begin to see two opposing forces of gods, alien life forms from other worlds that have, we all know, technology we don't even understand, and if they begin an all-out war between themselves on this earth we are going to see some extraordinary destruction some very very powerful and fearful things and this is what the scripture says it says in Isaiah that men are going to beg God to die and for the mountains to call crawl in over them they're going to wish that they were dead and that people are going to be having uh, in Jeremiah it says men will be having heart attacks about thinking about what's coming. They can already see it coming, the implications. I think tohu and vohu, cosmic destruction on a cosmic level is about to begin. I think that's exactly what's now on the way. This is why the powers that be in America are so dead strong 
and so locked in on what they're going to do is because they have no alternative. The people who are actually running this government from behind the scenes, we call it the world government or the Illuminati or the secret societies. No, I think the people who are running this thing from behind the scenes are not even human. And what they got planned according to their own agenda for ownership of us is going to be one hell of a war. And at this point, I would conclude by saying I believe the only hope that we have as individual humans, I, I am totally convinced because of too much has, has proven this to me, that over and above this scenario, if it has any validity at all, over and above this scenario, bad as it is, there is above the, the, the scenario a higher power in the universe that men have called, for a lack of a better term, God. There are many terms that can be used for God. The divine presence in the universe, the Holy Spirit, I don't care what you call it because all nations, uh, races and peoples on the earth have acknowledged the presence of, quote, it, end quote, whatever it is, but it's there. If you choose to call it God or the divine, incidentally the word divine comes from the idea that the grapes, uh, the, the red wine represents the blood and the blood represents life and it came from the vine. And so that's why it's the blood comes from the divine, the vine. But I don't care if you call God the divine one, the Holy Spirit, the great father, it doesn't matter what you call that presence in the universe. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that there is a higher power in the universe that watches these skirmishes between races in its great creation. And I would suggest that all of us, uh, the way to protect yourself is the way the scripture said to do it in the way that the New Testament admonishes to do it, and that is to verbally, verbally, uh, by yourself, when no one is around, uh, audibly talk to the Spirit as if the Spirit were a very highly intelligent, powerful man or woman that you were talking to. If you were talking to a very powerful dignitary you would not jumble your words. You were very, very specific in what you want to say. Have the highest of respect for that one that you're speaking before. And once you have said your piece before the king and before that high official, then drop it. That's it. You've said your piece. He has heard it. It's over. Now, he will do whatever he decides to do in your behalf, but it's over. You don't need to explain anything more or, or whine about it. And so I think that this is the most powerful thing that an individual can do, is talk to the creator, the, the divine spirit in the universe, ask for direction, ask what am I to, supposed to know, what am I supposed to do, how can I protect myself and my loved ones, show me what I am to know, show me what I am to do, and I will listen, I will do whatever it is. No matter how wrong I am, I will listen, you show me. What you need to understand that once you do that, Jesus, the scripture has Jesus saying, you have not because you ask not. It is a, it is a normal thing in human communications. If you ask someone for something, they now have the, the option to grant the wish or not grant the wish. Well, if you go before a very powerful king or a very powerful man and ask him for something, don't make a, a nuisance out of yourself. You've asked, you've asked, and, and he has heard, and he'll decide. Maybe he decides no. But whatever he de the decision is, that's it anyway. So consequently, I believe that the smart thing, if you're concerned about your spirituality and your life, is to quietly talk to God or talk to the universe of God for us, because believe me, it's there and it hears you, and ask, what am I to do? What am I to know? Show me where I'm wrong. Tell me what I have to do, and I'm going to do it. Then leave it alone and watch the way the Spirit works. Things will begin to happen around you, and all of a sudden, you know, things will begin to, to pop up in front of you. Think, you'll, you'll be asking a question, and it will come on television. You'll open up a magazine, and there it is, the answer right in front of you. 
And you think that's by chance? No, you asked God for direction, didn't you? So the scripture says God works in strange ways, his, his wonders to accomplish. So I'm saying that we are in a very perilous time, tohu vohu, cosmic things are going to happen. But I believe that there is a higher force in the universe. Talk to that spirit and it will protect you and guide you because all wise men have always said that and it's true. And I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Jordan, by the way. I hope you guys liked it. Was it good? Uh, was it good? You guys liked it? Good. I'm glad. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, we just made a bunch of tapes for Kathleen Keating and the father. So we'll play one of them for you. Which one would you like to hear? Keating? Okay. I'm going to go grab two sets. We'll play them. While uh, Wendy is away on business, uh, I'll entertain some questions if you have any, and not necessarily do I have the answers, if you have any questions. First of all, thank you, Jordan. Uh, the spirit you're talking about that we speak to, there was a uh, great religious leader in this century named Mosendar. Who? Mosendar. And he uh, communicated with this spirit, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, a, and the way he did it was, he he talked to the spirit, and he'd answer for the spirit. And this went on for for months, and all of a sudden, his voice came out of nowhere, and he started to communicate it with this spirit, like you were talking about. Anyway, right. thank you again. Yeah, that's, I've had too many examples of that happening in my own life. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I know that when you speak, there is uh, scientific evidence for the idea that whatever you say lasts forever. The vibration is in the air, and it's there forever. There are scientists and physicists today who I've talked with up in Portland who were saying that there is at least a concept I don't know if they've done it yet, but the concept is there of uh, being able to pull out of the air the vibrations of the, of the things which Pharaoh said, which all the ancient peoples of the world said, it's all still here. It's, it's in the Akashic record, so to speak. It's all still here and can be recorded and can be tapped into if you have the right instruments to tap into that very high esoteric science of of things which was said thousands of years ago are still in the air. And so uh, I wouldn't be a bit surprised that there is some technology yet to come that can do that. Uh, I know because of my own personal experiences of being able to talk to the spirit and later on having magnificently strange stuff happen that just blows my mind. I mean, things which are uh, actually fear-inspiring and the implications of what happened. I asked for something, and when it happened, it happened in such a profound way that it was kind of scary to me. And then I thought, the Spirit is saying, hey, you asked, didn't you? You have not, for you asked not. You asked, and I, and I, and I answered you. Now, just because you turned white and was frightened to death uh, at the implications of it, uh, that's the way God is. I mean, it's a very powerful force at work right now. Very interesting stuff going on. So while I'm very displeased and very disheartened 
at seeing what's going on, I know that there's one higher than the high one who looks on, and, and what goes around comes around. And millions, millions of people died before, millions will still die, but there is a higher dimension to reality. Even in Hollywood, they call it a matrix. There is a higher dimension to the reality on the earth. Something else is going on here on a higher level. And I'm saying that you need to get in touch with your God who, who is the actual spirit in the universe because it's, it's intelligent and it hears you. Any, anyone else? Yeah, yeah, Jordan, that concept of what you're talking about, um, I believe, and you've, I'm sure you've read uh, William Blake because he took the, the stories of the Bible and he called it our imagination that lives within us is actually God, I think, and uh, it's very, very right along with what you're talking about. In the book of uh, Psalms and in the New Testament has Jesus saying, have you, in the book and the New Testament, there's a scripture where it has Jesus saying uh, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, does not your scripture say that ye are gods? And if you go back to Psalms, it's, that's what it says. It gives you in the Bible reference works where that comes from. In the Old Testament, there is a scripture in Psalms that says that we are gods in that the, the progenitive life force in us has come from another place in the universe. Wherefore, we are the offspring of the uh, Elohim. We're the offspring of the gods. So we are, in point of God, in point of fact, in a matter of speaking, the offspring of gods. And that being the case, that's why Jesus uh, has Jesus saying to the Hebrews or to the Jews of his day, uh, does not your scripture say that ye are gods? that we are gods. So I'm just saying that uh, when you understand how these words work and what these terms mean, all of a sudden you got a whole different story than what you thought what the Bible was saying. It's saying something totally different than what you thought. Yes? Is this planet you're talking about, is that, is that planet X? Yeah. This, people that, talk about? I think, from mm -hmm. my limited understanding of planet X, uh, I asked Zachariah Sitchin about that, planet X, and if it was Nibiru. I had him on my show, on my radio show, and I said to him, and I made the mistake, because I know Zachariah, and I should have known better, mm -hmm. but I said to him, Zachariah, so-and-so, uh, this other gentleman, and I give his name, has written a book about Planet X, and can you tell me anything about that? And Zachariah said to me, I don't talk about other people's work. You wanted me to be a guest on your show? You talk about Zachariah Sitchin. I don't, we're not talking about somebody else. Oh, mm -hmm. oh well, thank you, and good morning. God bless you. <laughs> So, uh, uh, but I've talked to him in private, and he, um, he was noncommittal, but he thought it was interesting that this is uh, a planet which is legitimately there. It's coming from what I guess from the southern hemisphere, coming from, from the deep south hemisphere, from like uh, over Antarctica, coming this way. So it's not coming from somewhere we can see it, but if you're down in... Peru or in the mountains, you can see it coming from the south. Oh, you can? Yeah. yeah wow. So it's, they've already picked, take, taken pictures of it. Uh -huh. uh, so they know it's, it's, it's legitimate. Yes, it's, it's, it is coming this way. Yes, it is. seems to be about twice the size of the earth. Um, yeah, they're referring to it as Planet X. Incidentally, mm -hmm. are you aware that Russia has a huge uh, project talking about Planet X all over Russia. There are signboards. I've seen pictures sent to me, uh, huge billboards with the planet showing it coming toward, and it says in, in Russian that uh, it's, it's almost here. Get ready. Hmm. Uh, the Russians are the big signboards showing the Earth, the sun out in the back, and this huge planet coming, and it kind of got a, a stream like it's moving, and in, in Russian, it's saying uh, it's coming. Get ready. Hmm. So all over Russia, May. they're talking about a planet that's coming into our vicinity. And, and what you have to appreciate, too, is that the planet, if it's twice the size of the Earth and comes into our solar system, the uh, David Talbot, I can talk for hours on this subject of, of the work of David Talbot, uh, the, the solar system as we know it today 
is not the same configuration of the solar system that may have existed 10,000 years ago. In other words, Saturn today is just a bright little star. Mm -hmm. Jupiter is a little bit brighter. Well, it's not a star, it's a planet, but it looks like a bright star. But according to the ancient peoples, they said that the configuration of our solar system was totally different 10,000 to 12, 20,000 years, maybe 25,000 years ago was totally different. Saturn was much closer. Mars was much closer. Uh, different planets were further away. It was a different configuration. So at night, you would walk out and see this huge enormous planet with rings around it, that's how close Saturn was to us. Mm -hmm. And if you take a, a round circle around Saturn and turn it just at a right angle, it looks like an eye. Ah. The eye inside the circle, but the circle is now oblong because you turn the angle and now it looks like an eye looking at you. Mm. Mars, we're told, according to the, the theory that is now being worked out that Mars could very well have come through and caused some kind of an electrical frequency going between us and Saturn. Mm -hmm. You've seen the pictures of Mars where it has those jagged cuts in Mars. It looks like deep canyons on, on Mars. They're very heavily cut and they look like electrical shock waves going out from it. Mm -hmm. Many people have thought that that was like water uh, rivers and whatever. No, no, not at all. They now know for a certainty what those jagged, uh, like our, uh, what is it, um, out here in Arizona? Canyons. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. Yeah. There are huge, enormous canyons uh, which go for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles on Mars, far, far deeper, far, far bigger. Uh, and they say, well, those were, those were great canyons of water at one time. No, we now know what they are. They, it has been replicated in, in, on the scientific experiment, and they now know that those cuts on Mars were electrical discharges from Mars to another planet. Mm -hmm. It's like out here on these uh, power poles. If you get two of those power poles uh, lines too close together, they have to be a certain amount apart. If you get them too close together, the, the electricity, the, the static electricity coming through on the outside will arc. They'll, they'll jump. When it does, you've got problems. If you get two powerful lines, I mean really very powerful uh, lines and get them too close, they'll jump and boy when they do, now you've got an explosion. We now know that the Earth, as it rotates, as the Earth rotates, it generates electricity because it's, it's, it's rotating inside of its own atmosphere, which is causing friction, which gives us our electrical storms, tornadoes. It's because the Earth is rotating like a generator, generating electricity, and that electricity is grounded. It goes back into the ground, which goes down and heats up the lava, keeping it hot and bubbling, and so consequently, if another planet comes close to us, the electrical frequency, our electrical, biological and electrical frequency on this Earth would jump and hit the other planet. Mm -hmm. And so they are now able to see that that's what happened to Mars. Mars must have moved too close to another planet thousands of years ago, and it jumped. The spark jumped off of Mars and shot across and hit another planet. And that's why there are all, all this, that, uh, and that whole uh, orbit mm -hmm. that Mars is in are many, many uh, asteroids and many, many uh, meteors or whatever. It's because there was an electrical discharge that you wouldn't believe coming off of the, off the, uh, the surface of Mars that jumped out and hit another planet because it came too close. Mm -hmm. Well, they always call it the fiery planet, yes. don't they? Um, one other thing, do you have a favorite version of the Bible to read? Yes, Which I one? certainly do. It's called, it's called, um, it's my favorite one because it's got all kinds of interesting, great uh, footnotes that nobody will touch. Nobody else has it. And it's, um, it's called the Companion Bible. It's the, it's the King James Bible, but it's called the Companion Bible. Bible, and it's put out by Kriegel, K 
K-R-E-G-E-L, Kregel Company, Companion Bible. And if you call me at my office, I'll give you the ISBN number and the address of where to get it from. And uh, there are places around town you can get it over in Pasadena. It has a whole set of Kriegel's Bibles. That one is sensational. They've got all kinds of interesting stuff in who the Hebrew, the Hebrew language was actually Phoenician Canaanite, gives you all the reference works. Uh, it tells you in their reference works that the entire New Testament is astral theology based on astrology, and it gives you all of the reference works and all the, the volumes to research. Um, just and it gives you numerology, Egyptology, tells you the real truth about where things come from. The Ark of the Covenant was borrowed from the Egyptian. It's an Egyptian story. The Ten Commandments, it says in, in, the, in the reference work in that Bible, was taken from the Egyptian concept of the Twelve Negative Confessions, as I said. Uh, that Bible is called the Companion Bible, is crammed, filled with interesting stuff, end quote that most people have never even heard. I'll say, hey, this is a reference work Bible. It's just telling you things that nobody else will tell you. So that's the one I would get, the companion Bible. But uh, give me a call at my office, and then I'll give you the actual ISBN number so you get the exact one. Because the King James Bible, it's uh, 818. Anybody can call me 24 hours a day. 818-705-3029. Come over and visit me if you want to. I don't care. I always try to make myself uh, available and accessible to everybody. I'm just a, I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. I don't have to be. I'm just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. I'm fascinated with the world of the occult and how much we don't know. And I've spent 43 years of my life looking at stuff that most people don't even know exists. Yes. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> in Sitchin's... Uh book, The Lost Realms, he was looking at uh, where the earth stood still for 24 hours so Joshua could slaughter the Philistines. Oh, yeah. So he thought that, well, if it was 24 hours of light on one side of the planet, theoretically there should have been 24 <coughs> hours of darkness on the other. Yeah, Velikovsky. So, yeah. Well, so what he did was he checked, uh, Sitchin checked with the, um, the Mayan codexes in South America. Oh, and yeah. He found at the same period of time that uh, Joshua was supposed to have lived roughly 3,600 years ago, where they had their 24 hours of daylight. In South America, the sun didn't come up for 24 hours. It was dark. So he realized that evidently when Nibiru comes by, the gravity is so great, it literally stops our planet from rotating for about 24 hours as it moves on through. I love that. Yeah. That's trippy stuff. Also, when you mentioned that Bible, the Strong's Concordance works real well with oh, that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Strong's Bible Concordance. I've got three copies of that thing. I like it so much, I went out and bought three copies. <laughs> and I open all three copies, and I read all three at one time. Because I want to leave that one there while I open another one, and that one opens this one, i got to open that one. It's Strong's Bible Concordance, but get the large print, not the small print. Because the small print is so microscopic, it'll bl you know, go blind. Large print, beautiful. Get the Strong's Bible Concordance, and every single word in the Bible, it tells you exactly what it means where it came from. It's a whole reference. It's, a, it's an incredible piece of work. Strong's Bible Concordance, large print. And the, uh, what did I say, the Companion Bible, King James Companion Bible. You get those two. Incidentally, you might want to get a book called, um, it's very, it's kind of expensive. I think it's like 45 to 50 dollars, and it's not really a big book, but it's just expensive. Uh, called Mythology's Last Gods. In my opinion, that's a, that's a real trippy book for me. I, I've got a lot of great books, but that one in particular is a mind blower. It's called Mythology's Last Gods by Dr. Harwood, H-A-R-W-O-O-D, Dr. Harwood. Mythology's Last Gods, Dr. Harwood. It's a doctoral thesis put into a book form in which he goes back and examines the actual interesting history of the old ancient world 
what really the words meant, where it really came from, what it was actually saying, what the Sumerians and the ancient Hebrews, Phoenician Canaanites were actually saying what those words meant. That gets interesting. Incidentally, the very word Cana, you've heard of the, the marriage feast of Cana and the Canaanites. Cana, C-A-N-A-A-N, Cana, uh, translates from the Phoenician language, a word Cana means merchant banker. Hmm? Is that interesting? Cana, the land of Cana, Cana is merchant banker. Yes? Me? Yeah. Thank you, Jordan. I enjoyed it. Um, you leave absolutely no doubt that um, uh, I guess men still see themselves as God, and the women have a much lesser place. I particularly enjoyed the story of, uh, what, of the three fellows that went, was it to Abraham's house? Yeah, Abraham and his Yeah, and friends. two of them left, and they lowered themselves by uh, meeting women. So yeah. that's where falling in love, uh, much lower plane. Um, and it seems to me when Noah came out of the ark with his three sons and the gods, who are men walking amongst us. It's interesting, too, about the ark, is that well, no, nobody ever talks about the women, the wives. Well, I was going women. to bring that up. How yeah. are they going to redo it again without the women, or were they yeah. just going to ramble through here and uh, take their pick. So I wish you'd uh, kind of speak to that a little bit. Why is it that the, um, the men of the, uh, the gods in the Bible, uh, you made it very clear that they are gods, they are men walking amongst us. Mm -hmm. uh, would you speak to their women? I mean, would you speak about their women? Or do they have any? Oh, I would think so. Why, the, why, why do you take the position that the men are gods and the gods are indeed men. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm interested uh, in that. According thank to you. the ancient, uh, thank you, the ancient Greeks uh, were not the only ones, but it comes to my mind, the ancient Greeks and the Romans, the ancient Romans, uh, they had equal, they had god, goddesses uh, who were deities also. And um, so if you're looking at the word god or gods as in the context that I've used it tonight, and I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just giving you a concept that seems to fit the scriptures and seems to fit the, uh, uh, so much of the evidence that's now being uncovered by Zechariah Sitchin and many, many, many more people like him. Uh, are any of you uh, aware of the work of uh, Michael Cremo? You ever heard of Michael Cremo? Yeah. Michael Cremo is a very, very studious and, and, uh, and fascinating man who is a no-nonsense professional uh, archaeologist who is seeing, and, and I've attended his lectures and got many of his videos, and he is making a very good case for the possibility that man as we know him today has been on the earth for millions and millions of years and that there has been destruction, world destruction, cosmic destruction, many, many times in the past. And I'm thinking, well, that's, well, that's what I'm reading in the Bible very well. Yeah. Did you write Forbidden Archaeology? Yeah. Um, forbidden Archaeology. And now there's two more books, uh, two large ones that have come out from him now. So he's got quite a bit. However, uh, Charlton Heston did an hour television special on Michael Cremo and his work. I've got it. It's beautifully done with Charlton Heston, the, the host of the program. And they're interviewing, uh, <clears throat> it's called the, um, the Hidden History of Mankind or something like that. I've got that. It's very, very interesting. I mean, Michael Cremo makes a very legitimate, uh, you know, argument for the fact that maybe we've been on this earth for millions of years. I mean, when we hear about uh, archaeology, how the, how the archaeologists in, say, in Israel, they're digging down, they get these little pottery and whatever, and they're cleaning it off with their brushes. That, you know, that doesn't impress me. That's for NBC, that's for ABC, you know, Mr. and Mrs. America to watch. But when they are digging off the coast and the, and the North Sea, off the coast of England, the oil drillers are, are, are out there on the North Sea, 
and they are going all the way down into the ocean and then drilling into the ocean to hit oil and they're sucking up the stuff that they're cutting as it's coming up and they're finding utensils, rings and all kinds of interesting things. Hey, we're talking about under the Atlantic Ocean. How the hell long have something been down there under the Atlantic Ocean? Obviously, the Atlantic Ocean wasn't there at some time in history because there was stuff being brought up from the floor of the ocean, underneath the floor of the ocean. I'm just saying, hey, somebody better do their homework. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on here that we haven't been told about. So again, do you have any other question? Just a real quick comment about uh, women in the Bible. Uh, about three weeks ago, and I'll make the information available, uh, uh, Victor, who was here last week, his friend Linda Allen has an organization called, and she's an evangelist, uh, uh, aspiring, and she's, she ordains other ministers now, but she's got an organization called Women in God's Service, and the acronym is WINGS, but they, they study uh, women in the Bible, and yeah. it's very, very interesting. Every, they've got a series of lectures, all day, one day lectures. They've only done two so far. The last one was called Tough Women, and it was a pretty yeah, tough uh, <laughs> sermon. <laughs> But we'll, we'll make that available if anybody's interested. Good. Yeah, uh, I think that there has been a war going on for a long, long time between men and women. I think that there has been for many, many, many centuries, for thousands of years, an undeclared war between men and women. I mean, I just, I think that that pretty well is obvious. Um, uh, because the, the, there was female divinities in the ancient world and then with the coming of Rome the more emphasis was given even in the Greek system it was almost divided between men and women gods male and female gods but with the coming of Rome it was became more apparent that God was a man God was male uh, but if the Anunnaki or what we've talked about tonight uh, look like us then maybe their women look like you know maybe they are they have women also, and they would be extraterrestrial and, and of the same higher evolved creatures. So uh, again, I just think the concept that's in the Bible is very possibly exactly what's going on today and that the Middle East, uh, things which are happening in the Middle East today is again, as I said, not just mankind, but I think could be very much orchestrated by those extraterrestrials who are really running the things from behind the scenes. That makes sense to me. Yes? Do you think it's been a war between men and women or a war between men and men for the subjugation of women? No, I think between men and women. But there's always going to be that, that other also. But I think, uh, I think there's been a war between uh, male and female. Uh, incidentally, I just remembered something I, I wanted to bring out. Uh, when it says that in Genesis, in Genesis uh, 2, where it said that Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the evening, God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. Actually, the word walked with is translated, the Hebrew words imply uh, someone who hears steps. Someone is, you know, when someone's walking and you hear them cracking on the leaves, of something near you, you know someone's walking. That's what the word in Hebrew meant. So when it says that um, Adam and Eve walk with God, or God walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, walk with most uh, Christians and Jews have assumed, well, that means that, that God was there with them in spirit and he was there with walking with. No, no, the actual word means heard the footsteps. Walk with God, walk with Adam and Eve meaning Adam and Eve could hear the footsteps of God. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. You could hear him walking in the bush. <laughs> Implications are horrendous for that. What are we talking about? Maybe he's still here. You know, I think you know, Steven Spielberg has many things, but stupid isn't one of them. And he's been talking about ETs and, and um, close encounters of the third kind and we've been told you know all these science fiction movies coming out of Hollywood uh, I think there's something to all of this yes yeah in the Sitchin books uh, these whole pantheon of gods on the planet whether they're from India uh, Rome yeah. Greece South America 
they're all the same family with just each group has named them differently. And they were a family group. And the first, uh, I guess, guardian or god of the planet actually remained here for like over almost 900,000 years. And they subsequently changed leadership, but it was out of the same family. And uh, some of these warrior gods were women. And that was like uh, Aphrodite, and she's been given all kinds of names. She had rocket ships. Yeah, um, I know. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, again, it's, um, it's a fascinating story about the, the gods and goddesses and how they look like humans. I think they were, that's why we look like what we do, because we're made in the image and likeness of the Elohim, the Anunnaki, the gods. And that's why they can be right here in front of us and we'd never know it. And we've been told that, that you know, I've heard a lot of people in the military saying that the government knows that there are alien life forms here that look like us. And, uh, well, it makes sense. Maybe they're the ones that created us. They said that, you know, they make mankind look, to look like them and act like them. So anyway, uh, again, I was just, uh, if uh, Wendy is here and wants to make any final announcements, then I'm not going to take any more questions. Again, thank you. Deception. And now the best thing you could do if you're a politician is just kind of keep things going. Just kind of keep paying people off and hoping everything will come out all right tomorrow. And little by little by little, what goes around comes around, and we are facing a terrible time of judgment, I believe, by the divine forces in the universe which men have called God. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. One of my teachers once said, you can't make God do anything he doesn't want to. And if he's going to do something, you can't stop him. So consequently, since you can't influence it one way or the other, you should get in tune with the divine force of the universe and go with the flow. And that's what I believe, and that's what I've been trying to do all of my life. Just go with the flow and find out where the facts lead you. Because the more you begin to investigate what we think we understand, where we came from, what we think we're doing, the more you begin to see, we've been lied to. We've been lied to by every institution. What makes you think for one minute that the religious institution is the only one that's never been touched? You can bet your bottom dollar that the religious institutions of this world are at the bottom of the dirt. The religious institutions in this world are put there by the same people who gave you your government, your corrupt education, the Knights Templars who set up your international banking cartels in the 12th, 13th, and 14th century are the same people that gave you educational institutions, colleges. Where do we get the word college? College comes from the collegia, the Latin Roman college of cardinals. Uh, when you, when you, I mean, I could go on for hours just give you examples. I mean, when you graduate, you come out with a square mortar board, a black square mortar board. What's all that about? Black square mortar boards. It has to do with the planet Saturn. Saturn. You know, we're told that in the Old Testament that the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, were worshippers of one God. That's never been true not true now and never will be true. That's just one more story that's been given to us. That's never been true. The Hebrew people were worshippers of many gods, many different divine beings. They were, uh, they were the most eclectic, the most eclectic theology on the face of the earth uh, next to modern day Christianity is Judaism. Eclectic meaning it has collected from all over the world concepts and ideas and put it together and called it today Judaism. Judaism today is the most eclectic religion on the face of the earth. Virtually nothing of what it teaches is true. <clears throat> Virtually nothing of, what, of, its, uh, of its supposedly background is true. And consequently, the world is still with violence, bloodshed, disorder, Good people are dying, there are children who are starving, our world is in trouble, and people are calling out to God for protection, people are calling out to God to help our nation, and never realizing for one moment 
but the divine presence in the universe not listening. Why? Because you have your own concept of whatever you think is true, whatever you believe to be true, but you have never confronted the real truth. The real truth is that, that the people who are in power, who put this system together, have been in power for thousands of years. This has been going on from day one. I have the highest of respect for the Bible. Anyone who knows me knows I read it and study it all the time. But I'm also well aware that there are encoded messages. The rabbis will tell you that, that in the Old Testament is filled with encoded messages. Now, I believe that Christianity is probably the most powerful encoded message the world's ever had. It's one of the oldest messages in the world, and I believe that the Christian teachings in the original scriptural understanding is the most important volatile story the world's ever known and it's sitting right in front of you and most people don't even see it it is an encoded story and unfortunately too many people who are ill-informed unread and who have not spent 42 years looking at theology accept what they read in the new testament and in the old testament as actual history when in point of fact it is not actual history there is a message behind the message and consequently, if you're reading the Bible, and if you're looking at theological subjects from the Bible point of view, uh, in a materialistic way, you're never going to see the obvious story sitting right in front of you. I believe that the story in the New Testament, <clears throat> and I'm concerned about this because I believe the world is now facing another dark age. I think that we are now preparing ourselves to go into a very dark time that's coming on the earth. And I believe that the, the message that's in the New Testament is a very powerful, uh, symbolic, metaphysical story that's, that is not very well understood today. Let me go back to the original Hebrew religion. Because it forms the basis for Christianity, we need to look at <clears throat> where did any of these things come from. I'm famous for doing that. I couldn't care less who I offend. I want to know the truth. And all you've got to do is go to any good library and just start reading. There are hundreds of great reference books out there that tell you where things have come from. First of all, <clears throat> all of the things which are going on in this world today, uh, from 9-11, all of the wars in the Middle East, all of the, um, the incredible bloodshed that's being uh, spilled all over the earth, can be traced back to, and you might want to remember what I'm saying here, because you, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to make the connection when I first tell you, but I'm going to try and explain it to you. The things which are happening today, the people who are in power in this country, um, the, the, the great generals from around the world who are planning wars and violence and bloodshed, all of this stuff can be traced back to the planet Saturn. Saturn is a very, very pivotal, important concept in theology and religion. And most people have never been told any of this and have no knowledge of it at all. But the planet Saturn is very important in world affairs, in theology. And the Islamic belief, the holy city of Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia. Mecca has a Masonic circle, and within the Masonic circle is a square, because you've got to do everything on the square, remember. <clears throat> you have a town square, you have New York square, you have uh, a Vatican square, you have a red square, you have uh, all kinds of squares. Why? Because this is Masonic. And it goes all the way back into the ancient world, the terms and symbols. Again, the planet Saturn is called the black square. It's called the dark sun, the black sun. This is what the Nazis and the SS and the Gestapo wore black. 
That's why uh, priests wear black. That's why judges wear black robes. Why do you think a judge wears a black robe? He wears a black robe because when you used to graduate from university, you wear a black robe. Why black robes? Darth Vader wears a black robe. What the hell does a black robe have to do with anything? The judges wear black robes. You know, Supreme Court judges wear black robes. Black robes represent the priesthood of the planet Saturn, the Saturnalian Brotherhood. All you need to do is study Nazism, and you will begin to see that the powers behind the Nazi party, the Thule Society, the Germanian Order, were all members of something called the Saturnalian Brotherhood, the Brotherhood of Saturn. Saturn was the god of darkness, chaos, and destruction. He teaches you a lesson. He will take your life if you don't listen to him. So consequently, Saturn was very, very important in the ancient world. Thank you. <clears throat> Saturn's name, incidentally, in the old Phoenician ancient Canaanite religion, um, in the Middle East, the old Phoenician Canaanite worship of the planet Saturn was the most important god of all the ancient world, was the planet Saturn, and his symbol, long before the Hebrews were ever in Cana, the symbol in Cana for the planet Saturn was a six-pointed star. Today we, call that, today we call that star the Star of, of David. There was no Star of David. It's the star of Saturn. All of the Jewish reference books, all the Encyclopedia Judica, all of I go to the synagogue, uh, go up into uh, Mulholland Drive, up to the Jewish University, and spend three weeks there and look up Saturn. You'll find out that 98% of all Judaism is a worship of the planet Saturn. Better wake up and understand where this stuff comes from. Because if there is a God in heaven, if there is a divine presence in the universe that demands righteousness and justice then you're going to have to rethink what we believe and where we're going and what the world is all about because for the last 2,000 years we haven't done too well logic alone should tell you that when Jews were being marched into concentration camps uh, they were praying out they were praying obviously to their God for protection and for help there was no help coming Christians have been praying to God to help this nation, to protect their family, and evil grows and multiplies each day. And the more Christians pray, the more evil the, the pervasiveness becomes. And the reason why is because we are not in tune with the universal God force. We're not in tune with the truth. We're in tune with what we've been told is the truth. We understand that thing that we've been told about government, that we have to pay your taxes because that's the law. You think, what law? Where is there a law that says that? Well, it's in there somewhere. No. Where is the law? And then you find out, well, it was just a lie. The whole thing was a lie. The whole thing is a sham. Well, the same thing is true in our theological thinking. The reason why I am bringing this subject up is because I feel it's important now in the year 2000 Two, because I think that very soon we're going to experience some pretty dynamic spiritual things are going to begin to happen on the earth because I do not believe that the divine presence in the universe that men have called God is going to allow this to go on much longer but the way history has always shown us is that when God moves theologically speaking when God moves people die and consequently, I think that we are coming to a point where we're going to be in serious trouble, and that's why I want to help my fellow man to become spiritually prepared for what's coming. And the only way you're going to do that is understand where things come from and begin to appreciate we've been misled again. Uh, <clears throat> I have tons of, of videos, and I mean, of slides I'd like to show, but there's so many things I want to talk about too. Let me get back to the planet Saturn. Saturn was referred to, as I said, its symbol was the six-pointed star. Today we call it the Star of David. Uh, Saturn was referred to as El, E-L. El was the god Saturn in the old Phoenician Canaanite system. And consequently, anyone that promoted the worship of El 
is where we get the word elder. You become an elder because you are worshiping El. And when you worship El and become an elder, then uh, you are, how did you get to be an elder? You got El elected. So therefore we have El elections. <clears throat> now that you have been El elected to be an elder, now you are one of the El elites. Why? Because now you have moved up like in an El elevator. You are now moved up in society. world. <clears throat> Consequently, if anything's going to happen in this country to turn it around, we're going to need a renaissance, an intellectual, spiritual renaissance. Because you can't do it with arms. Adolf Hitler rose to power the same way George Bush did. It's the simple Mickey Mouse routine that it works every time. I'm ashamed of this country and I'm ashamed of the people who call themselves Americans who drive around with a damn silly ass flag on their car and not even realize that's not an American flag. All you got to do is do your homework. You find out that is a United States flag. And it's not even an original United States flag because an original United States flag has these stripes going vertical, not horizontal. But who the hell knows that? Who cares? I mean, we just put a, put a flag on your car and drive around like a fool. It's, it is a disgrace. Somewhere along the line, we're going to discover we've been had. If we haven't already figured it out. I want to show you how the planet Saturn... The Saturnalian Brotherhood, the worship of the planet Saturn. <clears throat> Saturn's color was black. The black, uh, all, each one of the gods and each one of the planets were associated with a different color. Green was associated with Venus, and that's why today in Islamic countries today, you will see all of their flags and halotry in, in Islamic world are in green. And you'll see the crescent with the star. Many people think the crescent is the crescent of the moon, but it is not. According to the actual research documents, <clears throat> the crescent on the Islamic flags is the crescent of the planet Venus. And the star represents Venus. It is a religion that is based on the worship of Venus, but which has incorporated the Saturnalian philosophy in it. So, like all the other religions, it is also a very eclectic religion. <coughs> uh, we hear that God's name is you know, Yahweh. Let me tell you something about Yahweh. I mean, I've spent 42 years looking at this stuff, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm amazed at how many people don't even begin to know what these words mean. Yahweh is not the name of God. Yahweh in Hebrew is an expressive term. It's expressing something. It's uh, describing something. It's not, a, it's not a formal name of God. Yahweh in Hebrew simply means, and the best way to explain what the word means, is to take a garden hose and twist hold the, 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 the end of it, turn on the water, and you feel the pressure building up. When you release the hose, it's a release of pressure. It's a release of energy. In the Hebrew, in the ancient Hebrew, the release of dynamic energy was called Yahweh. And it was always associated with sex. It's the building up of the sexual urge and the releasing of sex in the sex act was referred to in the ancient Phoenician Canaanite system as being one with Yahweh. The explosion of divine creativity. That's why our Jewish physicists have told us the universe came into existence by a big bang.
Consequently, I become very un. I become very disorganized in my thinking because there's so many things I want to show you. So many things I've been wanting to tell people for years. <clears throat> i got to boil down 42 years into an hour or so. But suffice it to say that the planet Saturn is very important and you need to remember that and do some research on it. And you will find that the Nazis were, the Nazi party was probably the most glorious Saturnalian brotherhood we've ever seen. Nazis were heavy into the Saturnalian system of philosophy, war, destruction. The ancient Phoenician Canaanites said that the women should listen to their god Saturn. They always knew Saturn had rings. So they said the women should listen to their gods. So women were, women were to wear ear rings. Men were to get married before their gods, so they were to wear a wedding ring. Kings were to get a uh, crown before their gods, so consequently they would have a round crown, the corona, the ring. Saturn is the god of this world. From that we get the dark side of the force, Darth Vader. Remember Darth Vader with his Nazi helmet speaking through the Masonic Triangle? Somebody better do their homework. This stuff is fascinating when you get into it. In the ancient Phoenician Canaanite system, when it finally <clears throat> bled into Europe thousands of years ago, it formed what we, what we call the Celtic Druidic system. The Celtic Druidic system uh, had its origins in the old Phoenician Canaanite system. That whole area we call today Israel and Lebanon, that was called Phoenicia Cana. And consequently, that whole system of the Canaanite religion uh, found its way into Eastern Europe and then into Northern Europe <clears throat> and formed the basis theologically for what came to be known as the uh, Celtic Druidic system. The Celtic Druidic system, one of the most important symbols, and some of you have heard me say this before, one of the most important symbols in the old Celtic Druidic system was a magic wand, like Merlin the Magician with his magic wand. That's Celtic Druidic. Magic wands were always made out of holly wood. Okay? And they're still working their magic on us in Hollywood. The system that we are under is a most manipulating exploiting a system that's ever been put together. But I'll tell you one thing. The Steven Spielbergs and the George Lucases and the Michael Eisners and all the guys that run the entertainment world, all of them, are many things, but stupid is not one of them. These guys are class A, top of the line intellectuals. They know the name of the tune. They know exactly how to manipulate your thinking. They have something called program music. And you go in and you never, most people never think when they go to a movie or watch a television show. They never think about it. Who writes scripts? Scripts are written by script writers. Script writers scribble scripts. And consequently the, script, the scribbling script writers were called scribes. So when Jesus denounces the Pharisees and the scribes, the scribes were the people who scribbled scripts. And consequently, the religious writers of the day, those who wrote all of those glorious religious writings, were all the scribes. They're being paid money by the system to write all of their silly little scribes, all of their silly little stuff that the masters wanted. Why do you think the King James Version is called the authorized version of the Bible. It's the one King James authorized. He didn't authorize you to go doing too much research on your own. You get your head cut off. Consequently, we go back to Yahweh. I mean, have you ever wondered why we call God the Father? You ever thought about that? I mean, women, uh, some of the women's lepers were saying it could be a God the Mother, you know. I don't know. But the point being is that why do we call God the Father? It's because of rain. 
reign is why we call God the Father. Because in the old ancient Hindu, if you go back into the old Sanskrit writings of the ancient Hindu religion, you will find that the divine presence of God, the, the Most High, was referred to in their language, in the old Sanskrit language of India, God was referred to as rain, R-A-I-N, rain. And consequently, the idea was that the earth was our mother, mother nature, mother earth. And mother nature gets impregnated with God's, the Father's sacred fluid that comes and falls on the earth and impregnates mother nature because everything grows. And so once a year, there was a celebration of Phoenicia Cana when the spring rains would come. And consequently, the, the Phoenician Canaanites knew that the rains were coming and it was going to bring a whole new life to the earth. So consequently, they had, a, they had a celebration of spring and it was called the Marriage Feast of Cana. The Marriage Feast of Cana. And this is in the Bible. As I said, that there are many things in the scriptures that are hidden right in front of you. And if you don't know what they mean, you don't know where they came from, You'd be surprised when you begin to look at where these stories come from. The whole idea of the marriage feast of Cana was Mother Earth, Mother Nature, asked God's Son, our risen Savior, and of course the Son is your risen Savior. As a matter of fact, if it don't come up, we're dead. So consequently, the Son was our risen Savior, and, and so Mother Earth asked God's Son to draw water. The water is drawn by the Son, so it can grow, it can fall on the grapes, and the grapes can be made into wine. So it changes water into wine, and this is, goes back to the old ancient Phoenician Canaanite, and even the Jewish rabbis will tell you that. Consequently, there are symbols and ideas and concepts in government which are put there purposely to mislead, uh, mislead you. There are symbols and ideas in, in, in all of our systems purposely to mislead you, and I'm saying that even the theological basis for what we think we're doing has also been misled and until such time as we get it right we're never going to have that divine protection that the universe offers you when you're doing it right and again what I do is not to offend anyone but I want to show you how these things have crept into our modern day society our international banking cartels, which control, finance, and organize and direct all of this corruption, wars, and bloodshed, and we're all well aware of that, but most people don't know that international banking cartels go back to the Vatican. The Vatican, as far back as the 5th, 6th, and 7th century, was the power of Europe. The Vatican dominated Europe, and Europe dominated the world. Even the Uniform Commercial Code, the international banking codes of the world, are based on Vatican canon law. I mean, that's why when you walk into a courtroom, why do you have to go to court? Does anybody ever wonder why you go to court? I mean, you play basketball on a court, and you play tennis on a court. The whole idea in a court is to put the ball back in the other guy's court. That's right, it's just a game. Back and forth, they're throwing the ball back at each other, and the judge is there wearing a black robe. Blocked because of the planet Saturn. Saturn was the god of banking. That's why the, the judge sits on the, on the bench. Look it up. Look up the word bench. You will find the word bench is a Latin word for a bank. So the judge rules for the bank. He don't care who's going to win or lose. Somebody's going to pay. And he's going to get paid. What does he care? Okay? So consequently, the judge rules for the bank. He sits on the bench. The whole idea is you're in court to play ball back on the court. How do you play... How do you play uh, tennis on a court. You play with a racket. Why? Because the whole thing is a racket. They're using terms and symbols and emblems. And they're playing on you. You know, a lot of people think, well, these are just play on words. Don't bet on it.
the justice. That's why it's a criminal justice system. Okay? A mafia runs this town. I personally know that. Los Angeles is run by the mob. If you don't think so, they got their own license tags. The mafia has its own license tag that the police department does not touch. They see a mafia license tag, they do not touch it. I'm not going to get into that. But I can tell you that the mafia and the mob runs this country. And the Catholic Church is behind the mob. Period. My mother had an uncle when I was growing up as a child. I only remember him faintly because I was very little. He worked in the Vatican, Secretary of State's office. He was not clergy, he was civilian. And I grew up in my hometown having two uncles who were federal judges. My great-grandfather was a senator from the state of Florida, a very powerful man, and he died in office because they couldn't get rid of him. Why? Because he was mobbed and everybody knew it. My uncle Joe Valenzino used to come over every now and then with this big cigar and sit, and my father used to tell me, don't you ever, ever ask Uncle Joe what he does for a living. <laughs> ever. You just take whatever little presents and be cool and sit down, and if you open your mouth, I'll knock your teeth out. Okay? <laughs> so I understood. There was a system in operation. My mother, my beloved mother, my father, my family, all of my family, including myself, were born and raised Catholic. So I'm not talking about the Catholic people. I'm not talking about the black people. I'm not talking about the Jewish people. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about political organizations. We're talking about institutions that are financed all over the world. Huge, powerful financial empires. That's what I'm talking about, not the people. So I grew up understanding that there was a whole system in operation, and I decided at the ripe old age of 19, 18, when I left home to come to California, I wanted to be on my own and do my own thinking. And I started out immediately collecting and reading books on Nazism, the communist movement, the philosophies, all the different occult sciences. And it only, uh, it, it became apparent to me that the entire world system is corrupt. So what we have today on the world scene, we call them world governments and United Nations with all the different governments uh, represented. In point of fact, what we're seeing is gang wars. We got the Crips and the Bloods and the East Side Gang and the West Guy and, and this group and that group. And today we call them nations. No, they're only gangs. They're all, they're all corrupt, money-grubbing, and uh, so consequently what goes around comes around. And we're seeing the complete breakdown of law and order around the world, and I believe that there is a divine retribution coming, and this is what I'm trying to do is make people aware that do not put your faith and trust in man in whom there is no salvation. Do not look to your religious institutions for any spirituality. They don't have any. I don't care what it is, they don't have it. The very word church, the word church is an English word from the King's English. It goes back to a word in Scottish, kirk, K-I-R-K, -K, is church in English. Kirk in Scotland goes back to a Roman goddess, Circe. Circe goes back to a Greek goddess in Greece called Circe. Circe gave birth to Roman Circe. Roman Circe gave birth to Scottish Kirk, and Scottish Kirk gave birth to the English word church. So consequently, when you have a church, just remember, it goes back to Mother Circe in Greece. <clears throat> Circe, if you go back to the library and get some books on Greek mythology, it will tell you that her name gives birth to what we call the church today. And Mother Circe was able to hypnotize people and to bring them into her home, hypnotize them, and so that they would lose their mind and become animals, and then she would feed off of them, eat them, and feed off of them. That's Greek mythology, Mother Circe. 
<clears throat> so consequently, Mother Church has done just that. She has hypnotized people, brought people into her house, into her house, and um, consequently lives off of them. One of the most important uh, financial institutions in the world is the Roman Catholic Church and all the other churches like the Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists and Christadelphians and Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to catch up with. Consequently, all you need to do is just go see Godfather 3 and it will tell you, a tr that's a true story, Godfather 3, about the killing of the Pope when the propaganda due, the P2 Lodge of Freemasonry, uh, got, had to get rid of the Pope because he was a good man. That particular Pope was a good man and he wanted to try and straighten out the church and they figured they'd better straighten him out. So he was dead. <clears throat> he died on the, 30th, the 33rd day of his pontificate. He died on the 33rd day. I think that's interesting. <clears throat> and that's in the movie Godfather 3. Um, consequently, I don't know if you know this or not, but the, uh, at the end of the Second World War, to show you another facet of the church's work, um, during the Second World War in 1945, actually 45, early 45, when the German and the Nazis began to see that, the, uh, that they were losing the war, and it became evident that the Nazis were going to lose. The, <clears throat> the powers that be in this world wanted to get the top Nazis out of, out of Germany before the Russians or the other Allied forces came through and would kill them. And so consequently, the Vatican, along with uh, the CIA, the American CIA and the Vatican, made a deal uh, where the Vatican would provide for all the top Nazis there are false passports, uh, false ID, and uh, slip them out of Europe and send them to Central America, South America, Uruguay, and Paraguay, which incidentally those two countries were founded by Jesuits. <clears throat> Probably uh, some of the most powerful criminal syndicate in the world is the Jesuits. But um, So we have the Nazis here in America. You know, we went to the moon, supposedly, with good old American ingenuity, like Dr. Werner von Braun and all those other Nazi fascist murderers that came here who are making money off of this people. And we, I, I just amazed when I watch the space shuttle taking off and you see all the Americans standing out there in Florida watching the space shuttle take off and everyone's applauding. I think, what are you applauding for? You ain't going anywhere. The hell are you applauding for? If they're going somewhere, you're not going, that's for sure. You can pay for it, but you ain't going. You ever thought about how much pollution? I mean, poisonous, toxic pollution that pours out of the, out of the back end of a Saturn booster. How much poison is poured out of that into our atmosphere every time they shoot one of those things? <clears throat> Nobody, most people don't think about that. <clears throat> Consequently, I believe that it's a time that the idea, this time has come to look at the real foundations of our system of thinking in this world because if you're going to call out to God, you better get it straight because there are too many times in the scriptures and I again have to reemphasize my appreciation for uh, the divine principles in the scriptures. I believe that there is a profound story, especially in the New Testament. I think that the New Testament is a redemption story. But most people have no idea in the world what redemption means. Well, as a classic example, how many Christians understand what Christ means? I mean, you can't talk, you know, I hear Christians talking all the time about Antichrist and they haven't got the faintest idea what Christ means. How many people know what the word Christ means and where it comes from? <clears throat> I mean, how many Jews talk about the Holocaust and haven't got the faintest idea in the world what a Holocaust is? Oh, a Holocaust is a terrible tragedy. Oh, it's a big fire or so, oh, something like that. It's terrible something. No, no, no. That's not what a Holocaust is. A Holocaust, according to the actual research documents, means a sacrificial, ritualistic burnt offering. When Abel and Cain and Abel in the Bible offered up a sacrifice to God, the, the word in the Hebrew Bible is they offered up their holocaust to God. 
So a holocaust is a ritualistic, sacrificial, burnt offering. Get it right. Why did the Jewish leaders in this country and around the world use the term holocaust? Very interesting. I think that they are not telling us the whole story. Consequently, as I said, how many Christians use the word antichrist and don't even know what the word Christ means? Christ comes from Christos. <clears throat> Christos in Greek means oil. That's why you have Pillsbury cooking oil called Crisco. Crisco is Christo. Christo is Christ. So Jesus Christ is Jesus the oil. I mean, that's what it means. Jesus oil. Okay? <clears throat> You say, well, Jesus, well, why? Well, because Jesus was the anointed. When you always uh, uh, become anointed with oil. The kings in Israel were always anointed with holy oil, so they became anointed. You know what the word anointed means in Hebrew? I don't want to get into that right now. <coughs> Basically, anointing comes from the word sex. You'd be surprised how much sex is entwined in religion. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There's a huge amount of words and terms and symbols. And when we begin to see how these stories have been put together and misrepresented, again, I believe that the Bible has been misrepresented. I think that if you go back into the ancient world and begin to see where the Bible comes from, who wrote it, and you begin to read the encoded story, it becomes fascinating stuff. And when you understand that, and I do a whole lecture, sometimes it takes four to five hours for me to do it, um, on astrotheology. Astrotheology is the basis for all religion on the face of the earth. It's called astrotheology. Happily, most people don't know that, so nobody's offended. But most uh, people do not realize that astrotheology forms the foundation for virtually all religions on the face of the earth. It has to do with the worship of the heavens. <coughs> and if you go back into the most ancient times, and this is a subject I've always loved, is ancient theologies. Uh, if you go back into the most... And consequently, when the sun would come up in the morning, that was the one thing that saved the human race, is the coming of the sun, God's sun, the light of the world. Of course the sun lights the world. And the sun doesn't belong to China or Africa or anybody else, it belongs to God. So it was God's sun, our risen Savior. And of course the sun is your Savior, because if it don't come up, we're dead. But once you understand the concepts and ideas, then you begin to question, why did Judas go out and kiss Jesus? The scripture, you know how, in the scripture it talks about Judas went out and kissed Jesus? First of all, the, many Christians think G, Judas went out and kissed Jesus to identify him. Logic alone would tell you that's not true. You just think about it. I mean, in a little Mickey Mouse, little Mickey Mouse town, uh, and, and, and where Jesus would have been living in a little small, it's not Chicago, it's a little small town and even the Romans back in Rome knew who Jesus was so everybody knows who he is, everybody knows what he's doing and consequently when the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders decided they'd had enough of him and wanted to arrest him 
You think they're going to have to send out somebody to find him and point him out? No, everybody in town knows who he is. Well, then why did Judas go out and kiss him? And most people think Judas went out and kissed Jesus to identify. It doesn't say that. It says he went out to kiss Jesus to betray him, not identify. What do you mean betray? <clears throat> That's interesting. Because even the mafia today, when they're going to kill you, they give you the kiss of death. They've kissed you off. Why? Because in the old ancient world, when a scorpion bites you, the scorpions in the Middle East have two stingers, one on top of the other. And when they bite you, they leave a cut in your skin that looks just like a human lips. Looks just like lips. And consequently, the ancient people said that you just got the kiss of death. He just kissed you off, okay? And consequently, that's what Judas was doing, giving him the kiss of death. Why? It has to do with astrotheology. Very interesting stuff. Now, I could talk all night on this stuff because I love it, but I wanted to show you a few because I believe that uh, seeing things uh, are a lot more impressive than just hearing me talk. If you remember Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Indiana Jones and the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, first of all, when Indiana Jones is going out to look for the Lost Ark, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant, where's the first place he goes to? He goes to Tibet. Now, why would you go to Tibet if you're looking for the Hebrew Lost Ark of the Covenant? Well, it's because Tibet has something very, very important connected to that symbol of the Ark of the Covenant. You better go back and look at the Buddhists and the Tibetans to understand the Ark of the Covenant. Period. Second, where does he go? Once he goes to Tibet, who does he find up in Tibet looking for the Lost Ark if it isn't a Nazi? And consequently, where did, where did they go from there? He goes directly to the Holy Land to look for the lost Ark of the Covenant. No, he goes to Egypt. Why Egypt? It's because Steven Spielberg has many things, but stupid ain't one of them. He goes to Egypt because the whole idea of the, of the lost Ark is Egyptian, not Hebrew. A thousand years before Hebrews were ever in the area called Egypt, they had, the Egyptians had something called the Ark of the Contract. The Ark of the Contract, which I will show you, the Ark of the Contract was a box with two angels, wings, uh, with wings over it, and it was an Egyptian symbol, and it symbolized a contract that the pharaohs had made with the gods who came down here from Sirius, from the, from the ancient star system of Sirius. They were called, and Sirius is called the Dog Star. And consequently, you take dog, D-O-G, and turn it around for us, it becomes God. G-O-D is dog spelled backwards. It goes back to Sirius, the dog star. It goes back to Anubis in, in the Egyptian. So that the, the Ark of the Contract became known as the Ark of the Covenant. No, it's the Ark of the Contract, and it was a thousand years before Hebrews ever had it. Consequently, when you understand our symbolism in theology and religion, uh, you come to find out that we have been sold a bill of goods on so much. <clears throat> and why do, you have, uh, why do you have these institutions that, that the religion, philosophy, politics, all of these systems are institutions which are being financed, organized, and directed by the people who mean to put you into bonds and chains. God has created all of the animals to be free. He created everything. God has, who, who has created all things. Freedom is the one thing that you see everywhere, except for man. And consequently, the real freedom in man is up here. Consequently, the old Hiram Mann, one of the first governors of the state of California, Hiram Mann said, Set your friend. That's an old adage, but it's true. The more you educate 
makes this work, the more you understand where things come from, the more obvious things become, and you begin to see lies everywhere. And now you're in tune with God, and now you can begin to see where things have come from and where they're going. Uh, let me uh, show you a few slides, because i got tons of them, and you don't have to put that in right now. No, I just... Teachers of religion must have the stature to give up the archaic doctrine of a personal God, to give up the source of fear which has placed vast power in the hands of the clergy and priests. Such a doctrine is not only unworthy but fatal, and has done incalculable harm to human spiritual progress. Hello, welcome to Awake in the Age of Revealing. This is Doug Michael. It is October 28, 2013. At the time of this recording, the above quote was by Albert Einstein. And the name of this segment is The Astrotheological Foundations of Christianity. And ladies and gentlemen, astrotheology is defined thusly. It's theology founded on observation or knowledge of the celestial bodies. So it's basically a religion of the study of the heavens. Now Christianity is founded on this. And we're going to get into that a little bit today. Um, now I was raised in the Catholic tradition. I was indoctrinated into that as a child. And I guess I reached about 28 years and became very curious about what the foundations of this religion were that was imposed upon me as a child. I never had any say, and I also never identified with it. Even as a child, it just, something didn't sit right. So as I got older, I was um, driven to study the foundations of this religion. And did a long study of comparative religions, but I focused mostly on Christianity because, again, that was the religion that I was indoctrinated within, the Catholic religion. So we'll get right to it. Undoubtedly, the most powerfully controlling force throughout known history that has created more wars, spilled more blood, caused more division and suffering, spread more intolerance and hypocrisy, and has so effectively manipulated and controlled human consciousness more than any other faction of control has been religion. Through fear, guilt, torture, intolerance, and enforced conformity, billions upon billions of people have been and continue to be controlled to this very day by superstitious and dogmatic religious doctrines, which are thousands of years old, and which more often than not have far more basis in mythology than fact. Not least of all the Christian religion, which has spilled more blood upon this planet than any other movement humanity has ever known. In fact, through Earth's long and bloody history, uh, more blood, religion has spilled more blood than all of the wars of the 20th century combined. Throughout history, people have killed in the name of some god or gods and have slaughtered mercilessly in the name of Christ, Muhammad, and a whole host of other saviors, prophets, or religious heroes. Now, as researcher Michael Tassarian has so rightly stated, he said, The servants of truth know from experience how few friends are won when and if they should endeavor to expose the dirty little secrets of religion's upper echelon. And he's very right. I mean, as a truth seeker and a truth speaker, when you get into discussing one of the prime controlling elements in this world being religion, um, yeah, you don't win many friends, I'll tell you. People cling rigidly onto their indoctrinated and programmed beliefs. One of the hardest um, mindsets for people to shake seems to be the religious doctrines that they grew up with. Now, most people seem to defend their dogmatic programming and their rigid beliefs when they are challenged, and I, I have no problem with that. It's their right, as it is their right to believe whatever they want to. It seems as though whenever existing ideologies are challenged, people are naturally resistant. And religion has done such a splendid job at separating and dividing people, removing true esoteric knowledge, because you know it's of the devil, and anchoring consciousness within ignorance. Indeed, ignorance that people have been willing to kill and die for and still are. To this day, war rages across the planet as man slaughters his fellow man in the name of religion. Catholics and Protestants have killed one another in Northern Ireland. Jews and Arabs massacre each other in the Middle East. Christians war against Muslims, and the list goes on and on. 
All of the major religious movements that have cursed the planet and have caused unimaginable suffering have been by design. If you want to divide and conquer and maintain control over the minds of the masses, you must implant fear in the minds of the people, and religion has done so remarkably well. Fear of God, fear of death, fear of hell, and until relatively recent times, fear of the church. It seems as though many of the world's modern major religions have their roots directly in solar worship or astrotheology, which goes back to Egyptian, Sumerian, Phoenician, and Babylonian times, and some archaeological evidence would suggest that it most likely goes further back than that, much further, deep into the uh, ancient past. Astrology, which appears to be the basis of many religions, especially the Judeo-Christian beliefs, which are merely offshoots from the earlier Semitic religions, has been labeled as paganism or as being of the devil or whatever, while the leaders at the top of the consortium's hierarchy know and willfully keep the esoteric secrets from the masses and have done so for a long, long time. What if the people knew what they really were? and what their purpose was here in this lifetime, then there could be no more control, no more church power over the minds of the flock, or perhaps herd would be a better fitting word. Generation after generation is programmed to search for God out there somewhere. You know, we're taught that God is omnipresent yet separate from us, which defies all logic and reason, and that he, of course it's always personified as a man rather than an androgynous spirit, is an all-knowing, all-wise, all-loving, angry, judgmental, and scorn-filled, punishing being that will send his beloved children to the fiery flames of eternal hell to burn in everlasting damnation amongst the other sinners forever and ever. Unless we accept the dogma of the priests and bishops, the popes and reverends, the cardinals and rabbis, ministers and pastors, and the most hypocritical bullshit artists of them all, the modern-day evangelists, who speak the so-called Word of God, while building greed-driven empires upon billions of tax-free dollars and often find their ministry surrounded by scandal, or are they themselves caught in precarious situations? The sad fact that people are still falling for these scams and giving their minds away after all of these thousands of years is almost amusing, quite curious, and truly stunning to say the least. Spiritually speaking, it appears as if humankind has evolved very little. <clears throat> now, whenever there are significant archaeological finds or discoveries that challenge official existing ideologies such as the Dead Sea Scrolls or practically anything that challenges the official church doctrines, the religious institutions and governmental agencies attached to them are always there to suppress the information. Overwhelmingly, it is the Christian hierarchy that works so hard to suppress new knowledge or rather ancient knowledge coming to light as they probably have the most to lose by people freeing themselves from nonsense and thinking for themselves. Mind you, this is the same movement that slaughtered millions in the Inquisitions simply for thinking differently, plunged the world into the Dark Ages and imported its reign of terror to the Americas, slaying tens of millions of Native American Indians in the most vile and despicable acts of inhumanity, simply for not being willing to convert to the will of the people that came to enslave them in the name of their God. The Christian faith was built on blood and promulgated by the sword. The hypocrisy and death that this faith was built upon is astonishing, and what's even more staggering to me is the fact that people still buy into all of this claptrap, taking the mass of esoteric symbolism literally, as if the literal interpretation of it really means something. Hell, if the evangelists had their way, we'd still be stoning people to death for the crime of thinking differently. And I want to make it clear here that it's not my intention to simply attack people's beliefs or to mindlessly bash their particular faith. I simply wish to bring to light the truth concerning our oppressors and how they have used religions to manipulate the masses into conformity through fear, intolerance, and all too often the deliberate twisting of, or omitting from, or complete destruction of religious texts and documents. Religions have made some beneficial contributions to humanity, and many people do express a love and a benevolence through their particular re religious beliefs. On the other hand, others can justify the most horrendous acts 
of inhumanity and intolerance through theirs. Now, over the centuries, the religious institutions have twisted the true meanings of teachers such as Christ, if in fact these, quote, saviors even existed at all, and have used these perversions and distortions to justify the most appalling acts and to suppress human potential. I would never dare dream to tell another what they should believe, nor how they should think. However, I would suggest to others to question official beliefs, doctrines, and opinions and to openly challenge what we've been conditioned to accept as real. Because there lies a tremendous freedom and a far greater understanding in doing so. Apparently, there appear fundamental key similarities within many of the major religious doctrines, which makes going to war over differing religious beliefs just completely ignorant. Just as preaching, love your brother, while mercilessly slaughtering countless millions such as with the Native American conquest, the Crusades, the Inquisition, <clears throat> Salem witch trials, etc. When humanity can find a way to infuse all of the fundamental universal truths without any kind of overseeing hierarchy and do away with the intolerance, the condemnation, and the self-righteousness, we will be so much freer from that which enslaves the hearts and minds, indeed, the very spirits of so many. <clears throat> Now, most fundamentalists and apologists today adopt an attitude of, don't bother me with the factual truth. Okay, their opinions have been cast and decided for them, mostly by upbringing, tradition, cultural conditioning, and subsequent religious indoctrination, and their unbreakable stance within ignorance is usually adhered to firmly. These people take the texts of their religious doctrines at face value as literal word-for-word -word truths, Failing to see any discrepancies, you know, such as the 150,000 or so translation errors and other miscalculations that even Christian scholars have estimated appear within the New Testament of the King James Version of the Bible. 150,000. This is perhaps the most widespread version of the Bible in the world, and proselytizers encourage followers to take this version literally with all of its errors and symbolism as the word of God or face the threat of eternal damnation and hellfire. Rarely ever do religious devotees question that which has been taught to them as being the holy undeniable word of whichever external deity they are paying homage to, the true origins of their beliefs or factual information or documentation that questions the authenticity of the religious texts. Modern-day fundamentalists are perhaps the most closed-minded folks whose minds remain shut to even the strongest argument, always seem to quote passages from their holy books, and rarely, if ever, do they even seem to understand the foundation or true meanings of these texts, such as astrology, astrotheology, mythology, allegory, parables, etc. Rarely, if ever, are their holy texts looked at with an academic eye and with an open mind for historical facts. Religious illiteracy runs rampant in the world today while religious devotees blindly accept the hypnotizing half-truths and oftentimes blatant lies from the frequently corrupted religious leaders. <clears throat> now there was a book floating around for a while called Handbook for the New Paradigm, which I recommend anyone into this type of information, any kind of truth seeker, people interested in solutions, get their hands on this book. You could still get it. But it contains a quote which I feel sums it up perfectly. And the quote is, The religious doctrine of ours is the only way, and all others are wrong, creates literal cells within a dungeon of ignorance with all major religious sects present and accounted for. Now, control cannot be maintained over a population without creating division, and to this day, much of the planetary populace remains divided due to the mental, emotional, and spiritual shackles that religions have so firmly put into place. Esoteric knowledge is neither good nor evil, it simply is, <clears throat> and can be used for positive or ill intent. Very quick, esoteric, the word esoteric means secret. And you have two types of knowledge, particularly when you're dealing with religion. You have the exoteric, which is the outer, 
you know, taking the text literally, interpreting them in a literal fashion, and then you have the esoteric, which is the hidden knowledge. And this knowledge, this occulted knowledge can be used for positive or negative intent. You know, when you're witnessing a healing mass or say hands-on healing like Reiki or other energy work that is not completely fraudulent, what you're seeing is the manipulation of the life force energy coupled with the awesome power of the collective human mind and the manifestation of focused belief. It is the power of the creative force that lies within each and every living thing. You may give it whatever name you wish. Holy Ghost, the Great Spirit, Kundalini, Orgon Energy, Prana, Tao, whatever. Martial arts masters call this all-encompassing multidimensional energy, Qi or Chi, the life force energy. This same energy that can be harnessed for healing or for making the physical body perform in extraordinary ways or for utilizing second sight or visions for accomplishing miraculous things, the very substance that is a part of all that exists, is also, also the same energy that is used in satanic rituals for quite contrasting reasons. It's not the energy, it's the intention that makes the outcome positive or negative. The energy itself and the knowledge itself is neutral. Which makes sense then why the church has always condemned the study of the occult or the study of astrology as being evil or negative. Because they don't want you finding out these things. They don't want you finding out that the very foundation of their uh, system is built upon these very things. Now, the rulemaking masters at the top of the consortium's hierarchy know full well how to manipulate this life force energy, and sadly, the intention has not been for the greater good of all. The objective has been for control, imprisonment of the mind, suppression of human potential, and the delinking of humanity from its true origins, as the great church leaders condemn the very knowledge they use to control as being evil or unholy. This life force energy is sexual in nature, as sex energy is the creative force of the universe. It makes sense, then, that the churches condemn the sex act as wicked, dirty, or sinful, cutting off the bloodline from the mass consciousness, using guilt to suppress the universal life energy, and in all too many instances living up to their highly moral, right, hypocritical standards, such as with the growing number of child molestation incidences surfacing within the Roman Catholic institutions, threatening these institutions with billions of dollars in lawsuits. In fact... Roman Catholic institutions have paid out in upwards of $2.5 billion in settlements of church officials charged with sexual molestation of underage boys. Moreover, there does not appear to be any ending in sight to cases that are still pending. $2.5 billion, no ending in sight to cases that are still pending. How many children have had their lives destroyed? <clears throat> Now, power and control are the desired outcomes of these manipulators. Most of the people promulgating religions have no idea that this is so, but the consortium's rulers at the top surely do. The world's religions have been fashioned from ancient beliefs and understandings of the esoteric, of mythology and legends that came before them, and the worship of the heavens, meaning astrology or astrotheology, figured prominently in ancient religions and still does in our more modern religious faith. The very knowledge that religious institutions have worked so hard at removing from the general population for centuries by burning manuscripts and texts, violent displays of intolerance, uh, suppression of any artifacts or documents that challenge their authenticity, <clears throat> and the destroying of whole cultures and civilizations such as the Aztecs and the Mayas of Central and South America, uh, the native North American Indians, and so many others, is the very knowledge that is understood and used to control. Many of the world's religions are based on beliefs, myths, etc., that have simply been borrowed from one culture to the next and can be traced back to antiquity. Now... <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about the solar connections to the Christian religion. And I'll begin that with a quote by the great statesman Thomas Paine. Now he said, and he was spot on, this, I could just say this quote and we'll be done. Because this is, this is it. He was absolutely correct. And we're going to, it's going to lay the foundation for what we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. <clears throat> 
is Thomas Paine, the great statesman. He said, The Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the Son, in which they put a man whom they call Christ in the place of the Son, and pay him the same adoration which was originally paid to the Son. Now, Judaism and Christianity, two of the three great monotheistic religions, are based upon the ancient knowledge and mythology that sprang from solar worship and astrotheology. The ancients understood that the sun was the central life-giving force of the solar system. What has often been passed off as quasi-Stone Age nonsense or paganism are literally ancient understandings upon which many of today's institutional religions are based. God's Son, S-U-N, was understood as the literal giver of life in ancient cultures, the bringer of light to the world. The religious leaders understood that the Son was far more than the giver of light and heat to the planet. These secret society initiates that use religions to manipulate and enslave understood that the Son was a producer of massive electromagnetic energy that directly affects the Earth and its inhabitants. The ancients understood that the sun was expending its energy to give life to the earth. Thus, the sun was giving its life to save man. Now, one common misconception has been that the ancients, such as the Egyptians, worshipped the sun as God. This is not correct. The civilizations of antiquity viewed the sun as a representation of God, God's son. And the sun was personified as saviors and deities throughout history. It was through the sun that the ancients believed they could connect with God. The sun, S-U-N, of God became the sun, S-O-N, of God somewhere along the way. Now, many researchers, scholars, archaeologists, and theologians point out the numerous hidden similarities within modern religions to that of sun worship and astrotheology, far too many to discount as the similarities occur again and again and are very striking. There also appears to exist a similitude between Jesus Christ and a whole host of other messianic figures that came before him <clears throat> with exactly the same, if not stunningly similar, attributes. Many extremely learned people from various differing fields, such as authors, scholars, linguists, theologians, uh, etc., also point out, okay, ready? Also point out that there really is not any documented historical, archaeological, or other credible evidence outside of the biblical texts, which are hardly credible, to support whether Christ even existed or not. This despite the fact that many historical writers were alive at the time of Jesus in the area of the world where the story was said to have taken place. It was a very, very well-documented uh, period in history. But no one seems to mention Jesus except Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And it's been shown that these texts have been manipulated and bastardized and distorted over the centuries. And we'll get to that too a little bit. <clears throat> in fact, <laughs> there's been raging debate about this for millennia. Many have discounted the entire Jesus story as myth, and of course I've become increasingly open to this possibility, and certainly the evidence would suggest that this is the case. And in fact, Pope Leo X once stated, How well we know what a profitable superstition this fable of Christ has been for us. It's one of the popes that said this. Pope Leo X. Many of the world's varying Religions appear to have been based upon solar stellar worship, and images of Savior God men abound throughout history. Well, let us examine the often identical characteristics attributed to Christ as compared to several other messianic figures that came centuries, even millennia, before him. In fact, evidence suggests that Christ, as well as others that came before him, such as Buddha in certain traditions, may be nothing more than compilations or amalgamations of mythological figures that came before them, all rolled into one and presented as an actual person. What interests me the most is the question of why would the church force people to accept ancient mythologies as literal historical fact, facing the threat of horrific torture and death? And the answer, of course, is control, control of the mind, thereby control of humanity as a whole.
Now, little known to Christian religious devotees is that there have been numerous crucified Savior gods documented through history who came to the world before Christ. They predate Christianity, sometimes by thousands and thousands of years. They came to do the same things Christ did, to wash away the sins of mankind. Many of them have very similar characteristics, such as being born of a virgin, being crucified to take away the sins of man, having 12 disciples, being baptized at age 30, and some such as Krishna, the Hindu god spoken of in the Vedas, are virtually identical. Now, many of these savior guards were said to have been born on the 25th of December. Well, we'll see the significance of this date as we move along here. Now, this poses a problem to the authenticity how are we to know which holy texts are the true ones when they all claim that theirs is the only truth? How are the followers to know which Savior is the one and only when they are all proclaimed to be so? Can they expect that some God will damn them to eternal hell if they choose the incorrect Savior while differing religions have claimed that their Savior was and is the one and only true Redeemer of mankind which came to earth centuries before Christ? Has the idea of a savior sent to rescue mankind simply been recycled over and over again through history? Well, apparently so. Regarding the origins of Christianity in particular and its mythological foundations, spending, you know, spending any length of time on the subject, one could logically conclude that one, we have not been given the whole story. Two, the facts have been withheld. Three, we've been lied to. Let us be reminded that in ancient times the church was the supreme authority, the bridge or mediator between God and man. Disagreeing with ideologies foisted upon mankind by the church was often punishable by cruel torture and death, conformity through fear. This fear continues to this day, except that we no longer drag people into the streets to be stoned, although in many areas of the world... Uh, particularly where Sharia law is practiced in these strict Muslim countries, people are still tortured and put to death, charged with whatever heresy, secularism, whatever ridiculous crimes against their religions. The threat of punishment by some god through eternal damnation is enough, it appears, to keep people blindly locked within a state of numb subservience, at least in the Western world. Again, in other areas of the world, they do still torture, they do still execute and engage in all kinds of horrific, inhumane punishments for relatively minor crimes, crimes against the faith. It's um, <clears throat> conformity through fear, as we said. Now, just a quick comparison of a few, just a few of the world's crucified saviors. What we're going to do here, um, this list has been done before by many fantastic authors, but you know, I want to repeat it here because I think it's crucial information to contemplate. The time frames that are listed corresponding with the crucifixions are estimations. Um, details of a few of the more obscure Savior gods are often a bit vague, but the fact of the matter remains. The Christian story has been told before, several times before Christ's alleged journey. Okay, so we have Thulis of Egypt, crucified 1700 BC, was said to have been buried and risen again, ascended into heaven and became the judge of the dead was sent from heaven to benefit mankind. Krishna of India, crucified 1200 BC, was born of a virgin, was born on December 25th. Angels, wise men, and shepherds attended his birth, and he was given gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Where have we heard that before? His father was a carpenter. He was of royal descent. He was persecuted by a tyrant who ordered the mass slaughter of thousands of infants. He raised the dead, performed miracles, and healing of the blind, deaf, and lepers. I mean, the story is almost identical. He spoke and taught in parables. He was crucified between two thieves. In some traditions, Krishna rode, rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. He was called the shepherd and lord of lords. His disciples gave him the name Jesus, J-E-Z-E-U-S, which means pure essence. He is the second in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He was considered the Alpha and the Omega, and he is to return to do battle with the, quote, Prince of Evil. Christ of Chaldea, crucified 1200 B.C., was known as the Redeemer. 
was referred to as the Son of God, was considered the Savior of the human race, and was offered up for the atoning of man's sins. Addis of Phrygia, crucified 1170 B.C., was represented as an offering for the atonement of man's sins, was put to death by crucifixion, was buried and risen again, was born on December 25th, and was an immaculate conception. Thammuz of Syria, crucified 1160 B.C., was risen again from the dead, was an offering of atonement for man's sins, was crucified for the salvation of mankind. Jesus of the Celtic Druids, crucified 834 B.C., was represented as being crucified with a lamb on one side and an elephant on the other, was the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. Indra of Tibet, crucified 725 B.C., was said to have his side pierced while hanging on a cross, was born of a virgin. He could walk on water, he could prophesy, see into the future, and ascended into heaven after his crucifixion. Bali of Orissa, crucified 600 B.C., was recognized as the second in the Trinity, was the Redeemer and atonement for man's sins. Yao of Nepal, crucified 622 B.C. Many theologians speculate that Yao, I-A-O, often spelt Yao, J-A-O, is the root of the name of the Jewish god Jehovah. The Hindu Sakya, crucified 600 B.C., was born of, vir of a virgin, was crucified to atone for the sins of mankind, descended into hell for three days, was resurrected and ascended into heaven, was referred to as the Savior of the world. His mother was referred to as the Holy Virgin Queen of Heaven. He was tempted by the devil, was proclaimed to have healed the blind, deaf, and lame, and the sick, taught a great moral code including thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not lie, and thou shalt not intoxicate thyself. Now this is 600 B.C. Alcestos of Euripides, crucified 600 B.C., was crucified as an atonement for mankind's sins. The Trinity was proposed as a part of her religion, was the first if not only example of a goddess crucified for the atonement of man's sins. Mithra of Persia, crucified 600 B.C., was crucified to take away the sins of the world was born on December 25th, was born of a virgin, had 12 disciples, performed miracles, was buried in a tomb, and risen in three days, was referred to as, quote, the Good Shepherd, was proclaimed by his followers to be the truth and the light, the Savior and the Messiah, had Sunday as his sacred day, and was resurrected on a day that was later to become a celebration known as Easter. Now, Mithra was the most revered solar god in ancient Rome, during the early stages of Christianity. Worshippers of Mithra often could not differentiate between Mithra and Christ, so striking were the similarities of these two cults slash religions. The Vatican, the holy city of the Roman Catholic Church, is built upon the ruins of the temples of Mithra. The ancient Romans saw Christ as another solar deity, which is exactly what he was. Quetzalcoatl of Mexico crucified 587 B.C., was crucified on a cross as an atonement for the sins of mankind, was buried, descended into hell, and risen on the third day, was born of a virgin, was anointed with oils, was baptized and regenerated by water, fasted for 40 days, and was part of a trinity. Witoba of the Teleganista, crucified 552 B.C., was represented with nail holes in his hands and feet, was crucified as an atonement for the sins of mankind. Prometheus, Prometheus of, Cau of the Caucasus region, crucified 547 B.C., was crucified to atone for the sins of man, was buried and resurrected, suffered because of his love for mankind. Quirinus of Rome, crucified 506 B.C., was born of a virgin, was of royal blood, was resurrected and ascended into heaven, was crucified to atone for the sins of man, and was represented as the Son in the Trinity and identified by a cross. You know, and there are many others whose stories bear remarkable resemblance to the Christian faith, such as Bel, the Phoenician sun god, the Scandinavian sun god Baldur, 
Odin of Scandinavia, Zoroaster of Persia, Bedru of Japan, and the list goes on and on. The idea of a Savior sent to earth to be crucified to atone for the sins of mankind occurs repeatedly throughout history and in many differing cultures and eras. It appears as if the myths of Savior gods have been recycled over and over again. Interestingly, many of these religions seem to have contained many of the same central messages, such as don't kill one another, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery, be kind, etc., Countless millions have gone to war and killed their fellow humans in the name of their deity and in defense of religions founded on the same basic beliefs. It's a grand contradiction, isn't it? Thou shalt not kill, unless it is to convert heathens or to defend the teachings of our Savior God who essentially brought the same messages that their Savior God did. Now, two other gods that appear in ancient history that should be mentioned are Buddha of India and Horus of Egypt, who were said to have lived centuries before Christ. Both of these figures bear striking resemblance to Christ in their lives and in their teachings, which lends credence to the idea that many of the more modern religions were based upon earlier myths and legends. <laughs> now, Horus of Egypt, the legends of Horus contain remarkable similarities to the stories of Jesus. In fact, even the name Christ appears not to have originated with Christianity, but to have come from Egyptian mythology. Horus was referred to as the cursed, K-R-S-T, cursed, which means anointed one, centuries before Christianity. Horus also had the following in common with Jesus. Horus was born of a virgin, Isis, on December 25th. His birth was announced by a great star in the east and was attended by three wise men bearing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Horus was a child teacher in the temples and was baptized at the age of 30. He had 12 disciples. He was crucified, entombed, and risen again. Horus walked on water. He performed miracles. He raised a man from the dead, El Azarus which became Lazarus in the Christian Bible. That's in John 11.43. He was called the Son of Man, the Good Shepherd, and the Lamb of God. He was the Fisher of Men. Horus was transfigured on a mount, and he was identified with a cross. Horus was also referred to as Amen Re. In fact, the ancient Egyptians would end their prayers with the word Amen, I wonder if churchgoers even realize that when they conclude their prayers with the word Amen, that they are actually saying the name of an ancient Egyptian pagan sun god. Buddha. In some traditions, Buddha was born of a virgin named Maya, or Mary. He performed miracles, including the feeding of 500 men from a small basket. He walked on water. He was transfigured on a mount. He was crucified as an atonement for the sins of mankind. Buddha suffered for three days in hell and was resurrected. He was referred to as the Good Shepherd, the Carpenter, the Savior of the world, and the Light of the world. He taught in the temple at the age of twelve, and he was the Light of the world, as we said. Now what's interesting about all of these religious figures is that they appear to be based upon and bear resemblance to solar mythology, in fact, striking resemblance. It seems more feasible that these religious heroes are simply symbolic representations of stellar events rather than actual historical personages. In fact, even the name Holy Bible seems to have stemmed from ancient teachings and is derived from the words Helio Bibilia, which means sun book. Now, what is the significance of the sun, and why was it so important to the ancients? Well, obviously, if the sun ceased to exist, life on earth would also cease, so quite literally, God's son was the savior of the world. The ancients devised measuring tools such as sundials to keep track of the changing seasons and the sun's movement through the heavens. The changing seasons were divided into twelve equal parts, or months, and each part was given a heavenly symbol. The complete 12-month wheel is known as the Maseroth, or Zodiac, and each of the 12 parts are signs. In ancient times, these Zodiac signs were called houses, thus, in my father's house are many mansions. 
But according to researcher Jordan Maxwell, the correct translation is actually, in my father's abode are many dwelling places. Yes, apparently twelve. The twelve disciples or helpers attributed to many of the religious heroes seem to be a reference to the twelve signs of the zodiac. The Son of God going to his death with a crown of thorns is symbolic of the sun's corona, and to this day kings wear crowns with spikes symbolizing the sun's rays, and the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church even carries a scepter depicting the sun. The ancients did not enjoy the luxuries that we in our modern world do today, such as artificial light. Their greatest enemy was the darkness of night, as with each ending day the sun went to its death with a crown of thorns the corona. In ancient times, people reasoned that the sun must belong to the great unseen creator. Symbolically, it became God's sun, the light of the world. With the rising of the sun each day, the great fire of day brought life anew to the earth. In ancient Egypt, prayers were offered up to the Most High at twelve noon, the point where the sun is highest in the sky. Since the sky was considered the temple, God's son was doing his father's work in the temple at twelve, meaning noon. Thus the symbolism of many savior gods, uh, Horus, Buddha, Mithra, etc., being in the temple at the age of twelve. In ancient times, the calendars began the first month in Virgo, hence the son is born of a virgin, Virgo the virgin. When the sun enters into each constellation of the zodiac, it does so at thirty degrees. When it departs, it does so at 33 degrees. This is symbolic of the sun gods beginning their ministry at age 30 and ending it at age 33. The passing of the sun through the equinoxes is represented by a cross. In fact, the sign of the cross can be found throughout the ancient world, predating Christianity by thousands of years, and it was not until 325 AD that the cross was adopted as the official symbol for Christianity. The sun is resurrected at the vernal equinox, Easter. In truth, the ancients celebrated Easter long before Christianity, and one of such cultures were the Canaanites, who existed in the area of the world that today we call Israel. Incidentally, the word Israel appears to be a compound of three words. One, I-S, Is, or Is, which comes from the Egyptian Isis, the virgin mother of the sun god Horus. And then we have Re or Ra, another name for Horus, and then El, is Re El, El, which was an ancient deity worshipped by the Canaanites, uh, symbolized by the planet Saturn. So putting all three together, we get the word is Re El. The Canaanites celebrated the fertility rites of spring each year, symbolizing a sacred marriage of Father God and Mother Earth in what was known as the Marriage Feast of Cana. In the ancient Egyptian culture, one of the yearly celebrations was known as the Festival of the Wet Moon, or the Arga Noah, to celebrate the coming monsoon. All right? Arga Noah, right? Noah's Ark, the rains. And they, this, uh, the coming monsoon, the Arga Noah, was known as the Waters of Chaos. Now, the coming of the Waters of Chaos was a great and terrible time for the ancients who lived along the Nile Delta. The monsoon rains would flood the Nile, destroying land and villages situated there, but would also bring life anew to the region as new crops would grow after the settling of the monsoon rains. And at the time of the Arganoa, the moon was in the lower quarter. This is where the ritual of baptism originated, as the ancient Egyptians would celebrate new life coming from the waters each season. Egypt was said to be submerged and born again as new life emerged from the water. Now the sun has been revered throughout history, and solar celebrations have been held since ancient times. Particularly, the winter and spring solstices have always been a time of great recognition throughout many cultures. In the Western world, we know these two times of year as Christmas and Easter has nothing to do with the birth of some savior or the rising of some crucified deity. It has to do with the um, vernal equinox and the winter solstice. It is all astrotheology.
with sprinklings of mythology in there, for good measure, you know. Now, what's the significance of December the 25th? In the Christian religion, December the 25th is attributed to the birth of the Christian Savior God, Jesus Christ, of course. What most Christians do not know, however, and what the church will not tell them, is that the 25th of December has been a time of year revered since early antiquity, celebrated by many ancient cultures. The church, over the centuries, merely adopted and infused the flourishing pagan beliefs of the time and incorporated them into their own because the pagan celebrations were so widespread that the church was not able to eliminate them and so absorbed many of the existing pagan beliefs and practices into their own ideologies. Now, despite the mystical attributes of the significant date of December 25th espoused by the church, many cultures that predated Christianity celebrated this time of year for reasons that are not mystical at all. Now, throughout history, in many different cultures, the sun was said to have died on or near December the 22nd, the time of year where the days are at their shortest and the sun is at the lowest point in the northern hemisphere. <clears throat> the sun would basically stay at that point for three days and then begin to start its journey northward again on the 25th. Now, for this reason, the ancients said that the sun had died and was risen again in three days. The sun was born again on December 25th. Solar celebrations revering this date abound throughout the ancient world, and it seems as if symbolic representations were woven into mythologies of God-men and crucified saviors. Interestingly, interestingly, the birth date of Christ was not even officially sanctioned until centuries after his alleged advent. Different churches celebrated the birthday of Christ on different dates or not at all. It wasn't even until 354 A.D., that the church officially adopted the date of December the 25th. This was also the date attributed to the sun god Mithra and many others. And pagan celebrations of this solar deity abounded in Rome throughout those times. Scholars of the time could not place an actual date for the birth of Christ. They simply didn't know. It was never recorded, nor was the date of Christ's baptism, what is traditionally held as the Epiphany on January 6th. This date and time of year was also sacred to the ancients, and followers of the Egyptian sun god Osiris would bathe in the blessed waters. The ancient Greeks who identified Osiris with their sun god Dionysus also held this date and celebration as sacred. The Epiphany is another adopted date from far earlier times and cultures. Now, Mithraism was the most widespread solar cult in the Roman Empire during Christianity's early stages in the fourth and in the third, I'm sorry, in the third and fourth centuries. The solar deity Mithra was known as the Unconquerable Sun, S U N. And December 25th was held as his birth date and was known to the Romans as Natalis Solus Invicti. The midwinter festivals were so widespread that the Roman church merely adopted and infused many of the abounding pagan beliefs and customs into the church, hoping to pull in pagan converts. These celebrations were known as the Saturnalia, starting on the 17th of December and culminating on the 25th as the birthday of the unconquerable sun. During these celebrations, all Roman law was suspended, courts were closed, and public drunkenness, orgies, and general lawlessness prevailed. Gifts were exchanged on the 25th, and all slaves were freed on that one day. Now, these traditions were brought to Western Europe by Roman invasion. The government-sanctioned church were unable to stop these widespread celebrations by the time known they had become known as the, quote, Festival of Fools, that they attempted to merge these traditions by making the birth date of Christ coincide with that of the solar god Mithra. Dates were changed to correspond with pagan customs and practices, and by the 7th century, Pope Gregory I ordered 
Augustine of Canterbury to incorporate all pagan customs and practices into the expanding church. Saturnalia evolved into Christ's Mass, and these yearly solstice celebrations often consisted of public drunkenness, open sex in public, murder, and the open practice of Druidic customs and rituals. In 1652, Christ's Mass was outlawed in England, but overwhelming public demand brought it back, and in 1656, King Charles II made the celebrations officially legal once again. Now, most of the Christmas traditions held so dear in many parts of the world actually originated in Scandinavia amongst the Norse. Every year at the winter solstice, the Norse would set ablaze a huge log, a phallic symbol, in reverence to the god Yule, the god of sex and fertility. During the twelve days in which this huge log was kept burning, each day either animal or human sacrifices were offered to the god Yule and burned to death in the flames. This is where the traditions of the twelve days of Christmas and the burning of the Yule log on Christmas originated. Now Scandinavian immigrants brought the Yule log tradition to America in the 1600s. The Scandinavians would adorn their homes with holly, and ancient pagan rites hold that the formation of holly into a circle, wreath, enhanced its magical powers and ability to ward off evil spirits. Evergreens were cut down and placed into the homes of the Norse people and adorned with decorations. Evergreen trees were considered holy or magical, symbols of sex and fertility, and revered as an honoring of the nature spirits. Now at the midnight hour on the 25th of December, followers of the Hindu sun god Krishna would decorate their houses with garland and exchange gifts. The Greeks also celebrated this time of year as the birth of Hercules, son of Zeus. The Chinese also held celebrations on the 25th, as did so many cultures before Christianity. And what so many don't seem to realize is that many of the Christian traditions attributed to Christ were borrowed from many differing cultures that most followers would consider pagan. So, you know, the church condemns paganism as being evil. Meanwhile, its entire foundations are built upon quote-unquote paganism. And here's a few more solar astrological uh, symbolism here. Now, for centuries, the Roman church ruled under the sign of Pisces, symbolized by two fishes. This is also um, actually from earlier symbolism of Nimrod, the Babylonian king. To this day, the pope of the Roman church still wears a rather silly-looking fish hat called a mitre, which has been attributed to being symbolism of Jesus, but is just another adoption from earlier pagan religions, and again, appears to be astrological imagery. The Egyptian sun god Horus was also associated with a fish. And when the equinox entered into the sign of Pisces, Horus was portrayed with a fish sign over his head. Now, in Luke 22.10, Jesus instructs Peter and John to enter into the house of the man bearing the water pitcher. The water pitcher. The water bearer is symbolic of Aquarius. This signifies the ending of the age of Pisces and the emergence into a new age, the age of Aquarius. Now we find further astrotheological symbolism in uh, Job 38.31, where it states, Have you fitted a curb to the Pleiades, or loosened the bonds of Orion? Now this obviously refers to two separate constellations, that of the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades, and of the Orion constellation. In Job 38.32, can you bring forth the Maseroth in their season, or guide the bear with its train? This is reference to the zodiac and to the constellation of Ursa Minor. The IHS symbol found in many Christian churches and upon many Christian altars is apparently a representation of the Phoenician solar deity Bacchus. And then Bacchus literally means the sun personified. Well, that's what Christ is, the sun personified. The name Samson that appears in the Old Testament actually means solar. Samson was Sam the sun. His strength was in his hair, which is symbolic of the sun's rays. When Delilah cut off his hair, he became weak. The name Solomon is also more solar symbolism. It is the sun in three languages. Sol, Om, On. Sol is Latin. Om, Eastern Indian. And On is Egyptian. 
Um, if anyone's ever seen the classic Portrait of the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci, you could see that it depicts Christ as a solar deity and his 12 disciples as signs of the zodiac. If you notice the placement of the disciples into four groups of three, you know, it's, it's, he's saying something there. Now, da Vinci was a high initiate in the secret society known as the Priory of Sion. Sion means sun. Leonardo knew more than what he was saying, and many ancient artists depicted Christ as a solar deity or a personification of the sun. The celebration of Passover by coincidence is practiced at the vernal equinox. The Passover is actually symbolic of the sun passing from under the horizon to above it. The Star of David originally originally appeared as early as 6000 BC in ancient Indian history as a symbol of the Sun. It eventually became adopted as a symbol of Saturn, personified as the Semitic god El. The fish symbol associated with Christianity is said to represent I-C-H-T-H-Y-S, which is an anagram for Jesus Christ, but also coincidentally happens to be Greek for fish. This is again symbolic of the astrological sign of Pisces and also of the Babylonian king Nimrod. In Hebrews 12.29, For our God is a consuming fire. In ancient Egypt, God's risen sun was Horus. This is where the word horizon comes from, Horus risen. In Malachi 3.20, but for you who fear my name, there will arise the sun of justice with its healing rays. Now in Egyptian mythology, Horus's arch nemesis and twin was Set. Personified as Satan in the Christian religion, Set represented the darkness that only the sun could conquer, hence the term sun set. And real quick too, um... I mentioned in the last podcast, getting into symbolism just a little bit, we see obelisks, just the big pointed uh, monument that appears all over the world. This is actually a phallic symbol, for instance, the Washington Monument. But we see obelisks all over the world. It is a phallic symbol, and it is actually symbolic of the penis of Set. Um, Set was uh, Horace's arch nemesis. He was chopped up as the legend goes, and they they couldn't find his willy. So, <laughs> I'm serious here. The obelisk is actually a phallic symbol, and that's what it symbolizes. And we see the, this symbol appear all over the world. Now, in Psalms 84, 12, For a sun and a shield is the Lord God. S-U-N. And, you know, again, we could examine this till the end of time. There's biblical parallels in the ancient religions. For instance, the story of the Ark did not originate with the Old Testament writings. This tale is another that was borrowed from ancient mythologies. The story of Noah's Ark mirrors that of the Sumerian epic Gilgamesh, and flood stories abound throughout the ancient world, and the story of Noah is but one of some 400 ancient flood accounts. The Babylonians, I'm sorry, the Babylonians as well as the Egyptians had their version also. In, in India, it was the Arga Noah, which became the Egyptian festival of the wet moon, as mentioned earlier. So many of the Bible stories have been told before. The three wise men attending the virgin birth can also be found in other ancient mythologies. The three wise men, or magi, represented the three rising stars in Orion's belt, which signified the coming of the star Sirius, the star that represented Horus Osiris. The story of Moses comes from Mises, the Syrian lawgiver who brought the laws inscribed on stone tablets down from the mountains, which became Hammurabi's code. Mises also possessed a magical rod with which he performed miracles, such as parting the sea and leading his army across. Just as the Indian Krishna, Mises was found floating in a basket in a river. Babylonian legends had there Moses also. He was called Nemo the lawgiver, who brought the tablets down from the mountain of God. And many other cultures had their version too, such as the Cretan Minos and the Akkadian Sargon. Now the virgin birth concept is also not unique to Christianity. Many of the crucified savior gods were said to have been immaculate conceptions, and the virgin mother is symbolic of the zodiacal sign of Virgo, as we've seen. The earliest concept of the virgin birth was that as the father, you know, the unseen creator, impregnating the virgin mother, earth, by drawing up the life-giving fluids, 
rain. Our modern science suggests that if an actual virgin birth or conception were to occur, the offspring would most definitely be female due to the absence of the Y chromosome from the male sperm. Male savior gods being born of virgins is symbolic. The Ark of the Covenant also originated in Egypt. The Egyptians had the Ark of the Law, the Hindus had the Arga, and the Greeks the Kista. The Eucharist ritual, symbolic of the drinking of blood and eating of flesh, also goes back to antiquity. Many ancient cults practiced human and animal sacrifice and would actually engage in cannibalism. In Christianity, the Eucharist ritual became the symbolic consumption of flesh and drinking of the blood of a god. The Egyptians partook in their communion ceremonies by eating cakes made with flour, milk, and honey, which were inscribed with crosses, and this is where hot cross buns originated, just as an aside there. Baptism is yet another very ancient motif. The Egyptians would practice this rite by immersion into water. The lamb has been associated with numerous pagan savior gods. The lamb, of course, represents the astrological sign of Aries. Now, the house of Aries was represented as either a ram or a lamb. When the sun was in Taurus, a bull was sacrificed by the pagan followers, and when the sun was in Aries, the lamb became the sacrificial animal. Christianity ruled under Pisces, hence the fish symbolism, but the lamb of God motif remained. The second coming, or day of judgment idea, appeared throughout the ancient world. In India, Krishna was expected to return. In Tibet, it was Buddha. The Mexican natives expected their Quixacotl, and the Phoenicians expected Bacchus to redeem them. This second coming motif can also be found throughout the world. The second coming represents the entering of the sun into a new processional age. The rod and the staff symbolism are straight from Egypt. The rod was the king's rod of discipline, and the staff was the shepherd's staff. Egyptian pharaohs were said to be ruling for God's son on earth. The pharaoh was considered the king of the kingdom and the great shepherd of his sheep. The rod and staff were Egyptian symbols of Osiris. Now, circumcision did not begin with the Hebrew culture. Many ancient culture, cultures practiced this ritual. The Egyptians practiced the ritual of circumcision as early as 4000 B.C., not as a covenant with some god, but as a ritual in their sexual practices. Now, in the Catholic Bible, we read, Circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and that shall be the mark of the covenant between you and me. Genesis 17.11 And in Genesis 17.14, If a male is uncircumcised, that is, if the flesh of his foreskin has not been cut away, such a one shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now, what began as sexual practices in ancient cultures was literalized in the Old Testament so that no male would find favor with God unless their penis was mutilated. Now, Christianity didn't just spring up overnight, you know. It took centuries to gain a strong foothold, or perhaps stranglehold would be a more fitting word. In fact, many of the tenets considered today by the church and countless followers to be gospel law weren't decided upon until 325 A.D. at what was called the First Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, presided over by the Roman Emperor Constantine. It was at the Council of Nicaea that many key doctrines of the Christian faith were decided, clearly a full three and a quarter centuries after Christ's alleged crucifixion. The Council what transpired there and what then followed would set the stage for the longest, bloodiest reign of intolerance the world has ever known. Now, in her meticulously researched book called The Christ Conspiracy, The Greatest Story Ever Sold, the brilliant scholar and linguist Atreya S. offers the following concerning the Council of Nicaea. She stated, At the Council of Nicaea were not only Christian leaders from Alexandria, Antioch, Athens, Jerusalem, and Rome, but also the leaders of the many other cults, sects, and religions, including those of Apollo, Demeter, Ceres, Dionysus, Bacchus, Iasus, Janus, Jupiter, Zeus, Ones, Dagon, Osiris and Isis, and Sol Invictus, the invincible sun, the object of Constantine's devotion. 
Now, the purpose of the council was to unite all of the above mentioned into one universal religion. Rome was to be the chief authority. Now, Rome claimed authority because it was said to be built upon the Rock of Peter. Well, Rock of Mithra is really more like it. Now, Atreya S. states, quote, In a typical religion-making move, the gods of these other cults were subjugated under the new god and changed into apostles and saints. Now, the Nicene Council melded all of the pagan religions of the time into a new unified Catholic religion. That's what the word means, unified. It wasn't until the council convened that the name or title Jesus Christ was decided upon. You know, Acharya S. goes on to state, quote, As stated, it is maintained that during the Nicene Council, the names Jesus and Christ were put together for the first time in the phrase Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus uniting two of the major factions with Jesus representing the Jesus of the Druids, Joshua slash Jesus of the Israelites, Horus slash Ayusa of the Egyptians, and Ies slash Iesos of the Dionysians, Samarithicans, and Christ representing the Krishna slash Christos of India, the anointed of the Jews, and cursed KRST of Egypt, among others. It is thus alleged that the phrase Jesus Christ, which had never been a name, does not appear in Greek or Latin authors prior to the First Council of Nicaea. So in other words, what Atreus is stating is that there was simply never a historical person by the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I personally don't doubt that there were Gnostic teachers that um, existed in that area of the world at the time. But certainly, if there was such a teacher who was a healer, who held great wisdom and spoke in parables and all these things attributed to Christ, his name certainly was not Jesus Christ. Jesus and Christ is more of a title. These Both names were meshed together, and they're both amalgamations of several different um, mythological gods that came before. Now, Constantine... The Roman Emperor Constantine himself was a pagan sun worshipper. <laughs> Paying homage at the Grand Temple of the Sun in the Vosages Mountains of Gaul. It was there that Constantine claimed to have had his first vision. While fighting a campaign against Maxentius, Constantine claimed to have a second vision, that of a lighted cross in the sky, which he had painted on his soldiers' shields, believing it would guarantee victory over his enemies. It always seems to be a vision that so many creeds are founded upon, doesn't it? Now, as stated earlier, the sign of the cross goes back to ancient times and was a solar symbol that was considered sacred in pagan religions. It was after his triumph that Constantine converted to Christianity but did not become baptized until he was near his death. Now, as the main authority of the new state religion, that's what Catholicism is, or was the greatest political movement ever undertaken, probably. So it was a state religion. Okay, so as the main authority of this new state religion and as a newly converted Christian, Constantine was, of course, an upstanding man of high moral character, right? He had his own son put to death. He drowned his own wife in an overheated bath. Constantine had his two nephews flogged to death and his brother-in-law killed, as well as nearly a dozen other family members. His political rivals were bled to death. In the 4th century, the emperor had over 3,000 Christians tortured and executed simply because their interpretation of the Bible did not agree with his. Nice guy. Now, under Constantine's new creed, in the quest to conquer Europe for Christianity, tens of millions of innocent people would be massacred in brutal and bloody holocausts that acted as the building blocks for the mind prison called Christianity. From the Council of Nicaea sprang the most violent, bloodiest horrors and persecutions. It was at the Council of Nicaea that so many decisions were made that affect masses of people even to this day. Apparently, the Council turned into a bloody melee as arguing bishops decided upon the new doctrines and creeds. The bishops presented at the Council, I'm sorry, the bishops that were present at the Council were told how they should vote beforehand. 
Bishops who disagreed were removed from the council by armed henchmen and excommunicated. Now in this case, excommunication consisted of exile to remote islands. Documents were removed and destroyed. Now among doctrines decided upon at the Council of Nicaea were the doctrine of the Trinity was adopted, the idea of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in one being, a far earlier pagan concept as with Horus, Osiris, Isis from Egypt, Rama, Vishnu, Vishnu and Shiva from India, Nimrod, Tammuz, Semiramis, Babylonian, and etc. The most ancient depiction of a Trinity concept apparently was depicted as a, a man in various stages of life, newborn, mature, and elderly, which depicted various stages of the sun. The newborn represented the dawn, the mature adult represented noon, and the elderly represents dusk as the sun dies, only to be resurrected the next morning. The Roman Sun Day was adopted as the Christian Sabbath. Now Sunday was the day of worship for Mithra. The sign of the cross, previously associated with many solar cults, was adopted as the Christian emblem. The celebration of Easter was adopted. Now the word Easter comes from the myth of the ancient goddess Ishtar. Authority was bestowed upon bishops, concentrating enormous power into the hands of the few. The councils created Jesus was declared the Messiah by vote. Okay? The newly decided church doctrines, what became the New Testament, were coupled with the Hebrew writings, the Old Testament. And this was done probably as a means to make the new doctrines a little more credible or to attempt to add some historicity to them. Now the council fashioned what became known as the Nicene Creed, which established the following. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, and born of the Father before all ages, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial to the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation come down from heaven, and was incarnate, of the Holy Ghost and of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried, and the third day rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, and shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, of whose kingdom there shall be no end. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceed from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is to be adored and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, after the council convened, there was still no official version of the New Testament. A religious police force was assembled and commissioned to destroy all religious texts that were not in agreement with the new official state religion. Now clearly Constantine understood the political advantage to be gained by uniting the flourishing religions under a new consolidated Roman authority with himself as the head. Now following Constantine's example, a contemporary named Athanasius ordered the expulsion of heretics and documents from monasteries. The result was the loss of the largest collection of Gnostic writings in history. Now, as the Catholic Empire began to spread in 389 AD, the Emperor Theodosius ordered the library, library of Alexandria in Egypt to be burned down. The destruction of the Library of Alexandria marked the greatest loss of valuable information in history. It was the largest library in the world, and more than 700,000 manuscripts, scrolls, and documents were lost. To this day, none of the books of the New Testament are declared to be official by any authority or council. Now let that sink in. Now, as the empire grew in power and influence, so-called pagan libraries, sacred temples, and documents were destroyed to instill the new authority and also to remove any shred of evidence of the new state religion's connection to the pagan mythologies that it was based and founded upon. New temples and churches were erected on ancient pagan sacred sites, not least because many of the sacred pagan sites were constructed upon the Earth's energy points. Okay? Um, so these new... 
temples were built on the ancient sites of ancient pagan temples, and any literature, art, monuments, etc., were systematically removed, burned, or otherwise destroyed. The church leaders understood that to gain an ever-increasing power base, they had to control the knowledge. Any documents, manuscripts, codices, etc., that were not approved by the church were destroyed or removed from circulation. What followed the empire's brutal onslaught eventually evolved into the lowest cultural point the planet has ever known, the Dark Ages, effectively setting back human knowledge by thousands of years. Now in the 6th century BC, Pythagoras introduced the theory that the Earth revolved around the Sun. Later, approximately 270 uh, BC, a Greek astronomer named Aristarchus actually proved the theory by developing a, me developing a method of timing half-moon cycles. This became accepted knowledge for a while, that is, until the church destroyed the knowledge. Now both Copernicus and Galileo were persecuted by the church for reintroducing the truth about the earth revolving around the sun, and Galileo was threatened with death and actually spent the last eight years of his life under house arrest for daring to challenge the church's idea that the earth was the center of the universe. The church insisted on replacing sound scientific theory with utter nonsense, and here is a blatant example. In the late 1800s, a church authority by the name of Father Hardonin offered this explanation for the earth's rotation. He said, The rotation of the earth is caused by lost souls trying to escape from the fire in the center of the earth, which is the wall of hell, thus making the whole revolve as the squirrel by climbing turns its cage. Yes, yes, that certainly sounds reasonable. This is just one example of the ridiculous nonsense forced upon mankind by the church, which effectively set back human, spiritual, and scientific progress by thousands of years. In many ways, the ages-old dogmas of the church still keep people in spiritual bondage to this day, as followers blindly accept the superstitious, nonsensical absurdities espoused by the church, whose primary enemies seem to be knowledge, and understanding. Yes, to this day, ladies and gentlemen, religion seems to be one of the most powerfully effective forms of mind control ever devised. Um, its foundations are built on ancient myth. Why can we accept that we have these beautiful myths from, say, ancient Greek or ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, ancient India, but we cannot accept the fact that mythology is still with us. Christianity is just the latest manifestation in ancient, ages-old knowledge, um, I'm sorry, mythology, and ancient understandings of astrology and astrotheology. The entire foundations of Christianity are based upon these ancient understandings of the study of the heavens, astrotheology. Now, next time we'll get into what happened um, after the Council of Nicaea established the new state religion, how this religion spread. And it certainly did not spread by peaceful missionaries walking into um, unconquered territories with Bibles in hand saying, look what we got for you. No, it was through slaughter. It was through absolute subjugation, persecution, slaughter, violence, bloodshed. And we'll leave that for next time. Um, again, this is very, very cursory. There's a lot of information out there that gets into heavy detail about what we've just outlined in today's segment. So I encourage, uh, Atreya S. is one author that comes to mind. Uh, I know David Icke touched upon it in many of his books. Um, Kersey Graves, who authored the uh, 16 Crucified Saviors. Um, Deceptions and Myths of the Bible by Lord, Lloyd Graham. Uh, the Bible Fraud by Tony Bushby. And on and on it goes. Ralph Ellis is another one to get into. Um, there's a lot. There are a lot of really, really good scholars out there that have gone into this in depth. So seek out the information for yourself. It's all mythology. It's all astrotheology. Thank you very much for taking the time to open your mind and search for truth and listening to Awaken the Age of Revealing. This is Doug Michael. I will talk to you soon. Walk in peace.
Now, Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy, they write, the traditional history of Christianity is hopelessly inadequate to the facts. From our research into ancient spirituality, it has become obvious that we must fundamentally revise our understanding of Christian origins in the most shocking of ways. Our conclusion, supported by a considerable body of evidence in our book, The Jesus Mysteries, is that Christianity was not a new religion. It was a continuation of paganism by another name. The gospel story of Jesus is not the biography of a historical messiah. It is a Jewish reworking of ancient pagan myths of the dying and resurrecting God-man Osiris Dionysus, which had been popular for centuries throughout the ancient Mediterranean. There you have it. So let it be known again. In order to have ancient mysteries revealed, in order to make sense of our world, it's going to be something of a painful experience. Revelatory and above all, healthy. But it's the, as all nurses know, when you want to rip a plaster off a wound, the quickest way is the short, sharp, shriek method. But we're going to need that in order to extrapolate some of the incredible mysteries by which we have been dumbed down for years. And to come to sanity is a two-fold path. You can't get to the light without first noticing the darkness. You have to do your house cleaning first. You can't just say to the garbage in your backyard, garbage be gone. You can't just uh, have a room aired by screaming from the window to let the air come in. You have to do some homework. You've got to get into the garden, get onto your knees and weed out that garden before new flowers will grow and the birds and bees will come in to create a new and beautiful uh, garden. But the, what we're talking about here is the intellectual uh, homework that needs to now be done so that we can have sanity back on its throne. Thomas Jefferson said, I have examined all the known superstitions of the world and I do not find in our particular superstition of Christianity one redeeming feature. They are all alike founded on fables and mythology. Millions of innocent men, women and children since the introduction of Christianity have been burned, tortured, fined and imprisoned. What has been the effect of this coercion to make one half of the world fools and the other half hypocrites to support roguery and error all over the earth? The historian Strabo in ancient times wrote, it is impossible to govern a mob of women or the whole mixed multitude by philosophical reason and to exhort them to piety, holiness and faith. We must also employ superstition with its fables and prodigies. From the thunder, the abyss, the trident, the torches, the serpents, the thrissy of the gods are fables, as is all ancient theology. But the legislator introduces these things as bugbears to those who are children in understanding. That's my whole point. Children in understanding. Okay, let's accept it. Let's admit it. We are infantile in our understanding, psychologically, theocratically, mystically, spiritually. Let's accept that. A child can grow. It's not the end of the world. A child can grow up and mature. But in order to mature, we have to put away the childish things. Now, collectively speaking, this is imminent. This absolutely must happen. There are no two ways. If we are to inherit any kind of future, that is worth the living. One of America's greatest scholars in any sense of the word, and particularly in uh, astrotheological studies, was the mighty uh, researcher and writer Alvin, Board, Alvin Boyd Kuhn. And he wrote that the supreme charge against Christianity is that it has caused the obsession of untold millions of minds with a series of fatuous beliefs which have motivated centuries of human actions perpetrating a body of follies, fanaticisms, cruelties, and inhumanities unmatched in all history. And the instructive difference between Christianity and, let's say, Greek philosophy is now seen in startling clarity as the difference between surrender of the mind in Christianity to a series of wild and chimerical fancies in no wise based on any correspondence with truth and reality. While well, Greek philosophy was a system of intellectual propositions based on a complete harmonization with the known realities, the forces and elements of man's constitution and the laws of the cosmos. So Kuhn is saying, look, we're not against the fact that you have um, mythologies, fables and legends. Let's have them. But can they at least be rooted in the real? Can they at least be articulated as some kind of sanity? In a book called Revelations of the Antichrist, we read, Those initiated into the sacred mysteries knew the gospel stories were false, but considered it necessary to keep up the imposition for the purposes of propagandism. 
But while this transition of faith was going on, some of the more conscientious teachers began to tell the people that the Jesus Christ they were worshipping was not a historical personage. This was regarded by the conservative priests as a dangerous disclosure, and so John denounces the innovators as liars and antichrists, knowing that he himself and his fellow priests were the pious liars, and that the antichrists were telling the truth. Error prevailed, and the mythical Christ became the historical Jesus. Now Burton L. Mack, in his book Who Wrote the New Testament, says the writings in the New Testament were not written by eyewitnesses of an overpowering divine presence in the midst of human history. The Christian Bible turns out to be a masterpiece of invention. To be quite frank about it, the Bible is the product of a very energetic and successful myth-making on the part of those early Christians. And Tony Bushby in his Bible Fraud, he says, it is important to remember that the words authorized and original as applied to the Bible do not mean genuine, authentic, or true. Now the Egyptians, unlike us today, did not open their year at uh, December 21st or January 1st, or even where astrologers are wont to think of the beginning of the zodiac, which is Aries. No, their year opened in the sign of Virgo, which in those days, because of processional movement of the heavens, was around July 20th, 25th, is when the Nile started to rise and the flood waters began to rise. That was around about the period uh, when Sirius, the star, was high in the sky, around the July 20th and 25th, uh, the season, and that was the, s the sun would rise into the constellation or sign of Virgo. And a Virgo is, of course, the sign of the Virgin, which has always been depicted for ancient, ancient times as the female, the female goddess or the female queen, the beautiful virgin, Virgo. Well, of course, naturally, if the year for the Egyptians opened in Virgo, then like ours, we have 12 seasons, 12 months to go through until the year closes. And the year will close, logically, in the sign before Virgo. And the sign before uh, Virgo, just pick up a coffee table book on astrology or log, log onto the internet and look up, and you'll see that the sign that comes before Virgo is Leo the Lion. Leo the Lion was then the closing of the year. So that is why you have a Sphinx, because it is the head of the Virgin and the tail of a lion, meaning in one symbol. And this is the way the ancients did things, so beautifully, so figuratively. The idea is that the head of the female looks out to the horizon, her gaze follows the whole earth, which is circular, and comes back to the body of the lion. It is simply a symbol of the zodiac. It's a symbol of the zodiac and sandstone standing 66 feet high, and all it is to tell you is that we were astrologers. We were the Magi. So the first sign of the zodiac, Virgo, a sign of the Virgin. The last sign of the zodiac, Leo. Put them together and you've got the Sphinx. Virgo was the female, the Virgin, holding the sheaf of wheat. Now the sun entered the sign of Virgo around July 25th. Upon entering this female sign, the ancient cosmologist said that the sun, that's the son of God, the heavens, was born again, born of a virgin. That's where that term comes from, the Christian idea of being born of a virgin, one of the meanings of it, there are many. But in the stellar cult, it was the idea that the son of God was now being born in the sign of the virgin or of a virgin. When the Sphinx was constructed, its visage even faced that part of the horizon where the constellations of Leo and Virgo rose at nightfall. So this face, the eyes, were looking to the horizon, but at night, Virgo and Leo would rise right in front of the eyes of the Sphinx. Now because the beginning of this zodiacal belt was in Virgo, the zodiac was called the Girdle of Isis, the Virgin Goddess. She was the prototype of Mary. The son of Isis was Horus. Mary's son was Jesus. Horus was the basis of the Christ myth. His name meant light or sun. And that's where we get the word horizon or the zone of Horus. And we also get hours from his name. And that's right. Horus's zone, that's the zone of the sun. When the sun rises on the horizon, it's the zone of Horus, the sun god. The horizon. The old word for prayers in the Shakespearean era was horizons. And we all know that we turn to the east Cultures still do this. You turn to the east to say your prayers, your horizons. Why do you turn to the east? Because the sun is going to rise there. You worship the sun. It's a solar cult. And Horus, you just have to turn two of the letters around and you get ours, H-O-U-R-S. Because they used to say, to take the time, where is Horus now? 
where is the golden falcon now? Meaning, what hour of the day is it? What Horus of the day is it? We even tell our children to be as good as gold, meaning be as good as the golden one, Horus. You are our youngster. A child is known as a young star. Like Horus was the youngster of Isis and Osiris. So just remember, when you hear that term, born of a virgin, think astrology. But again, we're being told this. You only have to look at the symbolism. Once you've opened your right brain, you're using your whole mind, you've learned some pattern recognition, you'll find that nothing's being concealed from you. Mother Mary with the sun above her head and the crescent moon under her feet. We have it in the corporate logos of today, Columbia Pictures. The Virgin with the sun gleaming behind her back or the, holding the great uh, torch. Literally, the sun in Virgo. What you're seeing in that logo is nothing more than an astrological motif. The original Madonna, born of a virgin. The solar cult get hold of this and they move things around. Uh, Horus suddenly becomes more aligned with the sun, yes, but more aligned with, say, Aries. Jesus holding the Lamb of God. Everyone knows the Lamb or the Ram is the, sun, the sign of Aries. So they move the Son of God away from Virgo and move it to a new place, a new identification. And that can be okay to do in some respects, but it's what the mythographers do every age. They change the symbolism. Once upon a time, the bull was worshipped and the cow goddess. That represents Taurus, the bull. Later on, the ram. Egypt's filled with the ram symbols because that's Aries. As the sun moves, the mythology has changed. So the pyramid and the sphinx and many of the other tombs and temples, structures, are patently astronomical and astrological. And even when you render or see the Sphinx rendered, you'll notice that it also has wings, or it might have claws, or it might have scales. It has the head of a woman, it has the tail of a dragon or a lion. Again, that just represents the four corners, the, the four coming together, the wings and the claws and the body of a lion, the cardinal points of the zodiac. Not only is the Bible the center of Judeo-Christianity, but of course we have the cross, the crucifix, the story of Calvary. Well, Madame Helena Blavatsky says the crucifix was an instrument of torture and utterly common among Romans as it was unknown among Semitic nations. It is certainly not the Christian cross that John had in mind when speaking of the signet of the living God. That's right, it wasn't the cross of Calvary, of torture that John had in mind. We're going to find out what cross he had in mind when he was thinking of symbolizing Christianity. Tony Bushby says of it, the symbol of the cross originated as part of an ancient Egyptian initiatory rite and eventually found its way into Christianity. The church stated that in its history there is no proof of the use of the cross until much later than the 6th century. It is recorded in Christian archives that the general use of the crucifix was ratified at the 6th Ecumenical Council in 680 AD. The council decreed that the figure of a man fastened to a cross now be adopted, and the new church logo was later confirmed by Emperor Hadrian I. About a century later, the first pictures of Jesus Christ standing against a cross slowly start to appear. So we're talking about seven, eight hundred years after the rise of Christianity, uh, the cross suddenly becomes the central motif. Bishop Kaleno, he said that of the several varieties of cross still in vogue as national and ecclesiastical emblems, there is not amongst them the existence of which may not be traced to the remotest antiquity. They were the common property of the Eastern nations. So there's nothing uh, unique about the cross in Christianity. Tony Bushby in his Bible fraud, he says, there was no verification of a landmark or significant crucifixion of a person called Jesus Christ in the writings of such highly regarded contemporary historians as Philo, Tacitus, Pliny, Suetonius, Epictetus, uh, Cluvius, Rufus, Quintus, Curtus Rufus, Josephus, Plutarch, and the Roman consul Plubius Petronius. None, no mention. Stephen Knapp, in his book, Proofs of a Vedic Culture's Global Existence, he says, it was not until the Sixth Synod of Constantinople that it was decided that the symbol of Christianity would be represented from that time on as a man crucified on a cross. In fact, the earliest instances of any artwork that illustrates Jesus on a cross can be traced back um, only to the 8th or 9th century. 
So how biographical is that? That they have to wait 800 years before they go, oh, let's use a cross. But of course, the ancient world knew all about it and have been using it for generations. Its origin, again, is the zodiac. We have two phenomena, two other cycles of importance in the heavens, which, without which you couldn't have astrology or astronomy, and these are known as the ecliptic and the celestial equator. There is a trajectory of the sun around the earth. Okay, we mentioned that. There is the trajectory of the sun around the earth. That is a band of about 17 degrees wide on which are the major constellations. That is the zodiac. Now this belt itself crosses another belt called the celestial equator. When the sun annually reaches the junction point of this, of this cross, we have the spring and autumn equinoxes. In the year, when you cross the ecliptic and the celestial equator, those two joins is where we have, when the sun reaches them, that is, we have the spring and autumn equinoxes. So as the sun approaches those two junctions, as you can see in that diagram there, at the place where the two belts cross, you have the solstices and the equinoxes. And of course, there's two of each making four. There's a better picture of it. The vernal equinox facing the autumnal equinox, the summer solstice facing the winter solstice. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the original cross that John was talking about as the symbol of Christianity because he understood that the 12 disciples, Jesus representing the sun from the nativity onwards, this was all about the solar cult. And he wanted the symbol of the cross to represent the zodiacal cross, the great cross of the zodiac. How many flags do you know? How many flags do you know in the world that contain that cross? Here's a St. George's cross. What you're actually seeing there is a minute part of these two cycles. Those two lines or those two bars look very straight, don't they? But if you were to project them out and think of them actually as two circles and the point of crossing is the crossing of those two circles, now you will understand why the flags of the world were chosen with stars and motifs on them and why this peculiar symbol of the cross is found. It represents that very coming together, but of course they're focusing in on it, of the crossing point of the ecliptic and the equator. So when you hear the Christians uh, chanting and talking about following Christ to the cross, just realize what cross it is. Now Joseph A. Seiss in his Gospel of the Star says, In the triad of the three great Egyptian gods, each holds a sacred Tau or the cross as the symbol of life and immortality. So the fourfold cross is seen here on Ta, the ancient god of the Egyptians. And when you hear of Jesus dying on the cross, realize that it's the cross of winter upon which he is dying, to be reborn again after three days. Luke 23, now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. Centurion is a coded message. It refers to Ares, the warrior. When the Ares, as the sun is dying, the centurion sees what is happening. He understands that God is dying, but that he's innocent. The entombment of Jesus into the um, cave or into the uh, tomb is also referring to the southern signs. When the sun falls into the dark signs of winter, it's just a symbol of entombment. You find this in the story of Lazarus. You find this in the story of uh, Osiris and all the Christ saviors of the world go into the dark place for a sojourn from which they will rise again. And on the third day I shall rise again, said the Christ. The third day can be looked at as the three signs from Capricorn to Aries. The three signs from the depth of winter to the spring. Okay, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. We're thinking of three days, three seasons, three periods of time. Now we know the birth of Jesus we've looked at, but we also hear a very specific detail. Christ dies at age 33. Well, the answer to that is again concerning the procession of the equinoxes. The sun passes backward through the zodiac, remember, and moves through each of the 30 degrees in approximately one month of 30 days. So, on a daily routine, it takes 30 days to move through one sign. It comes into a sign at the first degree and is completely out of the sign by the 33rd degree. That is why Jesus, the Son of God, was said to have died at 33. It is also why there are 33 degrees within masonry. 
Freemasons are the descendants of the stellar cult. So we have Jesus, our Father who heart in heaven, referring himself to the sun, to Venus, to the morning star. The sun is three degrees in the sky, a sign is 30 degrees. In order to move 30 degrees, but to completely leave it, it's about 33 degrees. Again, if we turn to the Bible, we see the connections there. In Revelation 22, Jesus is saying in his own words, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. I'm the bright and morning star. You can't worship it. You can't mention it. You can't practice astrology. That's all meant to be you know, taboo and evil and satanic. But it's okay for Jesus to say, I'm, I'm, I'm identifying myself with the heavens, with the stars. Everyone knows the morning star is Venus or the sun. Jesus of Nazareth. There was no locale called Nazareth. The word derives from the Egyptian Nazir, meaning the prince who is sent, and also from Nasir, meaning Sirius. That's a star, the star Sirius. So therefore it is Jesus of Nasirius. Furthermore, the word carpenter, you always hear about Jesus being a carpenter. This again is um, cryptic language. This is cipher language. The word carpenter comes from the word Nagar, which means the serpent priests. Freemasons, even to this day, will use uh, cover euphemisms like this. And instead of saying Mason, they may say the word carpenter. But everyone in the know knows what that means. Let us understand also that when the sun god falls, he falls into the female signs. And although the Christians did uh, a lot of heavy duty work to denigrate that, the idea was that the son is born in the virgin and he dies and goes back to the virgin, to the mother. That is the night sky. Forever he is encompassed in the body of the womb of the night sky. So at this stage of our program, it is not outside the bounds of reason, after what we've been uh, showing, that we have to understand that the Gospels are not a biography. The Bible was and is Nothing more, nothing less than an astro-theological story, a sidereal myth. I believe that the writers of the Bible knew that. They had no intention of ever presenting it at anything else. And they would have been astounded that modern generations would actually think that it was a biography. Because if you were actually trying to create a biography, you would have done a much better job than the one that we have coming down to us. Even with all the machinations and throwing away and burning of other books, you still would have made it look more officially like a biography if that had been your intention. But the allegorists of the ancient world knew that everyone knows that this is a fable, a story. They would have not been able to even comprehend how this literally would have been taken so literally. And that the real, pure, beautiful, intriguing and mysterious meaning of it would just have been thrown out with the trash. This can be confirmed because if one substitutes the words zodiac and constellations for the following terms, the scriptures will begin to reveal their secret meanings. What terms? You can take a lot of them. Tabernacle, New Jerusalem, Nazareth, Bethlehem, Hall of Judges, Kingdom of God, Tent of God, Flocks by Night, Aeons or Ages, Seasons, Oracles, Citadel. We have the seven churches, the Mount of Olives, Mount of Glory, City of David, Celestial City, Heaven, Throne of the Elect, Abode of the Most High, the Labyrinth, the Most Holy Place, Mercy Seat. Whenever you uh, meet or encounter these uh, strange, cryptic, uh, untranslatable terms in the Bible, just in your mind, substitute the word constellations or zodiac and see what happens. You might be amazed. Now the dramatis personae of the Old Testament are not biographical characters. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Solomon, David, Samson, Joseph, Daniel, Jesus, and all the other patriarchs originally symbolized alignments and conjunctions between the planets and the luminaries. Their many wives, their sons and daughters simply represent degrees and minutes of zodiacal arc. So God is the sun. But Samson was the sun. In fact, the word shamash, Samson in Hebrew, shamash means the sun. It's so literal. Daniel in the lion's den, fighting the lions or being saved from the lion. The whole idea is Leo based at the son of God is passing through the trials of the sign of Leo. Because like Hercules, you go through the 12 signs if you're the hero. Now the word of God, we find that in the Bible, the very word we use, Amen, Amen, at the end of a prayer, we say Amen. 
Amen is literally Amen Ra of the Egyptian pantheon. The god of the Hebrews is Adonai. But that comes from the sun god Aton. The T becomes a D. In the Egyptian, there's the prayer that opens Amon, Amon, who art in heaven, in Egyptian. Lazarus comes from the Egyptian La Asuras. Asura is the Indian Surya, which to this day means the sun. But Asurya was actually the old name of Osiris. They didn't pronounce it Osiris, they called him Asurya, the sun. The Indians have Surya, the sun. Lazarus, coming out of the dark tomb, wrapped as a mummy. Christ said he's only sleeping. He'll come forth as a sleepwalker. It's Osiris, coming out of the underworld, coming out of the tomb, being born again. The Son of God, as the sun above us in the heavens. Jordan Maxwell, an ancient belief system, says, if one also replaces the word sun, S-O-N, with the word sun, S-U-N, wherever the former is found in the Bible, it will be discovered that every single verse fits the literal sun and not a man. In fact, the verses make better sense. That's right. Every time you see the word Son of God or the word Jesus, just in your mind, put there the word S-U-N and think of the sun and suddenly the Bible will come alive and every passage not only fits but makes better sense than if it was a biography. And that is how the mythographers who've painted the image of Jesus are showing you the rays of the sun, the red cross of the equinox, standing on the clouds, haloed with the sun and the cross of the zodiac, the light of the world. Behold, he cometh with clouds, says Revelation 1. Yes, the sun does come with clouds. The Christians to this day in the churches raise their arms and the old symbol of the Ka. Open any book on Egyptian mythology and look and you'll see the gods raising their arms and that is known as the Ka, the K-A. When you raise your arms like that to symbolize the soul. But just on the most primitive level, just observe the artwork. Just look at the imagery that is being shown to you. The Christ haloed with light, our Father who art in heaven. We end our prayers with Amen, which literally meant the Son God. The words of Jesus in Revelation 22, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Jesus at 12 years old is referred to as the Most High. In the Bible, he's referred to as the Most High. Well, the sun at the noon position of 12 o'clock is the original Most High. As we said, Christ comes from the Egyptian karast, meaning made flesh. All right, so the word is ancient. It comes from the word karast, meaning to be made flesh. It also means as a secondary meaning to be anointed with oil. The Christ is to be the oiled one or the uh, baptized one. Now in the story of Jesus, we have of course the famous motif of the birthday of Jesus. It's well brought out. It's a famous story, nativity, that the Son of God is a historical personage they try to tell us and that he has a birthday, the nativity. From Fraser, we find that the custom of celebrating Christ's birth began in Egypt, being derived from the mother goddess cult there, and the Christians there celebrated it on 6th of January. Okay, so the original date of birth of the Sun God from ancient times was January 6th. By the 4th century, it had become generally established in the East. The Western Church had never recognized the 6th of January as the true date, and in time, its decision was accepted by the Eastern Church. At Antioch, this change was not introduced until 375 AD. Now, the reason why the Fathers transferred the celebration of the 6th of January to the 25th of December was this. It was the custom of the heathen to celebrate on the same 25th of December the birthday of the sun at which they kindled lights in token of festivity. In these solemnities and festivities, the Christians also took part. Accordingly, when the doctors of the church perceived that the Christians had a leaning to this festival, they took counsel and resolved that the true nativity should be solemnized on that day and the festival of the Epiphany on the 6th of January. Accordingly, 
along with this custom, the practice has prevailed, the kindling of fires until the 6th. Alexander Del Mar, in his fine book, Middle Ages Revisited, says, Sir Isaac Newton, in his Prophecies of Daniel, showed that not only the solar festivals, but all the other principal ones observed by the early church were Roman festivals fitted with new names. There's nothing holy about the Holy Roman Empire. There's nothing holy about Constantine. And sadly, there's nothing holy about modern Christianity that came right out of that. Now, Melito of Sardis, the second century theologian, said that King of Heaven, Prince of Creation, Son of the Eastern Sky, who appeared both to the dead in Hades and to the mortals upon earth, he, the only true Helios, arose for us out of the highest summits of heaven. So wait a minute, I thought that Jesus rose out of the highest summits of heaven. No, Helios did, the King of Heaven, the Son. Tony Bushby uh, says that the Emperor then instructed the Bishop Eusebius to compile a uniform collection of new writings to be bound together as one. Eusebius was to arrange for the production of a 50 sumptuous copies to be written on parchment in a legible manner and in a convenient portable form by professional scribes thoroughly accomplished in their art. Make them to astonish, said Emperor Constantine. This was the first mention of finished copies of the Christian New Testament in the history of mankind. With the, his instructions now fulfilled, Emperor Constantine decreed that the new writings be thereafter called the words of God and be attached to copies of the Hebrew Old Testament. Emperor Vespasian in the first century had proclaimed the entire Jewish territory the personal property of the Roman emperors and his decision was officially ratified by the Senate. In effect, all later emperors were in control of the Jewish religion. Emperor Constantine effectively attempted to amalgamate the earlier Jewish religion with his new cult. By legal inheritance, he was also the Messiah. After Eusebius had finished drawing upon the large array of Presbyter's texts, Constantine then ordered them to be destroyed by fire, and any man found concealing one should be stricken off um, his shoulders, that is, beheaded. Tony Bushby goes on to say, It is important to note that the format of the name Jesus Christ was not cemented down until the time of the Reformation. That is the 14th and 17th centuries AD. For in earlier times it had several renditions, such as Yeshua Christ or Yeshua Christos. Alvin Boyd Kuhn says, A study of Christian history discloses the portentous fact that the concept of the malignancy of matter coming into the movement of Hinduism through Zoroastrianism became an influence overwhelmingly dominating the theology and the ethic. It bred the monstrous cult of asceticism, whose driving motivation was the idea that the instincts of the flesh must be crushed down in the interests of the spirit. The tragic consequence of this staggering default of insight are incalculable, but in all conscience overwhelming to any intelligence that discerns it. It lay the Christian mind open to the obsession of a psychological influence that has been nothing less than devastating to sanity, inflicting upon the psyche a trauma that has produced morbidity and crushed to a degree the natural instincts for human happiness. But that's what this whole blitzkrieg on the human psyche was meant to do, to suppress the feminine, to alienate you from the earth, to think that God is up in the cloud somewhere and he's also wrathful, he's also an all stern, father figure who's judging your every move to get you to be so schizoid, pathological and uh, existentially dreamt that you wouldn't even be able to fashion your own destiny and your own thoughts. were making pathways to their Isis and Osiris, their gods of afterlife and resurrection, and gods from their beginning. The Egyptians emphatically believed in a golden age when the gods ruled the earth. Four children came out of the womb of the sky goddess, four human-shaped children, two of which were Isis and Osiris, and they established a kingdom of the first time. They called it Zeptepi, 
This was a golden age when the gods ruled the earth and brought knowledge and civilization. The balance between the cosmos and the earth was perfect and happiness ruled the land. A golden time in which Osiris ruled, but Seth, his brother, grew jealous, betrayed and killed Osiris. The world fell prey to chaos as Set cut up the body of Osiris and hid each of its 14 pieces. Blood and darkness came over Egypt. But Isis, faithful consort of Osiris, searched every corner of the land, gathered the parts of her beloved and bound them in linen. However, she could not find the phallus and she fabricated a golden phallus from which she impregnated herself with the seed of Osiris and bore a son, the son Horus, the divine child. It is Horus that uh, became the first established man-god, first pharaoh to rule Egypt. And all pharaohs that, uh, that followed uh, believed themselves to be reincarnated entities of Horus. Horus with a falcon head avenged his father, conquered evil and slew Seth. And Isis and Osiris reincarnated in heaven where both stand as rulers of the night and afterlife. Osiris as Orion and Isis as the star Sirius. One cannot overemphasize the importance of the star Sirius. Sirius was Isis, the life-giving force of Egypt. The star performs a very, very specific cycle. It is not only the brightest star in the northern hemisphere, in the whole sky. It wasn't because the star was beautiful and brilliant that the Egyptian venerated it, but it would disappear. Orion and Sirius would disappear for a period of 70 days. Now this is extremely interesting because the period of 70 days was also the period of embalmment when they would mummify a king. They would take 70 days to perform the ritual and therefore it's clear that they associated it to the disappearance of the stars for 70 days. 70 days they waited in mourning and in expectation and in fear that the star would not reappear and Egypt would not be reborn again. But then on a magical day that occurred at the summer solstice, 70 days later, the star would pop over the eastern horizon this time at dawn, just a few seconds before sunrise. And this sparkle, this spark of life, of the appearance of the star, was the greatest moment in the Egyptian cultic belief. For at that same moment, the river Nile swelled from monsoon rains in a distant, unknown south. The Nile floods brought new life to a parched land. For Egypt, this was the yearly rebirth, so crucial that it took it as the start of its new year. This miraculous conjunction of summer solstice sunrise, of the rebirth of Sirius at dawn, after this long invisibility, and the flooding of the Nile, was the great vision that the Egyptians had about rebirth. And they imagined their god Osiris in the sky, looking down on his creation, looking down on Egypt, looking down at the rising of the star. And the creation that he sees is not only the star rising, but the rebirth of Egypt. And this spark of life was, in their mind, transferable to the goddess Isis giving birth to Horus, the divine child which represented Egypt. So it is the star that encapsulates the very essence of Egypt, the very essence of its yearly rebirth. Now, here we have a divine mother bearing the divine child associated to a star in the east. Interestingly, the same concept appears again 3,000 years later in a completely new cult. Or is it a completely new cult?
Boval's insights shed new light on the magical death rites for the pharaoh, child of Horus, as the builders of the pyramids envisaged. After 70 days, the mummy was taken west to the land across the Nile, the Giza necropolis. As one crosses the Milky Way to Orion's belt, where the pyramids stand as the gateway to Isis and Osiris, gods of life after death. I'm taking you inside the Pyramid of Unas. And here are the oldest religious writings in history, the pyramid texts. The meaning of these texts were nearly forgotten because Egyptologists saw in them mainly a sun religion. But this isn't a religion of the day and the living. This is a religion of the night and of the dead. These texts repeatedly tell us that the king becomes a star in the kingdom of Osiris in the constellation of Orion. One of these texts says, may you traverse the winding waterway, the Milky Way, and may you go to the place where Orion is. Now, when a pharaoh died, his body was mummified and prepared like Osiris, and his soul was ready to ascend to the sky. But before this would happen, the dead king had to ensure that the power of divine rule was passed on to his son, the living horse. This would happen in a very dramatic ceremony called the opening of the mouth, during which ceremonial tools were used to open the mouth of the mummy and bring it back to life. Then an artificial phallus was placed on the mummy and the dead king was directed towards the star of Isis, the star Sirius. It was then that the seeding of the womb of the goddess took place. His earthly mission fulfilled, and the dead king would depart to the sky. In effect, what we have here is a reenactment of the resurrection myth of Osiris told in stellar terms. In ancient Egypt, this was Rostal, entrance to the underworld, kingdom of Osiris and gateway to afterlife, a place where mystery reigns up until today. So far, scientists saw a little more than tombs for three dead pharaohs, but the realization grows that this was much, much more. Deep in this shaft, Egypt's top archaeologist is excavating corridors and caves which bring the Osiris myth further alive. <laughs> This is became a sacred place to the Egyptians. People wanted to be buried here, to be connected with this god Osiris. We are now 30 meters underneath the ground, between the Sphinx exactly and the second pyramid. We found remains of four pillars like this one. In between, there is water. Underneath the water, there is a sarcophagus, above the sarcophagus was that lid. When I looked inside the sarcophagus, we did not find anything. But why? He's not buried here. But symbolically, his spirit, his spirit is here. They could know that this is the tomb of Osiris. And this really is a symbolic burial, a cenotaph for Osiris. And it's very unique. And it became legend later that many people will be having a small statuette made of wood and then erection in it and they mummify this and erection means resurrection because Osiris is the god of resurrection. He was killed by the devil itself but the Isis cried her tear with the river Nile and she restored his erection that she could not find and she had the son from him, Horus the victorious, who conquered the devil. This myth built the Egyptian civilization. Without Isis, there is no river Nile. The river Nile gave fertility to the land. Without the river Nile, there is no Egypt. And also, the story tells us the devil always has to be conquered.
much more than tombs for dead pharaohs, this was the grandiose expression of a civilization with a cosmic vision that probed death and reached for resurrection through magical rites and initiation. The whole focus of, of the Egyptian cult, the whole idea of the initiatory cult, of the, of the mystical cult, is to learn how to perform this transfiguration and journey uh, into the afterlife and become part of the Osirian afterlife kingdom. Osiris was the constellation of Orion. They called this Sahu. Strangely enough, the name Sahu means to become a spiritual being, an astral being. They gave the name to the mummy. We have named mummies, mummies. But the mummy in ancient Egypt was called Sahu. To become a Sahu is to become a mummy, but it's also to become a spiritualized entity, to become Orion. The same way we say to join Christ or to become Christ-like after death. Are the Giza pyramids an attempt to reach beyond death? New insights gain ground. They were an uh, actual model on the ground of the region of the sky through which your soul is expected to travel. So they were a place of initiation, a place of preparation into the mystery of what lies beyond death. I believe that they were primarily intended to be experienced by the living and to have a transformatory effect upon the living. Uh, from which they would emerge stronger and more equipped for this terrible and terrifying journey that must be made after death. That, to me, makes sense of the, uh, of the whole enterprise. Initiated into the mysteries of silence and stillness, the one thing you were never allowed to do was to talk about it. And oddly enough, no one ever did. All we know is that they passed through the portals of death. If you like a preview of death, it was being taken through anything which involves the emotions, both fear, panic, love, simply to push this person to the point where they break through all that is not truly them, so that the true person beneath the social overlay can emerge. A place where men stood eye to eye with a god. Thousands of years before Christianity, ancient Egypt knew of a last judgment. Man's sins are weighed against what he truly is the feather of truth, his essence, the lightness that remains when he has shed all else. This was a civilization that quested for a truth within. You know, today our worldview by our scientists tell us that the truth is out there and we have to search outside but to the ancient Egyptians they said that the truth was in here and the search was within inside they believe that inside the individual is the spark of divinity and in order to teach themselves inwardly to expand that spark to to bring it to its full maturity they had to speak to it internally in a language that they call the language of divinity, the language of the gods. Now, how do they perceive this language? Well, the cosmos, if they are part of it, then they must communicate with it. They communicate by sensing, by getting messages from the wind, the stars, the moon, the fertility of the land, the birth of their children. This is the language of nature, this is the language of the cosmos. But they began to understand that you could convert, codify this language in a sacred language of symbols. You could symbolize cosmic principles. 
This is the beginning of sacred writing. This is why writing was invented. Indeed, they tell us that the invention of the sacred writing was from the gods. Thought, God with the ibis head, God of knowledge, divine messenger, who taught the magic symbols of writing. It was Thought who initiated Isis into the magic of reincarnation. The Frenchman Champollion deciphered the hieroglyphs with this Rosetta Stone, but did he do justice to the magic of Thought, or are we, with our phonetic alphabet of 26 letters, just scratching the surface? The Egyptians had a better system. The Egyptians, for, for one thing, had 780 uh, letters in the writings, and they studied every single one of them. And each sign, each symbol, was charged. So when they conveyed an idea, they chose the right symbol, the right sign. Uh, one very good example that we all know is the cross. The Christian cross is a symbol. Uh, if you are not uh, aware of what it represents, then all you see is a cross. But of course, to a Catholic priest uh, initiated into the cult of Christianity, a cross signifies everything about Christianity. So rather than think of this as some sort of uh, superstitious mumbo-jumbo, the, the hieroglyphics are the window behind which lies a whole powerful initiatory cult. In the same sense, Egyptians would make little of this symbol into which every Catholic is initiated. The mystery of Eucharisty. Beauvoir believes that ancient Egypt spoke in symbols and that their magic may still speak to us today, even if we fail to understand it. In the centuries after the Pyramid Age, 2500 BC, religious concepts blurred as different gods dominated different epochs. But the Osiris myth withstood the time, even as the name Osiris eventually changed into Serapis. Temples of Serapis and Isis could be found as far as England, Germany, temples in France. As from the first century AD, the cult spread throughout the Roman Empire to vie for supremacy with Christianity on the rise. And it even influenced Christianity itself. Within the Christian movement developed a faction that had absorbed the idea that in order to attain divine state, one had to acquire knowledge through the internal search. This very much came from the ancient Egyptian initiated religion. Alexandria, Egypt, a place of initiation for adherents of an old faith and a new one. Here, early Christians came to find gnosis, knowledge from the heart through initiation. For that they needed no church, no hierarchy, only to face themselves and meet God. This in a sense represents the underworld, the tenebrous regions where initiates and make contact with the divinities. It is light getting into darkness and finding a way into the afterlife kingdom. The portals of immortality, the portals that led to an afterlife, was to death. And therefore the initiates would come down here in absolute black darkness, perhaps with no torches whatsoever, and would, uh, would come here and imbue the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the mood of the place and find themselves in a peculiar position of interface. They were, they were that close they believe, where one can transit from life, death, and rebirth. The people who came here were early Christians, and yet they were the link between the ancient Egyptian mystery cults and the Gnostic religion. The Gnostic religion is, in a sense, uh, the ancient Egyptian mystery cult Christianized. So here we have the resurrection uh, events performed through the mummification rituals. 
We see Anubis over the mummy. Thoth, now called Hermes by the Greeks. Here we are in the second century of Christianity. And yet we see early Christians perform the rituals of the ancient Egyptians, presenting the feather of truth, the symbol of truth to the divinity. And this was a time when Christianity had not yet formulated its iconography or its symbols or even its myth. Christianity shape its myth? Of the four Gospels, there's one which has shaped our idea of nativity. Mary is the holy mother of a divine child, Jesus, and strangely links the story to Egypt, the Gospel of Matthew. The Matthew Gospel is unique for three things, all related to the nativity story. One, the Magi, they come from the East, and they follow a star. That's the second thing, the star of the East. Thirdly, he has the Holy Family escaping to Egypt, the massacre of the infants, and coming to Egypt and taking refuge at Heliopolis. A Christian church near Heliopolis depicts the Holy Family's escape to Egypt. And the tradition is so much alive today that when they did this painting, they modeled the tree on the one that supposedly the Holy Family rested. This story appears in only one Gospel, the Gospel of Matthew. Now we know that the Gospel of Matthew was written in the city of Alexandria in Egypt. So what did the writer have in mind? Beauval believes Matthew developed the icon of the Holy Mother and the Divine Child to speak to the Egyptians to whom that icon was more than familiar. What is the most powerful icon of ancient Egyptian religious cult is indeed this goddess Isis holding the divine infant on her lap. They're trying to market a new religion here, a new divine child, to people who have believed for, for three millennia that the divine child was the divine child of Isis. He actually, in a sense, hijacked the stellar myth of Isis and Horus and the star Sirius, and grafted it on the Christian mythology. There is yet an even more powerful way that the ancient Christian myth-makers injected the Isis myth into their new religion. They made use of a star, the star of the East, the star of Bethlehem. Could this star be the star of Isis, ancient star of divine birth? After 3,000 years, due to the phenomena of precession, the time of rising and setting of Sirius changed. At the time of the birth of Jesus, that star would appear at around the time of the winter solstice, not the summer solstice as the ancient Egyptian, around the 25th of December to be precise, just after sunset. Now, we know that the Jews and Christians celebrated the changing of the day at dusk, not at dawn, like the ancient Egyptian, at sunset. Therefore, here is the interesting thing. On the 25th of December, they would see the constellation of Orion rising, and just after sunset, the star Sirius would rise over the horizon. And this was the very same image that the ancient Egyptians had seen for thousands of years to celebrate the birth of the divine child Horus. So could it be that the star of the nativity be drawn from an ancient myth and grafted onto the new religion of Christianity? And were even the three magi setting out for the birth star shaped to suit with ancient myth in Egypt? The constellation of Orion with the three bright stars forming the belt would rise as if heralding, as if announcing the birth of Sirius. Now, it is only Matthew who mentions the Magi's in his Gospel. Could this explain why the three stars in Orion's belt were identified to the three Magi's? It's evident if you study the myth and the history together that those who wrote it saw Isis in 
the mother of Jesus. And then later on, she developed her own identity as Mary, and the Isis part of her withdrew. But certainly, originally, it was Isis. These mythic images are, are alive, and they evolve and change. And so nothing can be static, and nothing can be said. That is the way it is for one time and one time only. In its first centuries, Christianity is torn by theological debate. An Orthodox Church with a growing hierarchy of priests and bishops confronts Gnostics who seek God within themselves. The fundaments of faith are contested. The nature of Christ as God's Son fiercely debated. God was not always the partner once he was not. Being a Gnostic meant being against the Orthodox Church because the Gnostic did not recognize the established church. He did not need the establishment. He communicated directly with God. He did not need a interpreter. A faith of individuals, which is drawing increasing interest. At its heart is the principle of relationship with divinity. Personal, no priest, no hierarchy, no administrative phenomenon, no leader. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to power structures. Fatally dangerous. Nicaea 325 AD. Constantine, the first Roman emperor to embrace Christianity, has called the bishops. As a statesman, he opts for orthodoxy and the support of a powerful hierarchy. Fellow ministers, we believe in one God. What he decrees will Almighty. define the Christian all faith all until today. Invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, God from the God. The Gnostic Gospels burn. Christians God, kill fellow Christians by countless thousands. Gnostics and everything pagan are wiped out. The Serapium, Alexandria's Temple of Osiris and its great library go up in flames. And what replaced the system of knowledge and gnosis was blind faith, which eventually led to the monks and ascetic and dryness of an establishment that imposed their doctrines and dogmas on the population. We're now at the most incredible crossroad of world culture. Here is Philad, where it, the last stand of Egyptian culture and Egyptian religion stands, the great temple of Isis. But the Christian mobs finally make their way here with the hammers and the chisels, and they throw themselves on the, what they consider to be the pagan image and start chiseling. And the priests beg them, stop, stop, this is the most sacred temple of Egypt. This is the temple of the mother goddess thousands of years. You're a mother goddess. You have a mother goddess. You have your own. And they begged the, the, the monks to take over this temple and use it as a Christian sanctuary. And here we have it all. In a desperate bid to save the cult of Isis, the Egyptian priest stepped aside and let the new religion absorb its iconography and symbols. At the close of antiquity, last survivors entrusted Gnostic Gospels and the ancient philosophies to paper and hide it for their persecutors. The Gnostic religious texts have surfaced only recently. The philosophical texts emerge much earlier in Florence, cradle of Europe's reawakening. In 1460, a monk delivered to Cosimo de' Medici a bundle of books. They turned out to be the Hermetica, the last works of Hermes de Magistos, the Egyptian cult. Cosimo asked his translator, Marsilio Ficino, to put aside Plato and translate forthwith the Hermetica. An intellectual bomb was about to explode. Hermetism became so popular that even the Pope Borgia decorated his apartments at the Vatican with scenes of Osiris and Isis and thought Hermes as imagined by the Renaissance painters. Here a religion was insinuating itself that was ordered and deemed by some 
wiser than that of Moses in the Bible. The Cathedral of Siena shows this image of Hermes Trismegistus, the god Thot, handing over Egypt's wisdom, and the Phoenix of Creation, an ancient Heliopolis. The popes sprinkle Rome with symbols of antiquity and obelisks from Egypt. By a strange twist of fate, the pope chose the ancient symbol of Heliopolis, which was a pillar and a cross on top of it, and placed it in the very heart of Christendom. And how ironic that all who come here also admire this symbol of pagan Egypt. Scholars like the Jesuit Athanasius Kircher study the Egyptian enigmas, but the church senses danger. Hermeticism inspires new individual ways away from the interests of the church. Ideas are banned, books burnt. In 1600, Hermeticism is silenced as its main proponent, Gordiano Bruno, is dragged before ecclesiastical courts and, despite cruel torture, refuses to renounce his ideas. The church had only one way to stop this, and so the unthinkable happened. On a dull September morning, Giordano Bruno was dragged to this place, his mouth gagged, and he was burnt alive. Up to the very last moment, he tried to avert his eyes from the cross that was being brandished to his face by the Inquisition priest. And with this, Hermetism took a nosedive and went deep underground. Hermeticism finds refuge in esoteric societies such as Rosicrucians or Freemasonry. The Grand Lodge of London, heart and headquarters of Freemasonry, resonates with ancient symbols. Initiation in secrets, rites and symbols Ask any Freemason about links with ancient Egypt, and they'll probably laugh it off. Authors Bob Lomas and Chris Knight would have done just that, until curiosity got the better of them. Ten years ago, we would have poo-pooed anybody that said what we're saying now. But it's not a straight, linear event, but there is a line straight back uh, to Egypt that merged and uh, branched off and rebranched back. The pyramid with the all-seeing eye, the blazing star, did Egypt's most sacred symbols find their way in Masonic mysteries? In their books, Lomas and Knight investigate the influence of Freemasonry on symbols and institutions of America. The founders of the United States of America, the, the majority of them, George Washington, Franklin and others, were Freemasons. Um, at the uh, uh, construction of the, the White House, they attended there in all their Masonic regalia. Um, so, and the Constitution of the United States is an extension of uh, the principles of Freemasonry, of democracy and the, uh, investment in science and the furtherance of science. It's a Masonic experiment, which in turn is an ancient Egyptian experiment, the principle of doing good for goodness sake, and outside of a, a religion. And that's what Freemasonry is today. In front of the George Washington Masonic Temple stands another familiar symbol. Here, Washington and other founding fathers are honored carrying a mason's apron. The dollar, symbol of America's might, shows the unknown side of the American seal, the pyramid with the all-seeing eye and the promise of a new order. It's interesting, for example, that when the president is sworn in, he makes a Masonic symbol, which I can't demonstrate to you because it would contravene my vows as a Freemason. He doesn't explain what it is, but he makes a symbol, and that symbol is the Masonic symbol of fidelity. So this man also didn't do it just to keep his fingers warm. Napoleon stepped on the world scene as conqueror of Egypt. When Napoleon came to the gates of Cairo, he did not come as a Christian. He and his army were much imbued with a revolutionary cult that was modeled on Masonic ideals. Virtually all his generals were Freemasons, and Napoleon himself was initiated during a night he passed alone inside the Great Pyramid. Napoleon, when he returned from Egypt, was obsessed with the idea that he was under the protection of a star. So much so that this monument, known as the Place de l'Etoile, the Place of the Star, was put 
along the central axis of Paris, the Champs Elysees, and more. This great artery of Paris lies 26 degrees off east to align it with the Star of Isis, Bouval believes. This is what the Parisians would see when they looked east, the constellation of Orion rising, and here is the star Sirius just breaking over the horizon, 26 and a half degrees to the right of east, in perfect alignment with the axis of the Champs-Élysées. Some historians say that the name of Paris may be linked to the goddess Isis, because here, where stands the church of Saint-Germain-des-Prés, once stood the temple of Isis. And the Romans used to call this place Par Isis, which means near the temple of Isis. Par Isis, Paris. Napoleon was impressed enough to order the star and Isis herself placed on the prow of this ship in the emblem of Paris. The city harbors many references to Isis and Egypt, as on this ceiling of the Louvre Palace. It shows the genius of Paris to whom the future is unveiled, a future that shows Isis, an obelisk and a pyramid at her feet, and an angel heralding the vision. And here it is, the very same statue towering over the Place de la Bastille, where to celebrate the first year of the revolution, huge crowds gathered here under a statue of Isis. And now, 200 years later, what is it looking at? Well, like in the painting, an obelisk and a pyramid, which was inaugurated in 1984 by President Mitterrand for the bicentennial of the revolution. Here you have these extremely ancient magical devices placed in the heart of the power places of the world. You can imagine the millions of people walking around for years, and occasionally, it grabs the imagination of one. Uh, one person will, will say, well, why is it here? What's it doing here? And it's bound to evoke the, the, the magic of, of the past and what the symbol means. Symbols which, like hieroglyphs, carry many layers of meaning. As it turned out in 1999, when Egypt had a brilliant idea to usher in a new millennium for television around the world to witness. minutes for 12 o'clock a helicopter will come with this capstone and will put it in the top of the pyramid you know you have to imagine this will be the most exciting moment in history that capstone had been missing for thousands of years and this seemed a marvelous stunt to promote Egypt but this was a symbol with more to it there's been suggestion that uh, apart from it being a Masonic symbol that it is going to represent the time when the Masonic ideals are, are, are brought to fruition and inaugurate a new world order. It's precisely what it says on the American dollar, that there is a new world order on its way. Or, as an influential occult prophet, Edgar Cayce had foretold the coming of a new messiah. Or was it a new Horus? For for the first time in thousands of years, Sirius, the birth star of Isis, would appear precisely above the pyramid at the very turn of the year. Ancient Egypt wrote Isis with two symbols, a star over a triangle. At the placing of the capstone at the turn of the millennium, the skies over Giza would have cried out, Isis, Isis. You know, symbols have a funny way of causing changes of ideas and therefore I'd like to see it just because it, it pleases me to see it this way as some sort of ancient magic something we don't understand something that is there to tease us and to remind us that all isn't rational and that we live in a, in a magical world that we haven't fully understood but Egypt celebrated the millennium without television worldwide a radical Islamic press fiercely condemned the event as a capitalist plot and a coup of Freemasonry. The party went off without the capstone. Still, why do the symbols of the past still speak to us? Uh, Egypt is important not because it's the sole place in the world where profound things happened, but because the decor of Egypt, you might say, startles us and reminds us that uh, humanity in the past 
did fantastic things and had mystical and spiritual experiences that were important to its survival. And we want to reconnect with those experiences. And I believe that hunger exists very, very widely in, in our time. The Giza Plateau, this expression of the Osirian religion and the Isis religion, was there before Christianity. It is there to stay. And it may even outlast Christianity. wiped out mankind, was there something like a flood, something that went on before it? From the Middle Ages rises the myth of the Holy Grail, King Arthur and his round table. Was there something like a grail, symbol for the church or for opponents which it feared? peoples and gods of the Andes. How could the mightiest empire of its time fall for a handful of Spanish conquerors, the secret of the Incas and the lost war against time? The golem, the secrets of Kabbalah, Jewish myth, or man's longing to shape life and imitate the act of God. Ark of the Covenant, embodiment of God, its sudden disappearance is one of the greatest mysteries from the Bible. Is the Ark still somewhere? From a nightmare rose a monster dreadful. How dare you touch him? That man belongs to me! How from fantasy and frustration, author Bram Stoker created a being which would become a myth. May traverse the Milky Way. Osiris, Isis, Horus, the quest for eternity and life after death, prototype for Christianity? The myths of ancient Egypt still reverberate today. Hail the supreme sovereign, the Emperor Constantine and the Empress Helena! The year is 324. Constantine, the first emperor to embrace Christianity, has summoned the bishops to put an end to fierce theological debate. It must have been a time before his creation when he was not heretic. Three centuries after Jesus of Nazareth walked the earth, quarrel rages about who and what he was. The decision the emperor imposes will define Christianity for 18 centuries to come. Sovereign, fellow ministers, this is the creed to which we have unanimously declared ourselves signatories. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. By imperial decree, of Jesus of Nazareth is proclaimed to be God's only Son. All other opinions are suppressed. Those disagreeing are exterminated. The Dead Sea Scrolls speak of sons of God in a plural way. They are the perfect, and they are the people who are perfectly carrying out the law. How would the historic Jesus have felt if he would have known that he would be termed the divine son of God and only one? I think he would have been horrified, completely horrified. It's the very opposite of everything that he would or could have represented in the Palestine that we're talking about. Ten years ago, historian Robert Eisenman forced the Dead Sea Scrolls into the open. Discovered in 1945 by a wandering shepherd, these documents offer a unique view on the world into which Jesus would be born. Before the scrolls, Israel built this shrine of the book. 
Robert Eisenman found himself alone in his conclusion that they talk about Jesus and that the man we see as God's son might have been a rebel rouser and fanatic. He is now virtually ignored. But fewer contested the words he then spoke at the end of a documentary I made on the scrolls. And for 10 years they kept on puzzling me. Who was Jesus? What was he? Jesus was a Jew for all his life. He was born a Jew, he died a Jew. I think he would have been amazed at the construction of a Christian church. Well, if we discovered this text today, that here was a guy who was born of a virgin, his mother was God, and he walked on water and then came back from the dead, we would all go, well, this is clearly a myth. And yet, because it's so much a part of our culture, part of our education, part of our upbringing, we're, it's, we call it the unthinkable to thought. To think that this might actually be a myth is, a, is, is beyond most of us. There was a uh, biblical scholar, and probably a very devout Christian, writing at the beginning of the century, who said, uh, we should no longer hope that the Jesus who actually lived in Palestine has any resemblance at all to the Jesus of the Bible. And I think that was a brutally honest statement and probably a correct statement. For those who take the Bible as the very word of God, it may save pain and aggravation to turn this program off. It explores the thought that the creed stems from the realm of myth instead. A conviction growing among scholars as ancient documents come to light which give new insight in the origins of Christianity, the ancient world, and Jesus, Son of God. In the world of Jesus, many could be sons of God, a term for the truly pious, Jews faithfully observing the law, the same for pagans. The Son of God would have been terms used in the mysteries, but rather like we use the term, the doctor of theology, for instance, would have been entitled the Son of God, someone who had received information about the Godhead. It's a metaphor which was available throughout the Roman world. It's a way of expressing a close relationship between a human and God. And Jesus was by no means the only son of God around. Everybody who's anybody, the emperors or, or anybody, claimed what was the son of God and had a very similar biography of what they were able to do. Son of God was not just a term reserved for the pious and knowledgeable, also for the powerful. In ancient Egypt, every pharaoh was a son of Osiris, son of God. You, t you take Alexander the Great. Now, he is the person who brought the whole Mediterranean world together into a Greek empire. Now, his mother was a, an initiate of the cult of Dionysus. She groomed him with the idea that he was a, an immaculate conception that born from the god. Um, and in, in his life... She was the, the virgin mother. Indeed. Julius Caesar is the son of the goddess uh, with divine lineage as all emperors later came to claim. So the idea of being son of God is quite commonplace throughout the ancient world. Did Jesus himself ever call himself the son of God? So far as we know, Jesus never referred to himself as son of God. He, if, if we believe the Gospel of Mark, he spoke of himself as son of man. <laughs> Yet the claim that he was God's unique and only begotten son is the very cornerstone of the Christian creed. Over a distance of two millennia, Christianity seems to come as a radical break from the past, the promise of salvation, life after death. But did resurrection come as a new revelation to mankind with Jesus Christ? No. On the contrary, but that is an idea that appealed very much to the Egyptians who were always concerned 
about the eternal life of their body. And the pyramids and everything shows that the religion of the ancient Egyptians was life from death. And that was, of course, life in the cosmos after the death of nature in the spring. Deep in his 80s, Dutchman Gilles Quispel, once professor at Harvard, is still considered one of the world's most eminent experts on ancient and early Christian thought. The deceased appears for the tribunal of the last balance. And the man is standing there before the door that gives entrance to the hall of absolute truth. And there stands also Osiris. He is a, a god who appears on the earth as a man. He brings great teachings, the proper way to worship the gods, uh, brings civilization in a way, um, and then is put to death by the forces of evil. He is resurrected. He then ascends into heaven where he will be the judge of souls at the end of time. And Egyptian tombs are full of representations of, of these events. For ancient Egypt, Osiris stood as the constellation of Orion, good shepherd amongst the stars, souls in heaven. It is by no means the only mythic image that foretold the later concepts of Christianity. Authors Tim Freak and Peter Gandhi made extensive study into ancient thought. It's a crude image. Why did you put this in front of your book? Well, this piece of evidence was hugely important for us. We, it's a, a, a talisman, an amulet. It's tiny, the size of my thumb. And it shows what you think is Jesus on the cross. And yet the Greek inscription tells us that it's the pagan dying and resurrecting god-man Dionysus. And the discovery that the pagan god-man could have met his death in exactly the same way that Jesus was later claimed to have died, for us was conclusive evidence that the Jesus story as we have it is taken from pagan mythology. It says Bacchus. Wasn't he the, the god of wine? Indeed. In Indeed, but also the god of initiation. Originally, no more than a minor wine deity, Dionysus, literally God's son, later transforms into a redeemer. A divine child, seated in eerie resemblance to the infant Christ on his mother's lap. He is honored with bread and wine to commemorate his sacrifice and death on a crude stake. He resurrects and ascends to heaven, the Greek version of Osiris. Could Christianity owe something to this ancient culture and others? On the site where the Vatican now stands, there once stood a pagan temple. Here, pagan priests celebrated sacred ceremonies which early Christians found so disturbing that they tried to erase all evidence of them ever having been practiced. What were the shocking pagan rites? Gruesome sacrifices, obscene orgies perhaps? This is what we've been led to believe, but the truth is far stranger than this fiction. In this ancient sanctuary, pagan congregations once glorified a redeemer, Mithras, who, like Jesus, was born on the 25th of December of a virgin, the Son of God, who ascended into heaven and promised to come again at the end of time to judge the quick and the dead. Here, pagan priests celebrated a symbolic meal of bread and wine in honor of their Redeemer, the bread of Christ, who promised to his followers that he who shall not drink of my blood shall not know salvation. Like Osiris in Egypt, Mithras, a deity with origins in Persia, stood in the skies as Orion, facing Taurus. 
his cult became the prime competitor of Christianity in the ancient world. One famous scholar said that if Christianity hadn't triumphed, the whole world would have been Mithraic. Here is a deity who is a divine saviour. He's the son of God and a, an immortal woman. He's God incarnate. He brings uh, wisdom. He brings a new religion. He challenges, as all the mystics always do, the old authorities. He's outrageous. He performs miracles. He turns water into wine at a wedding, just as Jesus does. He dies at Easter, he resurrects after three days, he ascends to heaven. And we've got lovely inscriptions saying, you know, if you share in the, 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 the blood and the body of the God-man, then you too will be uh, resurrected. So the motifs which we associate with the story of Jesus already exist in the story of Osiris Dionysus somewhere. How do Christian authors, early Christian authors, explain away these similarities? Well, there's two approaches. The early literalist Christians explain this through diabolical mimicry or plagiarism by anticipation. You know, it's, it's, it's the idea that uh, somehow uh, the devil has uh, uh, taken these ideas because he knows they're going to happen, made up these myths over the centuries to mess with people's heads so that when it actually happens in the form of Jesus, no one will believe it. Now, that's what the literalist Christians are saying. These Christians we don't actually find until the second century. Christians celebrated their victory by claiming and pretending that paganism was decaying. Crude, uninteresting, inferior. And that Christianity simply had to win. But that was a Christian fantasy. In fact, paganism was passionately alive. And what does pagan itself mean? Well, it was coined uh, by the Christians as a term of abuse. It means country dweller. So it was to suggest that these people who had built the pyramids, had given us the plays of, of Euripides and Sophocles, the works of Plato, were in some way primitive, superstitious country folk. What transformed your opinion of paganism? I think studying um, pagan spirituality and discovering this rich, mystical philosophy at the heart of it, this is where much that is of the best of what we now regard as Western culture comes from these roots, and finding that this form of spirituality wasn't at all this very primitive idol worship. It was incredibly sophisticated. Catacombs. The images seem early Christian, but this good shepherd is in fact the redeemer god Attis from Greek Asia. Although the Christian message may seem revolutionary to love your enemies, and it is a far cry from the Judaic teachings of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But in pagan philosophy, we have sentiments that the philosopher's way is to be flogged like an ass and to love the man who beats you, to be a brother and a father to all mankind. I was brought up, as I think most people in our culture have been, to have monotheism clearly on one side and then polytheism. Monotheism being clearly superior my view has been almost turned on its head because what you find in, in pagan polytheism, that polytheism clearly has at its center the idea of oneness. There is a one God or even a oneness which is beyond any idea of God even. And that is the supreme being which can be approached through many faces. And the reason that this impersonal oneness needs these many faces is because any one face is inadequate to the glory of this oneness. An example, India, land of thousands of gods and goddesses. Yet any Hindu can tell you that all these are merely as many facets of the one, that all is one, divine, limitless, and incomprehensible to man. What happens with monotheism is that you get the idea that, was, that there was one way. One particular face glorified as if that was the one God. In our culture, that's, that's Yahweh or Jehovah, the, uh, the Jewish tribal God, who is a particular face of God, if you like, a particular way that a people 
were relating to the divine and said, no, this is the personality of God. And this is one of the ways in which Christianity became an authoritarian religion and why paganism is usually a very, very tolerant form of spirituality because it allows diversity, because it knows that what it's trying to take you to ultimately can't be expressed, has no qualities, is a mystical understanding, and therefore any route you take is going to be personal. The polytheism or the monotheism, these really are not the issues that blind you to the real perspective. It's how they're understood which is crucial. How did the ancients try to understand the mystery of life? Most is lost, destroyed, but crucial seem to be ideas also voiced by the Greek thinker Plato. Man, said Plato, is like someone in a cave, bound, unable to see anything else than what is before his eyes, vague shapes on the wall. shadows that the light casts from the real world that goes on behind him. Either one thing. But man, unable to turn, blind to a real, divine world, keeps on staring at the wall before him, thinking that truth is there, believing that only that is his reality. Learning to see that true divine world was the quest of the mystery religions. Mystery religion aims at transformation. That is the basic idea of the mystery. They sought to transform, to see true reality, true knowledge, what they called gnosis. All the mystery religions really had an outer, exoteric, outer mysteries and inner mysteries, more mystical teachings about self-transformation. And the outer mysteries really are there for, uh, uh, they talk about cooking for the masses, you know, it's, it's something which is available to all. But others saw a deeper, mystical reality under the surface of the story. To them the story was an allegory, which told not just about the God, but beyond that, about themselves, a deeper message which taught them to understand the mystery of life and face the reality of death. And then what we find then is a spectrum between two extremes which we call literalists on the one hand or Gnostics and mystics on the other. That the Gnostics or the mystics, pagan philosophers, you know, they're, they're attacking their own literalists or fundamentalists who literally believe that that, that, that I worshipping an idol will help you and all the rest of it. They're going, no, this is a complete misunderstanding. We're saying that there is an essential mystical understanding of the miracle and the mystery of life and the language with which this is expressed varies. Now, one of the ways that it's expressed is allegory in mythic picture language and stories. And the one which is key, of course, to understanding uh, Christianity is the myth of the Son of God. And that goes right the way back to the ancient Egyptians and Osiris and develops up through figures such as Dionysus in Greece, Attis, Adonis, Mithras, and so forth. Many, many different figures. And what we would say is that exactly the same process then continued right the way through up until the first century where the Jews did exactly the same thing and took their mythic figure, the Messiah, Joshua, Jesus, and transformed him likewise into this dying and resurrecting God-man. To his companions, Jesus of Nazareth was a man who taught the deepest truth. Were they agnostics? Mystics who fit his life and death into a Gnostic framework. Did Jesus become their symbol for a deeper message, an inner truth? A figure in an allegory through which you can be transformed uh, through initiation, and that at the end of that you can, you can come to gnosis or knowledge, this mystical state of, of enlightenment. Belief in the Jesus story was originally only a first step in Christian spirituality, the outer mystery. 
the significance was to be explained by an enlightened teacher when the student was spiritually ripe, a mystical knowledge of God beyond mere dogma. Although there are many great Christian mystics of later centuries who have intuitively seen through to this deeper symbolic level, as a culture we've kept only the outer mysteries. It seems to me we have kept the form, but we have lost the meaning. The only contemporary to write about him is the historian Josephus, and then only a few words which may have been even inserted much later. The Bible describes Jesus in most extensive detail, but the Gospels seem to vary and even contradict. Take the crucial moment when his believers hear their Lord has resurrected. Mark reports a man in white announcing it to three women. Luke has three men and three women encounter two angels. In Matthew, two women see one angel. And in John, only Mary Magdalena sees two angels. There's no consensus, in, even within the New Testament, on the form of the resurrection. Um, in the late second century, some argued that you had to believe not only that Jesus was somehow alive, but that it was actually a physical, corporeal resuscitation of his body. And that conviction has been enshrined in the creeds, but it's not part of the early Christian movement. It's very hard to speak about the historical Jesus, but the Gospels, they weren't written for that purpose, of course. They're not historical writings. They're written in the form of biography. But their purpose is not to tell us about the historical Jesus. It's to tell us about their convictions that this man was, was God's Messiah and to persuade us of that by all means possible. And so they are religious teachings, not historical writings. The Gospels are books of belief constructed to sound as though they're history. And the historicity of Jesus is a core element in the appeal to truth. Here, I'm telling you a true story. But it's highly unlikely that the Gospels are contemporary records. The Gospels were written in the cities of the Eastern Mediterranean. And in Greek, by educated men, not by the fishermen who are recorded as the followers of Jesus in the Gospels. And they were written decades after Christ, when the memory of his life and suffering was fading, around the time which came as a watershed, the Jewish rising and total destruction of Israel by Rome, annihilating anyone who might still have known Jesus himself. Mark, Luke and Matthew wrote their Gospels almost two generations after Jesus. The fourth, John's Gospel, came even almost three generations later, and they weren't the only Gospels. We know that there were many, many Gospels that, that followers of Jesus read, wrote, revered, and many other writings too. Letters, epistles, poems, hymns, and so forth. Today we look at Christianity and it looks very diverse. Everything from Baptist to Russian Orthodox to Calvinist, Roman Catholic, you know, an enormous range. But when you look at the first century, probably the range was even greater because there was no fixed canon of New Testament scriptures. There was no creed in, that was agreed upon by Christians throughout the world. And there was no specific structure. So what strikes me as fascinating is that the groups one sees as Christian are, if anything, more diverse than they are today. Jesus, his companions and first followers were Jews, Judaic Christians. What these original Christians, closest to the teachings of Jesus, thought has for many centuries been obscured, but now ancient documents have appeared which shed light on their beliefs. Gilles Quispel played a crucial role in opening them up to science, and what they reveal is stunning. The Judaic Christians were silent about the saving value of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. There is no virgin birth. 
No resurrection. No cross. But only just the words of Jesus, who is there, the embodiment of divine wisdom. A holy man, not a god, but a man of profoundest wisdom. They believed that Jesus was an enlightened enlightener, an illuminator. A man who showed the way to the divine. His first followers seemed to adhere to an altogether different religion. Basic concepts of later Christianity were strange to them. But well after the memory of Jesus had faded and those who remembered him had died, times came when Jesus Christ was iconized into God's only Son and ideas and rites arose which might have amazed Jesus and his companions. Celebrating his birth on the 24th or 25th of December comes from the birthday of the sun god Mithra because that is the solstice and that's the time when the sun is born again, the newborn sun. The birthday of, of the invincible sun god, celebrated by the Romans, uh, later was taken by Christians as the birthday of Jesus. It also becomes a miraculous divine birth. Well, it's very interesting, isn't it, that the miraculous conception of Jesus, the divine birth, the virgin birth, uh, is central, particularly for Catholics, as a part of Christian belief. But of course, in the Gospel of Mark, the earliest Gospel, the, none of this story is told, nor is it told in the Gospel of John. To those who believe in a God being born, divine birth and immaculate conception become central issues. But was Jesus born at the same time as the divine Christ was? That's an interesting question. Among ancient Christians, there was a real division of opinion as to when Jesus becomes divine. According to Mark, the Spirit of God descended on him as the Spirit descended on the prophets of old. And he became a, a person inspired by the Spirit. And at that point, a voice from heaven proclaimed him to be God's chosen one, in fact, his son. Divine insight came on Jesus when he was a man. To many Christians who cling to divine birth and the dogma of immaculate conception, it may come as a surprise that Jesus, in fact, had brothers. The Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus had brothers and sisters who were well known in their hometown. And I think later, uh, Christians became troubled by this. So they were taken to be the children of Joseph by a previous marriage. However, the Gospel of Mark suggests nothing of the kind. Jerusalem, this Armenian cathedral, was built over the remains of one of Jesus' brothers, James, though the church prefers not to call him that. This is a sanctuary in the name of Saint James, the brother of the Lord, who was a cousin to Jesus, by Joseph, and he was the first bishop of Jerusalem, and his remnant was under the main altar. Lately, this small sandstone coffin has come to light, marked James, son of Joseph, brother of Joshua, Jesus. Through this brother, one realizes something crucial about Jesus, for James was a key figure in Jerusalem of the time. James, the brother of Jesus, was the leader of the Jesus movement from the death of Jesus until 61. There's only one very brief paragraph in the historian Josephus writing at the end of the first century about the death of James. 
and it says quite clearly that a wildcat Sadducee high priest uh, assassinated James and was removed from his position as high priest by the majority of the priests who objected by the Pharisees who were the friends of James the brother of Jesus it is quite extraordinary because in this account the Pharisees are on the side of the Jesus movement not as they're reported in the Gospels as the enemies so the for 25 years or so, uh, the Jesus movement is a acknowledged Jewish movement associated with fervent Jews worshipping at the temple. And it's the destruction of the temple in 70 which knocks out the heart of the Jewish Jesus movement. But until then, most Christians in my book were Jews. Jews who had found their Messiah. All Jews hoped for the coming of a holy man, a Messiah. God would help with heavenly hosts to liberate the people of Israel from foreign oppression. But Jesus was a different Messiah. He taught that salvation can be found within oneself. The Gospel of Thomas suggests that, that Jesus is the illuminated one. Like a Buddha, he is the enlightened one, not different from anyone else, but one who has realized the deepest potential, the spiritual potential of human nature. Yes, according to the Jewish Christians, yes. But if you say that sounds like uh, the enlightenment of Buddha, I would say that you are right. I personally, I would say Jesus is for me, as a Christian, the light of the world. But the concept of an enlightened man is the same. A man of deepest wisdom, enlightened, but a man, no God. A son of God to Jews, as they considered other holy men. At what point, then, was he iconized into God's only begotten son, declared dogma, when the creed was formalized by Constantine 300 years later. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Of the four Gospels in the New Testament, of course, the latest to be written was the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is the only one that speaks of Jesus as a divine being, um, as himself divine, as, as God in human form, and particularly as the only begotten Son of God. It's quite a remarkable and radical view that one man was God incarnate. And startlingly, that unusual gospel, which actually in the early Christian movement I cannot find mentioned among Orthodox Christians before about the year 160, becomes the lens through which Christians later read all the Gospels. So many Christians today will think, well, of course, Christianity means Jesus is the Son of God. But that's not what you find in Matthew, Mark, or Luke so much. You find in those the teaching that Jesus is God's Messiah, the one who redeems his people, the one who, who teaches the way of righteousness. One could be a very devout Jew and follow Jesus at that point. But with the Gospel of John, the claim that Jesus is God's son, and more than that, his only son, that radical claim in the Gospel of John changes the understanding of the Christian message in a dramatic way. Rising debate over the nature of Jesus, whether a man or divine, transforms early Christianity as the movement widens a growing belief in the messenger more than the message. It may have changed Christianity more profoundly than the change brought about by another man who is usually seen as the great divide, Paul.
Paul was retrospectively constructed as the hero who founded, refounded the Christian church. But Paul always tried to recruit believers in the synagogue. Very sensible too, then the Jews knew half the story. But he was also willing to recruit Gentiles. The, 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 the radical break that Paul made was to allow non-Jews to eat with Jews and not follow kosher laws. And that was a radical break to be inclusive, to allow everyone to believe in Jesus. It was a fantastic step. Paul is a completely misconceived uh, character in history. Paul is, at the time of Paul, we would say that there is no split between Gnosticism and literalism because literalism hasn't developed. There is no literal Jesus at this time. Paul is existing before the literal story. He's writing before the gospel, and Paul is, doesn't have a gospel story. Paul's Christology is very, very unique and very spiritual. Paul, amazingly, says that he received his teaching from a revelation in which uh, a, a being of light appeared to him, and he was convinced it was Jesus. He knew little about him, but he then... talks about Jesus. He, he doesn't talk about Jesus, and he says if, if once we knew Jesus according to the flesh, that doesn't matter anymore now. What matters is, is the risen Christ. Paul says that Christ was revealed in me, not to me. What which does is, that mean? When he's talking, yes, I mean, this is fascinating. If he's talking about, you know, his, his vision of light, uh, he doesn't meet the Jesus that we're familiar with from the gospel story, who had a mother and father, and all of that is not important to Paul. What he meets is a being of light, just as exactly the pagans had met their gods as beings of, of light. And then when he talks about the great secret that, he, that, that, that has been revealed, is not that Jesus came, was born just down the road, and did all these miraculous things. What he says is, this is the great secret, Christ in you. And when he talks about Christ being revealed, it wasn't revealed to him, Christ was revealed in him. Now this is what makes Paul's Christianity so completely Gnostic and, and not Why? literal. What would true mean? Because the literalist approach is that Jesus is outside of you, God is outside of you, God is outside of the universe indeed. It's separate. Whereas the Gnostic approach and the ancient pagan approach of the mysteries is that all is one. If you could put it in a nutshell, it's just that. All is one. And so Christ is in you, you are in Christ. You can say it either way you like, but you can't divide it up. And that's what the literalist church does. How different the writings of Paul are becomes steadily more obvious through the sensational discovery of a horde of documents, unknown gospels, hidden when a Christian church on the rise persecuted their readers. Gnostic Gospels, discovered half a century ago in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. Misunderstood, maltreated at first, fall into the hands of black traders, scientists now realize what they imply. The books from Nag Hammadi are more important than the Dead Sea Scrolls because they throw a new light on the history of Christianity, on Jesus, and on God. By far the most important gospel was written by a Didymus Judas Thomas. Who was Didymus Judas Thomas? Didymus Judas Thomas was one of the brothers of Jesus. Later church tradition makes of Thomas the apostle who could not believe Jesus after his death came back in the flesh, resurrected as a physical body, wounds, stigmata and all. The doubting Thomas, who is now said to be the most faithful disciple of his master, who best understood his brother. According to the Gospel of Thomas, yes. The document described to Thomas, though written down later, 
is now believed to go back before the canonized Gospels and is thought to reflect closely the time when the teachings of Jesus were fresh and alive. I find it astonishing, really, that the Christians haven't run out everywhere and wanting to read the Gospel of Thomas and, and all these other marvelous scriptures which have come to light. And I think it says something about how powerful the hold of the Roman Church was, that it's still pushed outside, they're still regarded as heretical and dangerous. And of course, they are. They are heretical and they are dangerous from the perspective of the literalist church because they turn the understanding of the literalist church inside out. They tell us about a variety of ways in which people believed that you could find salvation by contemplating, by expanding the divine spark that's buried in each of us, communicating with God by searching inside one's own soul, an individual pursuit of the divine without the help of priests or bishops. Sounds attractive. Gnosticism is amazingly attractive. Uh, I think particularly attractive to the modern mind because it, it sells a religion for the individual, not a religion brought about by a church. I think it's all out. I think this is what humans have always looked for, yearned for, to try and find divinity by themselves. But that's to oversimplify because it is also extraordinarily complicated. In many ways, if you read it, it's like having a bath in a thousand soap, soap bubbles and getting the soap into your eyes. It's blinding, it's obscuring, as well as cleansing. It was already there in the Egyptian religion when they said 3,000 before Christ that man, after his life, became Osiris. He was integrated into the Godhead. It was the basic concept of all mysteries that existed in the Roman Hellenistic world. The mysteries of Isis, of Mithras, of Adonis, everything. That was the idea. There was in man a divine spark hidden unconsciously in him. And that was to be awakened by the initiation which led ultimately to transformation. How did it get lost? Well, that is very simple. The Catholics had the bulldozer, and the rabbis had the bulldozer too. And that summarizes in a few words the whole history of Christianity and Judaism. You know, if you want to build a church, you have to say that, no, salvation is only possible by, with, from, and through the church and, and God's representative on, on earth who is the Pope. And that is the only way. Whereas the Gnostics are very much, it's, it's, it's about you, you can do it right now, right here, and you don't need the authority of the bishop. If you want to understand what Christianity is actually about and what paganism is actually about, is to understand that it's a journey of self-knowledge. And what they're looking for is the part of you which cannot die. It's, it's not that you're going to be granted something you don't already have. It's discovering that you are already immortal because your essence is not the body. We mistake ourselves as these individual bodies with all of the problems that come with that. And the whole of the story is we need to die to the identity of the body, which is on the cross of matter, and we need to resurrect to our true identity, which is the Son of God, which is the, the Christ or the Osiris Dionysus. In that sense, we are all sons of God. We are all sons of God if we realize our true identity. And in that sense, the whole myth, the whole story of the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection is a model to all and each of us. A model, we yes, it precisely. It's a model which, which can take you through this initiation. For the Gnostics, their whole quest was a continuation of the pagan quest. Know thyself was written over the, at the Oracle of Delphi. And this was the quest of Plato and of Socrates and to know what you... And the Gnostics continued that quest. 
and by its nature it was difficult you had to go through the experience there was no no way you could bypass it now once you've got it turned into a religion which is pretty much off the shelf all you have to do is believe that this person has done it for you and you will get to heaven you just have to believe in, in Jesus and you will get to heaven for the Gnostics it's actually about becoming Christ yourself with all of the suffering and effort that that involves a completely different religion and one can see I mean having studied Gnosticism one can see why Christianity triumphed it was kind of inevitable catastrophe which almost wiped out mankind was there something like a flood something that went on before it from the middle ages rises the myth of the holy grail king arthur and his round table was there something like a grail a symbol for the church or for opponents which it feared peoples and gods of the Andes. How could the mightiest empire of its time fall for a handful of Spanish conquerors? The secret of the Incas and the lost war against time. The golem, the secrets of Kabbalah, Jewish myth, or man's longing to shape life and imitate the act of God. Ark of the Covenant, embodiment of God, its sudden disappearance is one of the greatest mysteries from the Bible. Is the Ark still somewhere? From a nightmare rose a monster dreadful. How dare you touch him? That man belongs to me! <sighs> How from fantasy and frustration, author Bram Stoker created a being which would become a myth. May traverse the Milky Way. Osiris, Isis, Horus, the quest for eternity and life after death, prototype for Christianity? The myths of ancient Egypt still reverberate today. second century of Christianity. This is a time when Christianity had not yet formulated its iconography or its symbols or even its myth. This in a sense represents the underworld, the tenebrous regions where it initiates and make contact with the divinities. It is light getting into darkness and finding a way into the afterlife. The portals of immortality, they were to death, and therefore the initiates, perhaps with no torches whatsoever, would come here and imbue the uh, mood of the place. They were, they were that close, they believed, where one can transit from life, death, and rebirth. The people who came here were early Christians, and yet they were the link between the ancient Egyptian mystery cults and the Gnostic religion. We see Anubis, we see early Christians perform the rituals of the ancient Egyptians. Today we look at Christianity and it looks very diverse. Everything from Baptist to Russian Orthodox to Calvinist, Roman Catholic, you know, an enormous range. But when you look at the first century, probably the range was even greater because there was no fixed canon of New Testament scriptures. There was no creed. 
in, that was agreed upon by Christians throughout the world, and there was no specific structure. So what strikes me as fascinating is that the groups one sees as Christian are, if anything, more diverse than they are today. We know that there were many, many Gospels that, that followers of Jesus read, wrote, revered, and many other writings too. Letters, epistles, poems, hymns, and so forth. Christians look back upon the beginning of the faith with a sense of nostalgia. A time when the words of Jesus and his apostles still rang true, when the creed was clear, its contents undisputed. But now documents have been discovered which shed a different light on those beginnings. If Christianity today worships Jesus as God's only begotten Son who died to redeem us from our sins, the first followers of Jesus almost seem to adhere to a different creed. The Judaic Christians were silent about the saving value of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. They believed that Jesus was an enlightened enlightener, an illuminator. There is no virgin or birth, no resurrection. No cross, but only just the words of Jesus, who is there, the embodiment of divine wisdom. Jesus of Nazareth, man or myth, those who walked with him didn't seem to remember him as God's only begotten son. They perished in the Holocaust, which came from the Jewish rising against Rome. Do the Gospels from our Bible paint him as clearly? They were written two, three generations after Christ in cities elsewhere in the Mediterranean when another image emerged, that of Jesus, the Son of God. But a different memory still lingered. The Middle Ages, the south of France, Briefly and for the last time, a different faith stands up again of Christians with another view of Christ. People the church considers heretics, worse than devils. For decades, the fury of the church raises against these Gnostic Christians. Crusading armies decimate the population. The Inquisition is invented to burn out these Cathars, as they call themselves, those purified, the pure. After many centuries, people now start remembering these Cathars and visit the places where they suffered. The Cathars were not forerunners of the Reformation. They were not a heresy of the Catholic faith. This was a faith that was completely different and went back to the earliest times of Christianity and even before that when people experienced this world as a world of shadows, turned with their back towards reality, towards the true world. Man bound, unable to turn, believing the shadows he sees on the wall in front of him are reality, shadows cast by the real divine world that goes on behind him. That is how the Greek philosopher Plato described man. Initiates of ancient mystery religions believed they could shed the ropes that bound them and find gnosis, knowledge felt in the heart, secret knowledge that transforms man and makes him become aware of the true spiritual world. They are called Gnostics. Scholars begin to recognize that quest also in earliest Christianity before our Gospels were written, in the words of Paul, who speaks of finding Christ within, inside yourself. And in other ancient documents, found almost 60 years ago in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. The books from Nag Hammadi are more important than the Dead Sea Scrolls, because they show a new light 
on the history of Christianity, on Jesus, and on God. The discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library by two Egyptian peasants brought about a fundamental change in our understanding of early Christianity. Here we had 52 new manuscripts telling us about early Christianity. They were probably associated with Egyptian Christian monastery. Books were buried to evade a wood-burning expedition in the middle of the 4th century. It's just given us a whole wealth of information, and I find it astonishing, really, that the Christians haven't run out everywhere and wanting to read the Gospel of Thomas and, and all these other marvellous scriptures which have come to light. And I think it says something about how powerful the hold of the Roman Church was, whether it's still pushed outside, they're still regarded as heretical and dangerous. And of course, in, they are. They are heretical and they are dangerous from the perspective of the literalist church because they turn the understanding of the literalist church inside out. They tell us about a variety of ways in which people believed that you could find salvation by contemplating, by expanding the divine spark that's buried in each of us, communicating with God by searching inside one's own soul, an individual pursuit of the divine without the help of priests or bishops. Sounds attractive. Gnosticism is amazingly attractive. Uh, I think particularly attractive to the modern mind because it, it sells a religion for the individual, not a religion brought about by a church. I think it's all out. I think this is what humans have always looked for, yearned for, to try and find divinity by themselves. But that's to oversimplify because it is also extraordinarily complicated. In many ways, if you read it, it's like having a bath in a thousand soap, soap bubbles and getting the soap into your eyes. It's blinding, it's obscuring, as well as cleansing. It was already there in the Egyptian religion when they said that man, after his life, became Osiris. He was integrated into the Godhead. Man is a fallen god that remembers heaven. That is the concept of all mysteries of antiquity, of Isis, of Mithras, of Adonis, everything. The central point of Gnosticism is that each of us is born with a divine spark inside us. And the duty of the believer is to try to find that divine spark, to get into touch with God by looking inside ourselves. Gnosis means self-knowledge. What is self-knowledge? Ecstasy. Psychoanalysis. What is it? It's very difficult to explain what self-knowledge is and how to, how to come by it. It's not like psychoanalysis. It's not an intellectual exploration of the soul. It's not ecstasy. It's quiet contemplation by oneself, sometimes with the help of a leader, of who you are and how God made you, what God is like. It's a, it's a quietist, it's a single individual self-searching. Gnosticism or mysticism is that we're stuck in our ideas about what life is and about who we are. And coming down into an environment like this knocks you out of your ordinary mindset. You're face to face with perhaps the greatest mystery, death. The idea that you will cease to exist as a physical form 
and it pushes you out of your ideas into a direct encounter with the absolute mystery from which everything comes, the mystery that we are, the mystery that it is. But why seek this in this darkness and these corridors? I think it triggers the mystical experience with uh, excitement of, of darkness and light and candles and the, the echoing chambers. It's all part of putting you into that mystical state. As Aristotle says about the mysteries, you don't go there to learn something, you go there to experience something. If you think of it as just being an intellectual process, you're missing the point. It's something far grander than that. I think the, the, the ancients had understood that you can know a lot, but not really have self-knowledge. When we learn something, we're learning many things. It becomes very complex. What the ancients are seeking is a return from the manyness of things, knowledge about many things to knowledge of one thing, of the unity of all things. For most of two millennia, Gnosis was suppressed. We mainly knew about it from the fulminations of church fathers, but the find of Nag Hammadi in 1945 forever changes the way we look upon the origins of Christianity. The men who found it discarded it at first. They fell into the hands of black traders, some were burnt, but eventually it found its way to science, also thanks to Gilles Quispel, who hit upon the most important manuscripts somewhere in Europe and brought it to his friends, the great psychologist Carl Jung. They now gather dust in a small room in Cairo, opened maybe once in ten years and only in the company of an officer of the museums, the police, the secret police and a judge. Quispel is most welcome, all of the Nag Hammadi manuscripts were published when he gave back the most precious one, the Gospel of Thomas, with the words of Jesus. It starts with the word Dies and the words that Jesus, the living, spoke. And Didymus Judas Thomas wrote. And he said, whoever finds the explanation of these words, will not taste death. Who was Didymus Judas Thomas? Didymus Judas Thomas, which means Judas the twin, was one of the brothers of Jesus. Later church tradition turned Thomas into the apostle who could not believe Jesus came back in the flesh, stigmata and all. Doubting Thomas, who is now said to be the most faithful disciple of his mother. Who best understood his brother. According to the Gospel of Thomas, yes. He's understood not to be Jesus' twin brother on a literal level, but rather that, that whoever reads this Gospel is to understand that he or she can come to recognize himself as Jesus' twin. Gospel of Thomas say? Well, the Gospel of Thomas is, is a collection of sayings which promises to reveal something. And what it says it will reveal is what, what no ear has heard, heard. Hear, no, no eye has seen, seen, what no hand has touched, touched, and what has never occurred to the human mind. What is it? Well, it's you. You are the thing you can't hear, see, your essence, consciousness itself. And I think this is the key thing, if you want to understand what Christianity is actually about and what paganism is actually about, is to understand that it's a journey of self-knowledge. And this was the great injunction which the god Apollo gave to the pagans at the uh, Oracle of Delphi, to search for the gnosis, self-knowledge, know yourself. And the same with the Christians. And what they're looking for is the part of you which cannot die. It's, it's not that you're going to be granted something you don't already have. It's discovering that you are already immortal because your essence is not the body. If you discover what you really are, you discover God. You discover the divine. You discover God within. You appear to be a body, 
but you are consciousness. And the consciousness witnesses birth, witnesses death, in fact, many times over, because all of the Gnostics, including the Christian Gnostics, believed in reincarnation. And this process happened a bit like waking up and going to sleep. You were in a cycle of different bodies coming and going. But you were not ever the body. You were with a consciousness which witnessed this. So you were never born and couldn't possibly die. All separate things are an expression of one thing. So all human beings are images, or the word they use is idolo. They are an image of the one daemon or spirit. A reflection of the divine. Not a reflection so much as the divine become conscious of itself. Become conscious. They use the term for the father of the dazzling darkness. If you imagine light with nothing to reflect on, it's dark. So light in itself it is dark, and they use this term dazzling darkness. Pure potentiality, just light, just consciousness, with nothing to be conscious of. When that creates for itself something to be conscious of, or something, or as light, something to reflect on, the universe comes into being. Now, this one consciousness of God expresses itself in all conscious beings. So, all of us are images, idolons, of the one consciousness of the uni that, it, that is the universe, that is everything, which is God. Christian myth as we have it, on the contrary, emphasizes a deep gulf between man and God. God is God, and we are mere mortals. Now, the Gospel of Thomas has a very different message. It speaks of Jesus as Son of God and speaks of all other humans as also the children of God who may not be aware of that because they are not aware of being created in the image of God, the divine light that came into being before the universe was created when God said, let there be light. Humankind was made in the image of that light. And in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus speaks as the voice from the light. Why are the words from Thomas' Gospel, look under any stone and you shall find me, so dangerous for the church? Well, I think it's because it's, it's pantheistic. It is suggesting that divinity is everywhere and in all things. What happens with the Christian triumph is, well, you know, what you would expect in the creation of a church. In order to get to God, you have to go through the bishop. You know, if you want to build a church, you have to say that no, salvation is only possible by, with, from, and through the church and, and God's representative on, on earth who is the Pope. And that is the only way. Whereas the Gnostics are very much, it's, it's, it's about you, you can do it. This was the revelation of the Gnosis, was that your essence, by its very nature, is immortal. So you didn't have to win it by being a good boy, by obeying the rules. This is why the Gnostics are quite anarchistic. They're quite, they're free thinkers, they're libertines. They don't go for obeying rules. And of course their great hero, Jesus, is portrayed in their story as a libertine <laughs> who hangs out with prostitutes and hangs out with disreputable people. Who breaks the rules, who does the wrong thing on the Sabbath. And who constantly attacks the religious authorities and is in dispute with them. He's a classic Gnostic character, and they were like that themselves. Because of this, because for them it's not about being obeying rules. For them it's about discovering self-knowledge, what you really are. In Thomas, the message is more important than the messenger. It stems from a time before the Gospels of the Bible, as does a man long considered a founder of the faith, but now beginning to be seen in a different light, Paul. Paul is a Gnostic. He is talking about the Christ within. He's talking about immortality in the mystery school teaching because Paul is existing before the literal story. Paul is a completely misconceived character in history. At the time of Paul, we would say that there is no split between Gnosticism and literalism because literalism hasn't developed. There is no literal Jesus at this time. 
one, two generations later, the Gospels of the Bible recount the life of Jesus in detail. The messenger becomes almost more important than the message, and Jesus comes to be the literal Son of God. But before that, Paul, under layers of later adaptations and insertions, still talks of Jesus as a mystery, a metaphor, a voice within. Gnostic Christians believed that Paul was their teacher. The father of the church, Tertullian, who despised Gnostics, nevertheless called Paul the apostle to the heretics, because the heretics, he thought, love Paul. They all quote Paul. They all claim Paul, because his teaching is so mysterious, in some ways so deep. It is the God of the Old Testament of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, a jealous God. All their stories seem to revolve around a deep dissatisfaction with the present world because it was created by an inferior God. How could a perfect God have created this place? So the story they tell repeatedly is how that this world is a mistake. It's created because God's, the true God's, youngest daughter, wisdom, a girl, Sophia, fell madly in love with her father. And out of this, out of the frustration of this illicit love, she self-created. She became, she impregnated herself. And the misbegotten child inside her, she aborted. And this aborted, misshapen, lion-faced son, Yaldabaoth, the king of kings, out of an arrogant supposition that he was once ejected from heaven, the soul God created or miscreated this world, this physical world. So this world was created out of an illicit passion in grief by Yaldabaoth, whom Jews and Christians falsely worship as the true God. This God imprisoned man in matter, wrapped his divine eternal soul in a body which was mortal. Creator of this physical world, he created man in his image, forever slave to matter, trying to accumulate more and more. The good God, the true God, out of the kindness of his mercy, sent Jesus to redeem humanity from the mistaken ideas of the Aldabaoth. When these Jews of Alexandria had become Christians, Jesus appealed to their deepest selves. They said, who knows himself knows God. Whether man, myth or metaphor, in the figure of Jesus lay also the seed of dissent, Around his person, a battle of ideas ensued that would drive the two views apart. Certainly, one of the greatest struggles that the followers of Jesus had to contend with was the question of why Jesus died in the dreadful way that he did. And in these Orthodox communities, the only way they could make religious sense out of it is to speak of it as an atonement sacrifice. But it could only be important as an atonement sacrifice if everyone needed atonement for sin. So Christians developed the idea that everyone must have sinned dreadfully beyond the capacity of, of making any atonement of any kind. And therefore that God's own Messiah uh, died as an atonement sacrifice for the sin of the world became a very compelling way of understanding his crucifixion. It brought a crucial new element into the relationship between man and the divine, sin. The central element in the Christian message, its lever, is the degree to which it instills guilt, that God is there watching, knowing not only what we do, but what we think. I think Christianity is quite exceptional in the degree to which 
the all-seeing God observes and punishes, is said to punish, believers for faults of thought, for sins of the mind. Sin and guilt gave rise to a creed in which hell became imaginable, fear of God and admonishments of priests. It was not an idea the Gnostics wished to share. The word sinner doesn't figure in that dictionary. The Gospel of Thomas speaks not so much of the discontinuity between God and ourselves, but of humans created in the divine image, and therefore having a sort of innate connectedness, affinity with the divine. Man is a fallen God that remembers heaven. That is the concept of all mysteries of antiquity and also of Gnosis. The word sin doesn't find a place. That doesn't mean, of course, that we're sinless or divine, but rather that, that we can find our way to God when we find our way to ourselves. And for what sins we commit or what wrongs we do, there are means of redress. But to make sin so essential that Jesus had to die to redeem us, argument focused on an ancient myth, Adam and Eve, and the first sin which made man mortal. Christians dwell upon the sinfulness of Eve, the wicked woman, much more than just. Before Orthodox Christianity, sin hadn't been such an issue. Jewish rabbis, pagans, Gnostic teachers basically agreed that we have in us the capacity to follow or to disobey God. We have the good impulse and the evil impulse. And that was understood to be a human condition. There's a great debate about it because some Christians thought it was crazy. This is eating an apple, one mind of disobedience, and for that millennia of Christians are condemned by God to an inferior existence rather than living in paradise. It's a completely disproportionate punishment. Only in later Christianity, that idea of inherent human sinfulness, original sin, develops especially by Augustine in the fourth century. So in these orthodox communities, one develops a strong sense not only of the distance between God and humankind, but of the innate and irredeemable sinfulness of the human condition, apart from this death of Christ now understood as sacrifice. But the conventional Christianity, the canonical Christianity, which didn't become established until the second century, was much disputed. And so some Christians thought that Jesus was a divine figure and that it was completely inappropriate for him to have suffered on the cross. And they told stories which justified their beliefs. For example, when Jesus was being brought up to Golgotha after being flogged, it was obviously weak from the flogging, the soldiers got Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross. And Jesus, seeing this as a perfect opportunity, swapped identities with Simon of Cyrene so that it was Simon looking like Jesus who was crucified, while Jesus, looking like Simon, slunk off in the crowd, went up to heaven, and hovered above the cross, laughing at the success of his deception. Or laughing as a Buddha is laughing, laughing, smiling, passively, because of the calm and peace that Jesus has from knowing and from illuminating us, giving us his knowledge. Jesus, an illuminator, the voice, the symbol of the divine. And Gnostics saw Jesus as the man who received divine insight at baptism when he became like a Buddha, he who knows, the Christ. Orthodox Christians took it literally. If Jesus was divine, he was God's son, his only begotten son. He also had to be born divine, which Gnostics considered a childish, naive notion. The split becomes apparent with the latest gospel in the Bible, John. 
Many Christians today will think, well, of course, Christianity means Jesus is the Son of God. But that's not what you find in Matthew, Mark, or Luke so much. You find in those the teaching that Jesus is God's Messiah, the one who redeems his people, the one who, who teaches the way of righteousness. One could be a very devout Jew and follow Jesus at that point. But with the Gospel of John, the claim that Jesus is God's Son, and more than that, his only Son, that radical claim, which actually I cannot find mentioned among Orthodox Christians before about the year 160, becomes the lens through which Christians later read all the Gospels. I began to be convinced, it sounds bizarre, that the Gospel of John is written to, to counter this other view. And it changes the understanding of the Christian message in a dramatic way. Jesus, the literal Son of God and only begotten one. But to Gnostics, Jesus was a metaphor, a symbol for the divine that hides in all of us. In that sense, we are all sons of God. We are all sons of God if we realize our true identity. Whilst we don't, we are in a state of death. Now, this is fascinating, I think. The, in the ancient world, this is the underworld. We now are dead. For the, for the Gnostics, for the mystics, this is the underworld in which we are the spiritually dead because we think we're the body, and we're not. We are God, if you like. We are the one consciousness of the universe. We must stake ourselves as these individual bodies with all of the problems that come with that. What we need to do is we need to resurrect. And the whole of the story is we need to die to the identity of the body, uh, which is on the cross of matter, and we need to resurrect to our true identity, which is the Son of God, which is the, the Christ, the consciousness of the Father. So we are all Christ, and we all need to resurrect. And in that sense, the whole myth, the whole story of the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection is a model to all and each of us. Yes, it precisely. It's a model which can take you through this initiation. Again, this difference with the literalist Christians, very quickly this becomes the rather macabre idea that, that at the end of time somehow you will resurrect into your body and will be a physical body again. Because that's what they think happened to Jesus. It's a natural curve. He came back in his physical body, having died literally, and that's literally what will happen to you. And that, or if it will happen to you if you understand the Christian message. The Gnostics, of course, are saying the complete opposite. If you don't understand the Christian message, you will come back into a body through reincarnation. If you do understand the Christian message, you will realize that you are not the body in the first place, that you are the Christ. We are all one, and there will be no need to go through this circle of reincarnation. Almost a different faith, an opposite approach. Which came first? Which was the origin? We have the literalist Christian Polycarp. A few decades later, um, in the middle of the second century, we have Tertullian saying that the followers of the Gnostics fill the universe. So you get this idea, actually, rather than this uh, literalist church, which is the traditional picture, of course, that the literalist church followed from the apostles, the Peter and all those characters, and that the Gnostics were a much later deviation, they kind of went pagan. What we're suggesting is actually it's completely the other way around. Gnostic Christianity was widespread in the first and second centuries and was crushed by a literalist church which turned on its origin. Orthodoxy, as we know it, arose after Gnosticism and to a large extent Orthodoxy was a reaction. It defined itself by what it is not. Christianity defines itself by what it opposes. By opposing Gnosticism, it gradually defined its own terms. From a wide variety of dozens of Gospels and writings, and seven or eight generations after Jesus lived, early Orthodox Church Fathers began selecting the few which would shape the New Testament and define the creed. I think it's in the face of terrible danger, the threat of persecution that, that impelled concerned Christian leaders to try to find the basic teachings on which they felt all could agree. 
In this selection, overt Gnostic views, elements too complicating for a literalist view of Jesus, were laid aside. In the figure of Jesus, for instance, we get that the, the, the phrase which is plastered over more churches, I expect, than any other phrase, which no one comes to the Father but by me, uh, which in the hands of Gnostics is the teaching that to come to God, you have to go through what this figure represents in you. And this is Paul's message. To come to God, you have to find the Christ within as an allegory of truth. But it's literalism which goes, no, this is the only way. And I think once you have this idea of a literal incarnation of the Son of God, not a mythic incarnation of the Son of God, then the correlate of that is that for, for their own good, you must save other, the souls of others, and everyone must be led to believe this, or forced to believe this indeed, for their own good. So you get a divine injunction to be authoritarian. The debate was very peculiar. Christians took everything personally because that is the nature of Christianity. But when you personalize divinity, you bring to divinity all the anger, judgments, resentment, and aggression that exists in human personality. Heretic! Christians got violently upset because they took it personally that their savior was being denied. Gnostics just wanted to find out what was the truth. The difficulty Gnostics face is that because they are individually searching for salvation by themselves, they're not organized, they're, they're, dis they're, they're not united. Gnostics, they attacked the views of the early Christians. The Christians did not simply attack the views of the Gnostics in return, they attacked the Gnostics themselves. Both views might still have existed side by side, but for the appearance of this man, Constantine, first Roman emperor to embrace Christianity, in whose wake the young church reaches for power supreme. The story goes that Constantine had a vision, a dream, in which he saw the sign of the cross in the sky, and he was convinced that if he became a Christian and used this emblem for his troops, he would win a battle against his rival pagan emperor. It's here at the Milvian Bridge that a great battle was fought which started Christianity on its triumphant road to success. The Council of Nicaea 324. Emperor Constantine settles all differences about the creed. But our ministers one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God from God. Three centuries life, after he lived, God, Jesus is proclaimed God, to be the Son of God, God by imperial decree. All other opinions are forbidden. When Christianity allies with the state to create a religious monopoly, that's when Christianity becomes radically different. One would say triumphant, successful. But for the fact that once the church is allied with the state, it begins to commit the very crimes that it has complained about for the first 300 years of its existence. It persecutes, it kills for religion. It has to become a hierarchical, oppressive institution. Of course, you could defend it and say it's in the interests of the masses that a particular brand of religion is forced on But it's not my fantasy or my imagination of how religion best proceeds. It's interesting, isn't it, that soon after his conversion, the Emperor Constantine gave glorious gifts to the churches at Rome. St. Peter's and St. John Lateran here, solid, life-size statues of Jesus and the apostles, so that soon, Christian churches looked exactly like pagan temples. And this is merely one straw in the wind of the wealth that the church acquires throughout the first century. Is the church corrupted? Yes. 
doesn't it preserve a sense of its origins, the sense of the importance of poverty? Yes. So the church is split between the poverty and abstinence of the monks and the wealth of the bishops. But even then the bishops maintain a sense, a memory of charity, of virtue, the best of them. So it's always torn, it always has this tension inside it. Jesus, whatever else he did, did not set up a church, left no instructions for a, for a church. It's a later fiction designed to bolster the power of the Catholic Church. It's simply inconceivable that Jesus, a simple man from Galilee, set out to found a universal church. What happened with Jesus handing over authority to Peter? Well, again, these legends are so fictitious that they didn't make it into the New Testament, like the donation of Constantine. The donation of Constantine is a fake. This was a document which was claimed by the, by the Roman Church in the medieval period to be the contract written out by Constantine on his deathbed, here, I give you the empire for safekeeping. Now, when this was revealed to be a forgery, this started the whole Protestant Reformation. In some ways, all that Peter and I have done is listen to the losers. They were destroyed in the fourth century. We've gone back and said, well, just because they lost that battle, just because the Roman church with its idea of an historical Jesus and a literalist religion took over, doesn't mean that they, they've got the accurate version of events. What happened to the losers? Well, they were eradicated. Everybody who knew the different story, which is the Gnostics, the pagans, were banished from the empire. The temples were pulled down, the philosophers were killed, were banished, the books were burned. I mean, if Christianity was God's favourite religion, then you would have thought when it triumphed, we would have entered a golden age. But instead, we entered the dark ages when people forgot even how to make brick houses. And we had to wait until the Renaissance, when all this pagan learning came back in, in Italy, in Florence. The books of Plato, which had been banished for a thousand years, came back. The Hermetica, and suddenly Botticelli was painting pictures of pagan gods, and we call it the rebirth, the rebirth of Western culture, because this is, this is when we got back to the place we had been before Christianity triumphed. Belief in the Jesus story was originally only a first step in Christian spirituality, the outer mystery. The significance was to be explained by an enlightened teacher when the student was spiritually ripe, a mystical knowledge of God beyond mere dogma. Although there are many great Christian mystics of later centuries who have intuitively seen through to this deeper symbolic level, as a culture, we've kept only the outer mysteries. It seems to me we have kept the form, but we have lost the meaning. As churches become empty, people seek elsewhere, sometimes as far as the other side of the world, not realizing an ancient tradition which sought the same lies deep within our past and addresses similar people. Certain fathers of the church, like Irenaeus in his famous five volumes against the heretics, are attempts to identify Gnostics and say they're really not Christians, they're heretics. They're, they have special characteristics, first of all. They love to read and interpret scripture. Second, they, they look to their own intuitions, revelations, and dreams and believe that they are receiving intimations about the divine. Um, third, they are constantly seeking. They're continually open to new exploration. Now, one could have said the same about people that are called New Age, but certainly philosophers were expected to inquire and keep asking. Asking, one finds a tradition eradicated, interrupted for many, many centuries, complicated for us today, sometimes bewildering. All of this is pretty difficult to comprehend for modern man. Dear friend, there is no shortcut to Gnosis and no instant Nirvana. 
He made me laugh with that, the old gentleman. And he was right, of course. <laughs> Every great world religious tradition, whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, has both the teaching for everyone, exoteric teaching, which every adherent of that faith is supposed to follow, and esoteric or mystical teaching. The only one that lacks that, in a way, is Western Christianity. I think it's unfortunate that that path, which many people find necessary for their own integrity and development, has been regarded as uh, either heretical or a path we know of. Who was Jesus? Is he a historical character? Who wrote the Gospels? Why are they written in Greek? Why did they have a pro-Roman perspective? Why was the religion headquartered in Rome? Those were the mysteries that I saw about the Gospels. The origin of the Christian religion has been a subject steeped in mystery for nearly 2,000 years. Joseph Atwell is one of a number of scholars today from all around the world who are questioning the historic facts behind these ancient mysteries. When examining the actual history of this era, many of the answers provided by the church and Christian scholars do not hold up to rigorous scrutiny. This is really important for our culture, to understand where Christianity came from. No doubt Christians have done a lot of good for the world. But then there are other Christians, often the most dogmatic, who create wars, hatred, and other harm under the disguise of religion. In studying how Christianity emerged, many of our scholars agree that it was used as a political tool to control the masses of the day, and it is still being used this way today. The problem is that Christianity has been used as a tool by government that uses the goodness in people against them. For example, support for the wars in the Middle East has been preached to evangelical Christians as a way to speed up the end of days. This is just one example of the way that propaganda is used to control and manipulate the populace. Actually, according to my study of the ancient texts, the second coming of the Christ has already occurred. Maybe we need to expand the possible answers about how Christianity originated, and deeper questions need to be asked. Maybe we need to examine what political motives were behind the formation of the Christian religion. I think it's a requirement of alert citizens to know how the Gospels were written, why they were written, who produced them, what was the purpose and back of all this. This is good citizenry. Everyone should be involved in this. Today, we live on the brink of an immense paradigm shift. And this modern time is very parallel to the era in which Christianity emerged. Studying this ancient era can give us the perspective needed for coming up with solutions to today's problems and for helping create the better world that we envision.
and the penny drop. The penny drop that Jesus, as a human being, never existed. The presentation of the Jesus character, it's somewhat of a composite of many messianic leaders of the time. Well, let's just go back to the drawing board and uh, we'll leave aside all of the assumptions of Christian history and let's just look at the text afresh and consider every possibility. Let's, uh, let's open the whole game up. Can you think that Christianity is really paganism by a different name? Uh, now it feels completely obvious. Some of us are saying that this was a sun god turned into a Jewish man. In all of this, we're dealing with literature. We're not dealing with history. So the answer is no, there is no um, history to this character of Jesus. It's entirely a literary creation. Some of our Bible scholars are mavericks, working outside the restrictions of mainstream religious institutions. This allows them the freedom to provide fresh insights and draw some startling conclusions about how Christianity was formed. I began reading a number of books on the subject. This turned into a decade-long research. For Joseph Atwell, the key was in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only Jewish literature ever discovered from the first century AD or CE, the time that Jesus would have been preaching among the Jews. The characters in the Dead Sea Scrolls were militaristic, and you could see that this movement wanted to push the foreigners out of Israel. They were fundamentalists, whereas the characters in the gospel are different. They are pacifistic. They are turning the other cheek. They're giving to Caesar what is Caesar's. How did a movement like Christianity come to exist in a region that was occupied by Roman soldiers and had Jewish zealots within it that were going to push these Romans out? How was that possible? I began studying the other two major works of the era, the New Testament and Wars of the Jews by Josephus, a Roman court historian who described the war between the Romans and the Jews in the first century. While reading these works side by side, I noticed an amazing connection between them. Certain events from the ministry of Jesus seem to closely parallel episodes from the military campaign of Roman Caesar Titus Flavius, a campaign which took place 40 years after Jesus supposedly lived. My efforts to understand these connections led me to an incredible discovery. Christianity had been invented by a little-known family of Roman Caesars, the Flavians. And they left us documents to prove it. The Flavians uh, are not a household name, and yet it's the Flavians who completely reshaped the Roman Empire. In Rome, of course, there's the, there's the Colosseum, which is uh, understood to be the best known monument of the ancient Roman Empire, perhaps. The Colosseum is, in fact, a Flavian construction produced during the Flavian period. It's under the Flavians that both rabbinic Judaism and Christianity take shape. Why would the Flavians be interested in creating religions? Much like today, their era was marked by political power struggles, a bankrupt economy, religious conflicts, and endless wars. In the midst of this turmoil, the Flavians seized control of the Roman Empire and ushered in an immense paradigm shift. To understand the Flavians' rise to power, we need to go back to the reign of the previous powerful rulers, the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Beginning with Julius Caesar in the year 49 BCE, the Julio-Claudians ruled Rome for over a hundred years, transforming the government from a republic into an empire. This family contained all the famous Caesars. Julius, who predated the time of Jesus, Augustus, who was Caesar at the time of Jesus' supposed birth, Tiberius, who ruled during Jesus' supposed death, followed by the infamous Caligula, then Claudius, and ending the Julio-Claudian dynasty with Nero. 
whose reign begins in 54 CE. The Julio-Claudians enjoyed a godlike status until the family degenerated and began to damage the Roman Empire. By the time of Nero, his famous decadence was bankrupting the empire, and the Jews of Judea were staging a huge rebellion against their Roman rulers. Judea was one of the many conquered provinces that made up the Roman Empire. This region, which was also known as Palestine, was controlled by a family that served as Rome's tax collector, the Herods. They were a Greco-Arab family, somewhat possibly Judaized, though only Judaized when it was convenient to please the subjects they were given, who were put in power in Palestine and destroyed the previous Jewish ruling family, the Maccabean family, root and stalk. Besides being heavily taxed and ruled by a non-Jewish family put in power by Rome, the Jews were further inflamed by the requirement that a statue of the Caesar be placed for worship in every temple throughout the empire. In the Roman Empire, you could pretty much have any god you want, but legally, you had to submit to the emperor as a god as well. You had to at least acknowledge that the, uh, the Roman leader was also a divine figure. But the Jews would not have any of it. It's fundamental to Jewish belief that you shall make no graven images. It's one of the, the commandments um, given at Sinai um, by God. So the Jews never made representations of God. The Jews had a very different type of religion. They had a religion which was much more focused on the book and less focused upon cultic statues. This presented a real problem for the Romans. They tried to install statues of Caesar, but uh, the Jews weren't going to buy that at all. In fact, it aggravated them. It enraged them. And the, the Romans really, I, I think, didn't understand this. It's not statues, it's books. And those books contain what are known as the Jewish messianic prophecies. The thing that most moved the Jews' revolt against Rome was an obscure prophecy from among their writings that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. Holy books inspired the Jews to expect a redeemer who would redeem Israel, rescue Israel, restore Israel to power and leadership in the world. The Messiah that the literature described was a warrior. The Messiahs would have claimed the same attributes that David did. David could overcome any army because God gave him the power to do it. If you had the power of God, you could easily defeat the Roman army. The people rebelled against Rome and were led by a messianic movement that had a series of messiahs that had come forward to fight against the Roman Empire. The Hebrew word messiah is translated into Greek as Christos or Christ, so the title of Christ can describe any of the numerous messiahs of this movement. Yes, the word Christ or Christians can uh, refer to the Palestine Messianic Movement, um, but it's a later term, it's a later reformulation of the Messianic Movement in Palestine. This movement rebels against Rome in 66 and is successful. It actually defeats them militarily, so it must have been a huge movement. The victorious Jews set up a nation state directly in the Roman Empire. And the Romans had to do something about it. There was a real danger that this messianic movement could not only boil over in Judea itself, but could spread to other Jewish communities and other parts of the Roman Empire. Rome ruled its colonies with a rod of iron, and any resistance was going to be met with brute force. At this time during Nero's reign, two of the finest military men in the empire were the Flavians, Vespasian and his son Titus. Vespasian and Titus were military men. They spent a great deal of their life outside of Rome. For over a decade, they had waged war against the Druids in Brittany and Gaul. Vespasian and Titus were successful in essentially destroying the Druids. They left behind no historical record of their existence. And it's the Flavians that Nero calls upon when he needs to suppress the Jews' rebellion in Judea. Nero responded by 
asking his best general, Vespasian, and his son Titus to go into Judea with a huge army, 60, 70,000 troops, and a similar number of support individuals. So they meant business. The Romans came down to crush the rebellion. In the year 66 CE, the Flavians begin their military campaign against the Jews. They start further north in Galilee, where the first of three key events takes place. They destroy the Jewish towns of Galilee. They also capture a Jewish rebel who later becomes a critical figure in the formulation of Christianity. This is where they captured one of the leaders of the rebellion, a Jew named Josephus bar Matthias. Now, Josephus presented himself to the Flavians as a prophet. He survived. He survived apparently by telling Vespasian that the prophecies of the Jews pointed out that Vespasian would become emperor. And of course he did, so Vespasian quite liked Josephus. He used him as a translator in his entourage. He used him to appeal to the rebels to surrender. At this point, Josephus became a turncoat and worked with the Flavians against the rebellion. Meanwhile, chaos is increasing back in Rome, where Nero's rule is being threatened. In the year 68, the Senate found the courage to depose Nero and he committed suicide. Now in that circumstance, Vespasian was a prime candidate to become emperor. In the middle of this war, Vespasian returned to Rome and seized the throne. The Flavians then became the imperial family. With Vespasian becoming the new Caesar in Rome, Titus stays behind on the battlefield and sets his sights on Jerusalem, where the other two key events take place. Titus encircles Jerusalem with a wall, and finally he raises the temple, leaving not one stone atop another. It took a while. They eventually had to bring on starvation by building a wall, a barricade entirely enveloping the city. What happens, of course, is the temple in 70 is completely destroyed. For the Jews, it was the ultimate calamity because, of course, this was the house of their god and it was destroyed by the Romans quite thoroughly. Titus, of course, was the victor of this great siege. Titus carried the spoils of this captured city back to Rome for his triumph. He took the treasures of the temple, their famous seven-branch candlestick. You can see it on the arch of Titus in Rome. It celebrates that tremendous victory of Rome again triumphant. And Titus, of course, is the hero of the day. All of the artifacts from the temple that they seized, they put on public display in what they refer to as the Palace of Peace, except for one item. The Jewish scripture, Josephus records that the Flavians took and placed in their private palace where no one was allowed to see it. Although Titus Flavius successfully ended the rebellion in Judea, another rebellion soon broke out in Alexandria, Egypt. The Flavians were clear that this was not the end of the Jewish messianic movement. They also recognized that it was the Jews' messianic literature that was fueling this movement. So once they captured the Jewish scripture, they had all other copies of it destroyed. And that's why the Dead Sea Scrolls had to have been buried in a cave, because that was the only way they could be safe from the Roman destruction. There was not a single scrap of literature found from the Messianic movement until the scrolls were discovered. That's why they're such a treasure, because they're the only real voice of the Messianic movement that we have. And the real voice of the Jews' Messianic movement, according to our scholars, was violent and militaristic, not the pacifistic version depicted in the Gospels. War against Rome was a Messianic war. So that's why I say that the scrolls are not only the literature of the Messianic movement in Palestine, they're also the literature of the war against Rome. The Romans needed to subdue the Jews' religion, so they set about influencing it and changing it. 
They realise they can't destroy the Jewish religion altogether. That's not their objective. They realise they're sensible enough to realise that they can't do that. So what you have to do is try to create a type of Judaism that is benign. And it's exactly coinciding with the rise of the Flavian dynasty is the arrival of two benign forms of Jewish ideology. It's during this period that a new literature enters history, which describes a peace-loving, turn-the-other-cheek preaching Jewish Messiah named Jesus Christ. But if the Flavians wrote the Gospels, how could a Roman family know how to write Jewish literature that refers to Jewish prophecy? The answer lies in the Flavians' collaborations with a number of Jewish intellectuals, beginning with their own court historian, Josephus. Josephus arrives back in Rome with Titus. He becomes an adopted member of the Flavian family. An amazing turn of events for the Jewish turncoat. He becomes Flavius Josephus. Josephus at this time begins writing the history of the war. And he records that Titus gave him the Jewish scripture. Josephus' histories have always been associated with the origins of Christianity. Time and again you can find parallels between what Josephus writes and what turns up in the Gospels. It's a powerful evidence of their true origin. In reading the works of Josephus side by side with the Gospels, scholars have noticed parallels between the two works. It appears as though the history of Josephus records events that fulfill the prophecies of the Old and New Testaments. Early Christians understood this connection. In fact, when the Bible first began to be printed in the Middle Ages, it included the history of Josephus. He was employed to write the official history that we have. The other histories from this period have been destroyed ruthlessly by the Romans. Josephus tells us this in very chilling passages, how the Romans exerted complete control of the literature of this period. There were alternative histories of the Jewish war written. Well, the Romans rounded up the writers of those histories and executed them. They rounded up all the copies of those histories and destroyed them. That is to say, they ruthlessly wiped out any alternative history so that the only history we have is written by Josephus. And let's remember who Josephus was. Chief propagandist of the, the Flavian dynasty, and he was very, very successful. He moved back to Rome, he was given a, uh, an apartment in the emperor's own townhouse, and he was appointed the chronicler of the Roman Jewish War using Vespasian's own diaries of the events. Also in the pages of his history, Josephus declares that the Jews Messiah or Christ is none other than Flavius Vespasian and his dynastic family. To put it succinctly, Josephus says that there was a prophecy that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. The Jews thought this applied to one of their own. They were wrong in their interpretations. He used the most cynical interpretation. He applied it to the rise of the Roman emperor in Palestine. Josephus recorded that the Messianic prophecies foresaw not a Jew, but Vespasian and his dynasty. In fact, all of the Flavian historians recorded that the Flavian Caesar was the Christ. It was important to the Flavians that they be seen as the Christ, as divine and godlike, and this was not mere vanity. The Julio-Claudians before them had already established that presenting themselves as gods was a powerful tool in controlling their subjects. When the Flavians took over the throne, they inherited an enormous bureaucracy that was already in place, the imperial cult, which was dedicated to promoting the idea of Caesar as a god. Another part of the puzzle is the Roman imperial cult. Why is it important? Well, because it coincides with that same period of time as the emergence of the Christ cult. 
you had a whole social community. The whole social structure of these conquered territories um, was governed by the imperial cult. And if you wanted to succeed, the key social community to join was the imperial cult, because that's where all the movers and shakers were. This idea of the emperor becoming an, a, an object of worship was well established in the Roman system before Vespasian and Titus came along. It was prevalent in, in all major centres. It had its own priesthood. There was a ceremony, an annual celebration, annual games for the imperial cult. Now, it had many characteristics which would later colour the Christian cult. It grew in the same centres. It made claims that were later transferred to Christ. The Julio-Claudians had claimed that they were of divine descent and that they were therefore legitimate. Their power base was the Roman aristocracy, the Roman nobility. All of that collapsed into this power vacuum. Vespasian was declared emperor by the troops, by the Roman army. So effectively, it was a military coup. With the change of dynasty, they have to create a whole mythology to legitimise that dynasty. At the same time, they're creating a whole mythology to counter Jewish messianism. Somewhere along the line, those two things get mixed together. When Vespasian died, Titus began the process of having his father deified. This is a complicated process because only the Roman Senate can bestow on an individual the title of Deus or God. Titus came to the Senate and presented evidence that the life of his father had been divine. Certainly this would have included the military campaign that the Flavians waged through Judea. And it's at this time I think the Gospels were written. Because the theological structure in the Gospels of a God the Father and the Son of God is the same one that Titus would have been presenting to the Roman Senate. Well, the Roman Senate did accept Titus' evidence, and Vespasian was deified and became a god. Titus, therefore, became a son of God. The Arch of Titus that still stands in modern Rome today is inscribed with a dedication to the divine Titus, son of the divine Vespasian, or son of a god. This imperial cult set up to worship Caesar as God also provided the basis for the structure of the Roman Catholic Church. Now the rituals, paraphernalia and symbols of paganism were transferred wholesale to the Christian Church. The most obvious and clear example is where the title of the pagan chief priest of Rome, the Pontifex Maximus, became the title of the Pope the Christian Pope. If you look at who held the original bishop positions in the Catholic Church in those early times, you will see that they are members of the same pagan aristocracy. They simply changed their clothing a little bit. They wore the same garments, but they wore slightly different headdresses. They had become from being a priest of a pagan cult to being a priest of Rome. Where the Vatican now stands, there was once a pagan temple which celebrated the mysteries of a dying and resurrecting God-man who wasn't Jesus. There are many churches in Rome, I've been to a few, where you go above into the church and there is Jesus, and you go underneath and there's a little sanctuary of Mithras, and it's basically the same figure. So the Roman plot to invent Christianity is just so clever when you think about it. Through the Pope, who is God's representative on earth, they no longer needed expensive standing armies, wars and punishment of disobedient peasants. They could, through religion, rule their subjects. Over time, Roman Christianity propagated throughout the empire by way of the mass media of the day, the Roman roads. The Romans must have approved of this new religion because, as some scholars ask, if the Gospels really were Jewish literature about a Roman sentenced criminal, why wouldn't they have been destroyed? 
One of the really surprising things for me was to realise the extent of Roman control of propaganda and of literature. So that when you suddenly get all of this Christian literature arising in this period, one has to ask, well, how did that happen? The conclusion that one has to reach is that that could not have happened without some degree of complicity uh, on the part of, uh, of the Romans. So that uh, one is led to the conclusion that the Romans must be involved in the production of this literature. To produce and disseminate this literature was a huge undertaking, and the Flavians undoubtedly had collaborators. We know they were funded by the wealthiest family in the world at this time, the Alexanders, a Jewish family who served as Rome's tax collectors in Egypt. Like the Herods in Judea, the Alexanders had strong motivation to keep the Jews' messianic movement from threatening their position and their wealth. One of their family members was Philo of Alexandria, a famous Jewish theologian who was already writing works that combined Jewish beliefs with the modern Greek and Roman pagan beliefs of the day. Many scholars agree that his writings form the basis for much of the philosophy of Christianity. In these pages is uh, practically every concept that you can find within Christianity. He combined Greek philosophy, and he took that and he combined it with Judaism. On top of that, he was from an extremely wealthy family. And this is important because you have to follow the money when you're looking at major trends, new paradigms being set. And if you look at his family, then you start seeing, uh, well, this is interesting because now we're starting to come across the Flavians again. His relatives were very involved with the Flavians. That whole area is where we want to look very closely for the Christian origins. It's from exactly this same circle of people that you get the first signs of Christian ideology, and they all lead to the rise of the Flavian dynasty. Another wealthy, influential character, Princess Bernice, was from the Herod family in Judea. She's the granddaughter of Herod the Great, a product of the Herod's intermarriage with the conquered Jewish ruling messianic lineage. Princess Bernice appears in the New Testament, which makes her an interesting character. She had two or three husbands and then became the mistress of Titus. So you can see this again, rather like dynasty here. You know, powerful people, mixed marriages, you know, shacking up with the conqueror. Um, yeah, and it's really where Joe Atwell takes his idea of a conspiracy to write the New Testament. But let him say it in his own words. Bernice was a Herod related by marriage to the Alexanders. And of course, later she became the mistress to Titus. The fact that she was so closely linked with the Flavian shows you that the three families were very unified in financial, romantic, and likely theological issues. By the looks of things, this coalescence seemed to have brought about a dynamic that led to the synthesis of Judaism and paganism and eventually became Christianity. So th this is a very key time period. I believe that the Gospels were actually written under the control of the Herods, the Alexanders, and the Flavians. These families had the motivation to create Christianity and with the expertise in Judaism that the Alexanders and the Herods had, they had the actual technical ability to come up with these stories that are fulfillment of Hebraic prophecies. So it seems the Flavians had the motivation, the means, and the collaborations through which they likely constructed and began disseminating Christianity. And if our scholars are correct, one of the documents they left behind are the Gospels themselves. I began working on the study of the Gospels in the 1970s, and I look at texts in terms of how were these composed, what does understanding their structure tell you about who wrote them, and why they were written. These texts were not independent Jewish texts. 
that they were created as literary works using classical literary models. If we expect that this is the testimony of witnesses, we've got a major problem. We actually have four anonymous documents. They were not written by the named people on those documents. This is simply church tradition that the Gospels are so named according to Mark, according to Matthew. So this idea that the, the Gospels are reliable testimony is patent nonsense. Why are the Gospels called Gospels? That's a critical question. The word Gospel in Greek is Evangelion, and it means good news of military victory. Whose military victory are we celebrating here in these Gospels? Well, it seems to me that we are celebrating clearly the Roman military victory because these events, the um, Battle of Gadara, the Battle of the Lake of Galilee, the successful battle at Jerusalem, these are battles that the Romans won. Why are the Gospels celebrating battles that the Jews lost if these things were written by the Jews? The fact that the Gospels are known to us in Greek and, and not in uh, Aramaic or Hebrew is, I think, just evidence of, of their authorship. They were not written by any followers of Jesus who would have surely spoken Aramaic. And if they had been fishermen and simple folk, they would not have had the literal skills to write them anyway. If we look closely, there actually are clues in the Gospels that point to who the true authors were. A lot of the Christian literature advocates turning away from the Jewish law and obeying Roman law. Well, this, this fits perfectly into Roman propaganda purposes. And then you have, in general, the portrayal of Jesus as the peaceful Jew who is wandering around in what is depicted as a sort of a pastoral scenes, talking to fishermen and farmers and so forth, when in fact, this is a war zone. Judea is a war zone. And you ask yourself, well, why is it not portrayed as a war zone? I mean, they really had it down pat. They, kept, they have Jesus saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, which is basically in response to talking about money. Whose benefit would that be? To, it's so blatantly obvious. The perception of Roman characters in the Gospels, they're all interpreted in a favorable light. They are pro-Roman. They do not depict the Romans as the forces of evil. They reverse that. It's the Jews who become the forces of darkness. It's very striking that various passages in the Gospels refer to the Jews as some people separate from the heroes of, of Jesus and his disciples. The Jews are those who object. The Jews are those who try to thwart the divine plan. Now, that gives us a clue, certainly, to who were the true authors of this book. They are works of literature created by people who are trained in Jewish literature, but whose values are pro-Roman. The Romans wanted to promote anti-Semitism, and so they arranged the story of the beloved man-god, Jesus Christ, to appear as if the Jews had brought about his death. Because of this, uh, the Jews would have to suffer anti-Semitism throughout history. So this was a piece of work that could not have been done except by a fairly established literary team, such as the literary team that was in Rome actually writing the books of Josephus. I mean, that was written by a literary team, and it was written uh, as one of the um, attempts to give prominence to the Flavian Caesars, which the Gospels also do. So it is extremely likely that the Gospels, um, as a form of epic uh, designed to magnify allegorically the Roman Caesars, is also written um, at the court of the Flavian emperors. But the Jesus story takes place many decades before the Flavians came to power. Why would the Flavians create a work about a Jewish Messiah that wasn't even from their own era? The Gospels were very precisely backdated 40 years. Jesus' ministry was started in 30 CE, exactly 40 years from the destruction of the temple. His ministry ends at Passover, 33 CE, which is 40 years before the end of the Jewish-Roman War, which occurred at Passover in 73 CE with the famous Battle of Masada. 
the Gospels are backdated into the period of Pontius Pilate. That is to say, before the First Jewish War, which is to say, in the Julio-Claudian period. But this is typical of Flavian literature. It's a Flavian technique. What they do is they backdate this story into the period of their enemies, namely the Julio-Claudians. And so generation after generation of Christian scholar and even secular historians go hunting in the Julio-Claudian period for the origins of the Gospels. They don't really find any answers there. There are allusions in the Gospels to the destruction of the temple. The most reasonable answer to that is that these texts were written after the destruction of the temple. That is to say, in the Flavian period, after the change of dynasty. This backdating of the story of Jesus Christ, 40 years earlier from the time the Gospels may actually have been written, explains why many of the prophecies of Jesus came true within exactly 40 years. What does this all add up to? In my view, the thing that is most significant is the research by Joseph Atwell in his book, Caesar's Messiah, which suggests that the Gospels were actually created as works of Roman propaganda at the end of the Roman Jewish War under the reign of the Flavian emperors that is Titus Caesar and Vespasian Caesar. And if you end up worshipping Jesus, what you will really end up doing is worshipping Caesar in disguise. This may have been how the Flavians finally got the Jews to worship Caesar as a god, by giving them Jesus Christ, a Messiah more to the Romans' liking. But is there any actual history to this character? Where did he really come from? The mystery to me begins with his very name. In Greek, Jesus means Savior and Christ means the Messiah. This didn't strike me as something you would call a young child. These two words are already important within Judaism before Jesus Christ supposedly existed. Major biblical figures to a Jewish Greek speaking populace would already be called Christ. Their ears would already be acclimated to accepting this, this title. That, so it isn't just a, a unique name of a, a single person who it just suddenly popped up. What did we actually know about Jesus Christ the man? I don't think that Jesus can be historically defended. I don't think there's any evidence that we can extend to that particular Jesus. So when you actually set out to investigate the historical Jesus, as opposed to the Christ of faith, you very abruptly enter a void. You find that whereas you might imagine the core details of Jesus are readily known and accessible, you actually discover there's no such thing. Further, there had never been any archaeologic evidence of Jesus Christ that had ever been discovered. You cannot find an established and incontrovertible biography of Jesus at all. It doesn't exist. You enter a strange twilight zone of early Christian belief. What we have here is, is not a movement that's grown on the accretion of legends on an, a real flesh and blood man, but instead the, the development of a religious movement around the idea of a man. There isn't even an actual physical description of what Jesus looked like anywhere in the Gospels. The presentation of the Jesus character, it's somewhat of a composite of many messianic leaders of the time. Many messianic leaders of the time, most or all of whom came to a bad end, usually by crucifixion, because crucifixion was the Roman punishment for seditious activity. And the penny drop, the penny drop that Jesus, as a human being, never existed. In all of this, we're dealing with literature. We're not dealing with history. So the answer is no, there is no um, history to this character of Jesus. It's entirely a literary creation. What the Romans did was they saw the Jews' reliance and belief in prophecy. So they said, okay, they want a prophet, let's give them one. It seems that in the construction of the literary character Jesus Christ, 
The Roman authors borrowed religious concepts not only from Judaism, but also from other gods and religions that they knew. Some scholars have noticed the similarities between the story of Jesus and the ancient pagan mysteries. In ancient mythology, we find this whole strain of thought called solar mythology. Many gods are taking on solar attributes because as agricultural communities become more important, the sun becomes the big focus. For the most obvious reasons of planting and harvesting. The sun is then personified. So now we have a male sun god. It becomes a religion in many parts of the world. Christianity usurped a tremendous amount of sun worship. Some of us are saying that this was a sun god turned into a Jewish man. This December 25th birthday was in fact the winter solstice. This is really in fact the birth of the god of light. December 25th actually is the end of a three-day period of when the sun stands still. The sun appears to be dying as the days become shorter and the sun is reborn at that point. Across the ancient world, there was this form of experiential and philosophical spirituality in these mystery cults or mystery schools. Uh, and at the center of these schools, you would find a uh, mythos, which was an initiatory myth, a symbolic myth, which would help uh, people who were going through the initiatory process come to this spiritual awakening, this knowledge, this, what they called gnosis. And what you see in these myths is the elements that will later become the Jesus story. Let's ask the question, is Jesus developed from pre-existing literary characters? Jesus has certain episodes in this so-called life, and each one of them can be traced to a prior representation of that type. If you look at the, the elements which we found in the pagan mystery school myths, you find the story of a dying and resurrecting son of God who's born of a virgin, has 12 disciples, turns water into wine at a wedding, uh, it brings a new religion of love, uh, is uh, accused of heresy or of, of pro provocation by the authorities, is put to death, sometimes by crucifixion. And then if you want to commune with the God-man, you take bread and wine, and then you can come to eternal life. Well, all of this is, of course, Christianity. Easter itself is a long pre-Christian celebration of the resurrection of uh, spring from the death of winter. This is an ancient shamanic rite you'll find all over the world, that you go through a ritual death where you get reborn, but you're reborn as an awake being. So you've died just to your lower nature and woken up to your higher nature. You can find them in the Old Testament, in the, the Jewish mythology as well. It isn't just pagan parallels. I mean, the New Testament, for example, the Ascension. We have an Ascension with the Old Testament figure of Elijah, and it's a very dramatic ascension. Elisha, Elijah cycle. These are two Jewish prophets, one followed on from the other, um, which have many of the, the story elements found in Jesus. For example, there is a multiplication of food miracle, there is a raising of the dead miracle, there, there is a water miracle, there is and ultimately an ascension to heaven miracle. Is this fulfillment or is this simply copying of a useful theme? You can see where they just used Old Testament characters and scriptures as a blueprint to create this new one. A lot of the ethics of Christianity actually were around before Christianity, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is in fact from the Old Testament. It's, uh, Jesus didn't make that up. Many of the other aspects of Christian ethics, many things which we might like to applaud as very good aspects of Christian ethics, can be found in the Stoic philosophy in Rome, which, by the way, was exactly the philosophical and ethical school promoted by the Flavians. There is little that is original about Jesus. If one separates from his words advice that was in the interest of the Roman imperial family, all that you have left are 
snippets of widely known philosophies, truisms, and concepts that came directly from prior Hebraic literature. The reason I, I am now convinced there's no historical Jesus, which seems a real, like, whoa, to people who are not familiar with the idea, is a combination of things. First of all, there's no evidence for an historical man which stands up to proper scrutiny. Secondly, is the story of Jesus is full of these motifs which come from the pagan mysteries. And the third reason is because in the early Christian movement there's these two types of Christians, certainly by the second century, which I think of as Gnostics and Literalists. What marks out the Literalists who will become the Roman Empire and the Roman Catholic Church is that they've got an historical man. What marks out the Gnostics is that they see it allegorically and their great heresy is that Christ didn't come in the flesh. Now, the winners write history, and the history books have been written by the literalists. And all of the tradition about the Romans trying to torture and suppress Christians, these traditions are correct. They definitely persecuted the messianic, militaristic Christians, and they certainly would have frowned on the Gnostic, independent thinking Christians, but the Roman pacifistic giving to Caesar what is Caesar Christians, that group would have been promoted. Which makes it perfect for the Roman Empire. And it's a fascist empire. It's got a very simple message, just believe this, you don't have to transform, and you have to go through the authorities, through the bishops, through the state, ultimately. It's the perfect thing for them to pick up, and that's what they do. Our scholars agree that the Gospels are complex literary creations, drawing from both pagan and Jewish myths. But Joseph Atwell goes a step further to say that the Flavians wrote passages directly into the Gospels which show that they were the authors. One of the most famous prophecies that Jesus makes is about the coming of someone he refers to as the Son of Man. Now many people believe that he's talking about a second coming of himself. And many people believe that this is going to occur some point in the future. Well the fact is, this coming of Jesus has already occurred. Jesus makes very specific prophecies as to what will happen when the Son of Man makes his visitation. He refers to three key events. The Galilean towns will be crushed, Jerusalem will be encircled with a wall, and the temple will be raised, leaving not one stone atop another. He also states exactly when this individual will come. He says that the Son of Man will appear before the generation that is alive and listening to Jesus' words passes away. Now, to Jews of this era, a generation is 40 years. And so the only individual that could possibly be the Son of Man that Jesus predicts is Titus Flavius. Titus Flavius did destroy the Galilean towns. He did encircle Jerusalem with a wall, and he raised the temple and left not one stone atop another. And he did this within 40 years. Josephus recorded that no matter how Titus tortured the Jews, they refused to call him Lord or God. So to circumvent this stubbornness, the Flavians wrote the Gospels in which a son of man was predicted to come in the future. Titus fulfilled these prophecies and became the son of man. So you end up worshiping Titus without knowing it. To further support his thesis that the Flavians originated Christianity, Joseph Atwell points to the Roman Catholic Church's earliest saints, known as the Christian Flavians. The Flavian family is connected to early Christianity in a number of unusual ways. So many members of the family were recorded as having been among the first Roman Catholic saints. These include Flavia Domitilla, who is either Titus's sister or his niece, 
And there is an inscription honoring Flavia for donating the land that became the first Christian catacomb. And Flavia Domitilla was the first Christian saint. Her son, Clement, is recorded as having been the first Roman Catholic Pope after the Apostle Simon. In addition, there were two members of the Flavian household staff, Neros and Achilles. Both of them had churches named after them in the very earliest Christian diocese in Rome. There was a Christian theologian whose name was Titus Flavius Clemens, Clement of Alexandria. And he's the one who actually described the first Christian symbols. And he said they were the anchor, the boat, uh, the fish, the olive branch, the star. And oddly, these are the very symbols that the Flavian Caesars used on their coins. The final connecting point between the Flavian family and Christianity is that in the fourth century, Flavius Constantine made Christianity the state religion of Rome. The military achievements of Caesars were important to all Romans. So certainly, the Flavian Christians, the group that the Roman Catholic Church states were the first saints of the religion, would have known the identity of the Son of Man that Jesus predicted, who would crush Galilee and circle Jerusalem with a wall and raise the temple, was Titus Flavius. So it seems, if a person knows how to uncover them, there are actually many clues pointing to the Flavian origin of Christianity. And perhaps the most intriguing one that Joseph Atwell uncovered is a secret code the Flavians used in their documents, which enabled him to make his startling discovery. So the Romans had the Jews' scripture locked up inside their imperial court, and they studied it, and what they discovered was that there was a unique literary code hidden in the text. This hidden code, which was common in Jewish scripture, was used by the Flavian literary team to place passages into the Gospels that had to be deciphered to be understood. This hidden literary technique is known as typology. Typology is used throughout the ancient Hebraic literature. And it's a genre that is really no longer understood or used today. But simply put, typology is using events from the past to provide form and context for subsequent ones. What we're talking about is stereotypic, stereotypic. In other words, there's an idealized prototype which shows certain characteristics or performs in certain ways. For instance, one of the things they do is they take an old story and they retell it in a new form. And, uh, and they superimpose contemporary history upon old stories. And, uh, and they create these multi-layered texts. In Hebraic typology, texts were designed to be read in comparison to one another or intertextually. And in doing so, a meaning that would not be visible in the surface narration would become apparent to someone who understood the typologic connection between the stories. Hebraic typology connects prophets. Events from the life of one prophet are placed into the life of a subsequent prophet. And this shows that there is a divine pattern established by God connecting his prophets to one another. The Gospels actually show how we can decipher for ourselves this hidden code or typology that was used to create the Jesus story. At the very beginning of the Gospels, there's a primer of this typology. What the author of Matthew has done is take events from the Old Testament and place them into the life of Jesus. These events occur in the same sequence in the story of Jesus 
as they occur in the Old Testament. Numerous Bible scholars had already identified the following parallels. Both stories have a patriarch named Joseph who travels from Israel to Egypt. A ruler who massacres innocent boys. A divine character who states that all the men are dead who sought your life. And then a return from Egypt to Israel. This is followed by events which have passing through water. In the Old Testament, the Israelites pass through the Red Sea. In Matthew, Jesus is given a baptism in which he passes through water. We then travel into the wilderness. The Israelites are in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days. Finally, we have the three temptations. In the Old Testament, we have the temptation by bread, the statement, do not tempt God, and the commandment to worship only God. These appear again in Matthew, where Jesus is tempted by bread, tells the devil, do not tempt God, and instructs him to worship only God. Therefore, when you compare the life of Jesus with the life of Moses, you see a linkage that shows that the character in the Gospels was divinely connected to the character in the Old Testament. The life of the first savior of Israel, Moses, foresaw the life of Jesus, who is now claiming to be the next savior of Israel. To understand the rest of the Jesus story, his adult ministry, we simply need to know that the same system of parallel names, locations, and concepts occurring in the same sequence was used to connect Jesus in the Gospels to Titus in the works of Josephus. Our scholars explain this Gospel typology in the following three examples. Jesus comes to the Sea of Galilee at the beginning of his ministry. He gathers his disciples to him and he says, do not be afraid, follow me, and become fishers of men. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus actually says catchers of men. Titus comes to the same location, to the Sea of Galilee. He gathers his troops, his disciples, together, and he says, don't be afraid. And then he leads them. They follow him, and they attack a group of, of Jewish rebels. They sink the Jews' boats, the Jews attempt to swim to safety, and the Romans use their spears to catch them. They become fishers of men. The match isn't exact, but we should never expect it to be exact. It's simply a, a type which is repeated across the whole of the New Testament. Jesus is constantly dealing with devils. Josephus also deals with devils, but Josephus defines who these devils are. He states that the devils are those individuals who have a rebellious spirit and rebel against Rome. At Gadara, Jesus encounters one man who has a legion of demons inside his mind. They then are driven out by Jesus. They infect a herd of swine, and then this herd rushes wildly into the water. This is a parallel to Titus's battle at Gadara, where one individual infects an entire legion of Jews with his demonic spirit, and then that group in turn infects another group, and this combined group is driven by the Romans into the sea. What's being suggested here is that this story that you find in the Gospels is in some ways sort of like a, a grim parable about that military event. It's sort of like a bit tongue-in-cheek, I think. The Romans had a vicious sense of humour like this, a very black sense of humour. In a medieval text that I've studied, which is called the Gospel of Barnabas, when you read that story, the way it's presented is in an unsophisticated form, that is to say it's sort of been decoded in some ways and it, it becomes clear that what's uh, that uh, 
what we're talking about here are um, the Jewish rebels are chased into the sea and they drown in the sea. In the Gospels, these are presented as pigs. This is a, this is a, a once again, a very dark, black sort of Roman sense of humour. Some of these literature really needs to be understood like that. In Josephus's biography, he describes when he was in the entourage of Titus during the closing stages of the siege of Jerusalem, he chanced upon three of his friends who were being crucified. And he pleaded with Titus for their release. And Titus gave that permission and the three figures were removed from the cross. Two of them died and one revived. Now, if you're looking for a stereotypic example of how some idea was floated into the mind of someone writing the Gospels, that is a pretty clear example. It's certainly a strange occurrence that we find such an incident in the works of Josephus when it shows up in such a dramatic form in the Gospels. In the Gospels, Joseph of Arimathea asked the Roman commander to take Jesus down from the cross. In Josephus' history, Joseph Barmatheus asked the Roman commander to take someone down from the cross. Arimathea is a pun on Josephus' last name, Barmatheus. When you read our sources really carefully, and you have to do it really, really carefully, because uh, they didn't spell it out for us, it's, uh, it's effectively very well hidden. Um, we have to understand that our literature, a lot of our literature is essentially propaganda. The Romans are not writing objective history and all of our literature has been through Roman filters. Perhaps that's the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that uh, this is literature that hasn't been through the Roman filters. It's important to realize that Josephus wrote in an era when allegory was regarded as a science. Educated readers were expected to be able to see another meaning in religious texts than the one that appeared in the surface narration. We're dealing with Roman literature on the one hand and Jewish literature on the other, and it has to be said that in both cases, they're much more sophisticated, much more multi-layered and allusive and much trickier than modern readers suspect. No, it's not a simple literature. It's very, very complex allegorical literature that indulges in the literary games that the Romans played. The more you understand about Roman literature in this period, and then you place the Gospels and other Christian literature in that same milieu, you can start to see the games that are being played in that literature. Now, these parallels have been seen by other scholars. But what they failed to notice is that they occur in the same sequence and thereby they create a typologic pattern. The Flavian thesis, it's trying to read these texts in context because in any given text, you've got the text in the first instance and then you've got the context, the environment in which it happens. And of course, in all of these texts also, you've got a subtext. So you've got text, context and subtext and you have to be able to read all of those things. And unfortunately, many religious people who are coming out of seminaries, who are coming out of religious colleges, they're just not being trained in this sort of uh, level of reading. They're instead being trained to just read on one level, which is a literal level. And uh, I think that that's very unfortunate and that that really needs to be challenged. By studying the multiple layers in these ancient texts in the original Greek language, Joseph Atwell was able to discover not just a handful, but over 40 typological parallels between the Gospels and the works of Josephus, which show that the ministry of Jesus Christ followed in exact sequence the military campaign of Titus Flavius through parallel names, locations, and concepts. Once I understood the system that the Flavians were using to link Jesus and Titus, I was able to discover dozens of these parallels between Jesus and Titus. And what was amazing is that they occurred in the same sequence. And this simply proves that this was deliberate, that these unusual parallels had been created by the Flavians as a signature. 
It is their way of telling posterity that they authored the Gospels. These parallels are the Flavian signature of the Gospels. Both Jesus and Titus begin their campaigns at the Sea of Galilee and then go into the Galilean countryside followed by a journey to Jerusalem. Once they reach the city's outskirts, they pause for a period before they enter. Finally, they leave the city where their campaigns come to an end. To catalog the many parallels, I gave each one a convenient name that related to the concept in that particular parallel set. Starting at Galilee, each of these are episodes that occurred both in the gospel story of Jesus and in the history of Titus's military campaign. Both Jesus and Titus journeyed to Jerusalem, each sending messengers ahead to meet him when he gets to the city. When the Romans get to Jerusalem, they notice that the Jewish factions are fighting against themselves. At this point in the Gospels, Jesus talks about a house divided against itself cannot stand. Then Josephus wrote that in preparation for battle, Titus ordered all of the fruit trees between the Roman camp and the walls of Jerusalem cut down. At this point in the Gospels, Jesus states that if a fruit tree does not bear good fruit, cut it down. Titus goes around the walls of Jerusalem looking for the best place to construct a tower from which they can launch their attack. At this point in the Gospels, Jesus asks which one of you who is going to build a tower doesn't first sit down and think about the cost. At this point in the history, Titus sends Josephus to ask the Jews what terms they will accept for peace. In the Gospels, Jesus describes a king who sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. Both Jesus and Titus at this point have triumphant entrances into Jerusalem, during which, amazingly, stones are said to cry out. Each then drives a den of thieves out from the area in front of the temple. This is followed by Titus encircling Jerusalem with a wall and Jesus predicting that Jerusalem will be encircled with a wall. Because of the wall, starvation sets in in Jerusalem. Josephus wrote that a woman named Mary, who called her son a myth for the world, slayed him, ate him, thereby turning him into a human Passover lamb. In the Gospels, we now have the Last Supper. Jesus tells his disciples, take, eat, this is my body, this is my blood, thereby turning him into a human Passover lamb. Here then, is the Flavian signature of their authorship of the Gospels. You can see the fingerprints, that they've left their fingerprints all over these texts. You can start to, as it were, decode uh, these texts and uh, start to arrive at some really startling conclusions about how early Christianity first arose. Our scholars have shown that the Gospels were not the product of primitive Jewish fishermen. Rather, they are a sophisticated literary work combining religious ideas of the day with Roman political perspective and power. Joseph Atwell's research reveals that reading the works of Josephus concurrently with the New Testament shows that the events of Jesus' life were not historical, but rather all of them are dependent on the events in the military campaign of Titus Flavius. Jesus Christ was an allegory for the Roman Caesar Titus, the Messiah of the Roman Empire, 
the Roman son of a god that Christianity was set up to worship. I certainly don't want to undermine the positive things in Christianity. I'm happy to admit that there are positive things in Christianity and in other religions as well. What's at issue here are the historical claims of these religions. Traditionally, religious dogma has forbidden the examination of historical discoveries or the inclusion of certain scientific findings in their teachings, asking their followers instead to blindly believe as they say, not as the objective facts may show. We live in a time, perhaps it's a new intellectual renaissance, which is getting fed up with many of the structures that we live with and which is recognizing major frauds at the heart of our financial markets and the heart of, heart of our industry and the plug is being pulled on them. And my view is that we have yet another fraud, the biggest of them all, and it's a fraud at the heart of Christianity. And it is a time for whistleblowers to come out and to make this information available not just to scholars in academic journals, but to have it widely available to anybody who wants to know. It's helpful to hear a wide diversity of voices in order for people to arrive at their own conclusions, and the theories brought forth by our scholars are a part of that diversity. When they hear that the Jesus story is a myth, people feel that you're taking something away, but you're really not. You push people and you go, why do you believe in historical Jesus? Often people will go, well, you know, the Bible or something. But when you go, well, have you studied it as an historical document? Have you looked at the evidence? They'll go, well, no, I haven't. So that's not the real reason. The real reason when you push people is, well, I have a relationship with Jesus. I have a personal relationship with Jesus, and that's what I don't want to lose. And that's a really good reason to be a Gnostic and a really bad reason to be a literalist. The Gnostics, as well as pre-Christian pagan mystery schools, believed that the myth of the dying and resurrecting God-man was an allegory to be used for personal growth, to die to their lower nature and arise to their higher nature. The literalists took control of the original myth and shaped it so it would take the power away from the individual and place it into a central authority. Rediscovering the original myth gives people the freedom to choose the beliefs that truly serve them. Okay, some Christians have developed their personal faith to the extent that Christ is this energy or force or power within them. This is how they have interpreted the story now. The story has become again what it actually began as an allegory. I have no issue with the Christ within. I have an issue with the, with the church militant. What threatens humanity is organized, regimentized religion on the march, taken so seriously that you will act out its worst precepts. If we examine all the religions of the world, we find that there is a common thread that connects all faiths and all people. And it is from this connection that we can make the choices that have now become so critical to our future. I like to focus on the origins of religious ideas. And it turns out that they're very unifying underneath uh, all of the divisiveness that we see on the surface. It would be extremely helpful for all of humanity to realize that there is this underlying unity. And those origins are basically nature worship, the study of the sun, the moon, the stars, planets. This is all what humanity has been looking at, of course, with great awe and reverence for thousands of years. And it's extremely important, I think, for us to get back to those roots. The destruction of the planet is also directly tied to religious ideas. This can help to restore balance to the planet in a very, very profoundly significant way. The very survival of humanity depends on viewing history from a new perspective so that we can be clearer on the historical facts and still honor the myths that offer us the greatest wisdom. It's uh, what the myth, what the poetry says that matters uh, not what actually actually happened. 
So each new generation, whatever you say, is going to hear the myth. And that's what is true for them. And what follows is uh, uh, the actual history is much too complex for the average person to ever get their head around. Though the actual history is complex, and we may never know all the facts about what happened 2,000 years ago, the voices of our scholars are contributing to an ever-widening dialogue and the growing paradigm shift being witnessed all around the world today that can lead to a more empowered and enlightened humanity tomorrow. This is really important for our culture to understand where Christianity came from and this is direct evidence. You can actually walk this path and come to this conclusion. You can know that Christianity was an invention of the Romans. It was done to pacify their subjects. And this is important because it gives us a different way of understanding government, how government operates, the tools that government uses, the purpose that government has for the various propaganda apparatus. Evangelical Christians are getting away with debunking facts as mere theories, even subjects like evolution, but they provide no evidence for their position other than to simply cite religious dogma. And if you look at the influence that dogma is having in the media today, you can easily see it is increasing. I would like to challenge these extremists to consider the possibility that my findings are correct. Though there is much good in Christianity, we have to understand how rulers have used it to control us and how they are still using it to control us today. I hope citizens will be more skeptical when they hear an authority figure using faith to interpret laws or a belief in Armageddon to create governmental policies. The Flavians encoded a secret message into the Gospels, which we can now understand in a new light. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free.
this is the sun. As far back as 10,000 BC, history is abundant with carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun would rise, bringing vision, warmth and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness of night. Without it, the cultures understood, the crops would not grow and life on the planet would not survive. These realities made the sun the most adorned object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn cataloged celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of a year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or God, God's sun, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the twelve constellations represented places of travel for God's sun and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun anthropomorphized, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy known as Set. And Set was the personification of the darkness or night. And, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the virgin Isis, Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, which, in turn, three kings followed to locate and adorn the newborn savior. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher. And at the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the truth, the light, God's anointed son, the good shepherd, the lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected. Krishna of India, born of the virgin Devaki, with a star in the east signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and upon his death was resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten Son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others. And upon his death, he was resurrected. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th, he had 12 disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the Truth, the Light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. The fact of the matter is, there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world which subscribe to these general characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? 
Why the virgin birth on December 25th? Why dead for three days in the inevitable resurrection? Why 12 disciples or followers? To find out, let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adorn the new savior. He was a child teacher at 12, and at the age of 30 he was baptized by John the Baptist, and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples which he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick, walking on water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which on December 24th aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why the Three Kings follow the star in the east, in order to locate the sunrise the birth of the sun. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. The ancient glyph for Virgo is the altered M. This is why Mary, along with other virgin mothers, such as Adonis' mother Myra, or Buddha's mother Maya, begin with an M. Virgo was also referred to as the house of bread. And the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to house of bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on earth. There is another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolize the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. For the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share the crucifixion, three-day death and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring and thus salvation. However, they did not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter. This is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night, and the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. Probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the 12 disciples. They are simply the 12 constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the sun, travels about with. In fact, the number 12 is replete throughout the Bible. This text has more to do with astrology than anything else. Coming back to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol. 
the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the zodiac. This is why Jesus in early occult art is always shown with his head on the cross, for Jesus is the Son, the Son of God, the light of the world, the risen Savior who will come again, as it does every morning, the glory of God who defends against the works of darkness as he is born again every morning and can be seen coming in the clouds up in heaven with his crown of thorns or sun rays. Now, of the many astrological, astronomical metaphors in the Bible, one of the most important has to do with the ages. Throughout the scriptures there are numerous references to the age. In order to understand this, we need to be familiar with a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. The ancient Egyptians, along with cultures long before them, recognized that approximately every 2150 years, the sunrise on the morning of the spring equinox would occur at a different sign of the zodiac. This has to do with a slow, angular wobble that the Earth maintains as it rotates on its axis. It is called a precession because the constellations go backwards rather than through the normal yearly cycle. The amount of time it takes for the precession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year. And ancient societies were very aware of this, and they referred to each 2150 year period as an age. From 4300 BC to 2150 BC, it was the age of Taurus, the bull. From 2150 BC to 1 AD, it was the age of Aries, the ram. And from 1 AD to 2150 AD, it is the age of Pisces, the age we are still in to this day. And in and around 2150, we will enter the new age, the age of Aquarius. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshipping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshipping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Ares the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Ares, and upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Ares, the age of Pisces, or the two fish. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we have all seen the Jesus fish on the back of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22.10, when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the next Passover will be after he is gone, Jesus replies, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer, who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the sun, God's son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, 
as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, the main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation, among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true, as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Furthermore, the character of Jesus being a literary and astrological hybrid is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. For example, inscribed about 3,500 years ago on the walls at the Temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Immaculate Conception, the Birth, and the Adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth announcing to the Virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the Virgin, and then the Virgin Birth and the Adoration. This is exactly the story of Jesus' miracle conception. In fact, the literary similarities between the Egyptian religion and the Christian religion are staggering. plagiarism is continuous. The story of Noah and Noah's Ark is taken directly from tradition. The concept of the Great Flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims in different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a great flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove, all held in common with the biblical story, among many other similarities. And then there is the plagiarized story of Moses. Upon Moses' birth, it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide. He was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince. This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid infanticide and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. Furthermore, Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver in a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt, there was Mises, who carried stone tablets and upon them the laws of God were written. Manu, Minos, Mises, Moses. And as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. What the Book of the Dead phrased, I have not stolen, became thou shalt not steal. I have not killed, became thou shalt not kill. I have not told lies, became thou shalt not bear false witness, and so forth. In fact, the Egyptian religion is likely the primary foundational basis for the Judeo-Christian theology. Baptism, afterlife, final judgment, virgin birth, death and resurrection, crucifixion, the Ark of the Covenant, circumcision, saviors, holy communion, great flood, Easter, Christmas, Passover, and many, many more are all attributes of Egyptian ideas long predating Christianity and Judaism. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders, wrote, When we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, 
was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem sons of Jupiter. In a different writing, Justin Martyr said, he was born of a virgin, except this in common with what you believe of Perseus. It's obvious that Justin and other early Christians knew how similar Christianity was to the pagan religions. However, Justin had a solution. As far as he was concerned, the devil did it. The devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create his characteristics in the pagan world. Fundamentalist Christianity, fascinating. These people actually believe the world is 12,000 years old. I swear to God. I actually asked one of these guys, okay, dinosaur fossils. He says, dinosaur fossils? God put those here to test our faith. I think God put you here to test my faith, dude. The Bible is nothing more than an astrotheological literary hybrid, just like nearly all religious myths before it. In fact, the aspect of transference of one character's attributes to a new character can be found within the book itself. In the Old Testament, there is the story of Joseph. Joseph was a prototype for Jesus. Joseph was born of a miracle birth. Jesus was born of a miracle birth. Joseph was of 12 brothers. Jesus had 12 disciples. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Brother Judah suggests the sale of Joseph. Disciple Judas suggests the sale of Jesus. Joseph began his work at the age of 30. Jesus began his work at the age of 30. The parallels go on and on. Furthermore, is there any non-biblical historical evidence of any person living with the name Jesus, the son of Mary, who traveled about with 12 followers, healing people and the like? There are numerous historians who lived in and around the Mediterranean, either during or soon after the assumed life of Jesus. How many of these historians document this figure? Not one. However, to be fair, that doesn't mean defenders of the historical Jesus haven't claimed the contrary. Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, and Tacitus are the first three. Each one of their entries consists of only a few sentences at best, and only referred to Christus or the Christ, which in fact is not a name but a title. It means the Anointed One. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Sadly, it is still cited as truth. You would think that a guy who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for all eyes to see and perform the wealth of miracles acclaimed to him would have made it into the historical record. It didn't because once the evidence is weighed, there are very high odds that the figure known as Jesus did not even exist. We don't want to be unkind, but we want to be factual. We don't want to cause hurt feelings, but we want to be academically correct in what we understand and know to be true. Christianity just is not based on truth. We find that Christianity was in fact nothing more than a Roman story developed politically. The reality is, Jesus was the solar deity of the Gnostic Christian sect. And like all other pagan gods, he was a mythical figure. It was the political establishment that sought to historize the Jesus figure for social control. By 325 AD in Rome, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea. It was during this meeting that the politically motivated Christian doctrines were established and thus began a long history of Christian bloodshed and spiritual fraud. And for the next 1600 years, the Vatican maintained a political stranglehold on all of Europe, leading to such joyous periods as the Dark Ages, along with enlightening events such as the Crusades and the Inquisition.
Christianity, along with all other theistic belief systems, is the fraud of the age. It serves to detach the species from the natural world, and likewise each other. It supports blind submission to authority. It reduces human responsibility to the effect that God controls everything, and in turn awful crimes can be justified in the name of a divine pursuit. And most importantly, it empowers those who know the truth, but use the myth to manipulate and control societies. The religious myth is the most powerful device ever created and serves as the psychological soil upon which other myths can flourish. A myth is an idea that, while widely believed, is false. In a deeper sense, in the religious sense, a myth serves as an orienting and mobilizing story for a people. The focus is not on the story's relation to reality, but on its function. A story cannot function unless it is believed to be true in the community or the nation. It is not a matter of debate. If some people have the bad taste to raise the question of the truth of the sacred story, the keepers of the faith do not enter into debate with them. They ignore them or denounce them as blasphemers. It is wrong, blasphemous, and sinful for you to suggest, imply, or help other people come to the conclusion that the U.S. government killed 3,000 of its own citizens. Now that's Wallace Budge talking about your African ancestral history. Now let's break it down. Okay. On this relief, brothers and sisters, you can see many concepts where they came in, as I said, like scavengers, and picked different pieces. On this particular relief, you can see where the Western world through Judaism took a piece of a concept of the creation story from. You can see where the Greek philosophers took a concept of Greek philosophy from. And you can also see where Christianity took a concept, European Christianity took a concept from. So let's break it down. Again, carved in stone on the temple of Aset, right here on the island of Philae. It is here. It tells where the Western world literally came like scavengers and took various scenes to make up the Western world. And one of those scenes is we see that Hermes Trismegistus and Greece, Greek mythology, they literally took it from Tahuti. It is here that our ancestors had a study from the 42 books of Tahuti, representing science, law, and intelligence, who was represented as the Ibis bird that you saw. We saw those little white birds that we saw come yeah. over here. So our ancestors looked at nature. We didn't worship the bird, yeah. but it was an attribute of science, yeah. attribute of intelligence. Tahuti writing down the deeds of our life on earth as we lived here. This is where the Western philosophical thought, Greeks took their concept of Hermes Trismegistus from Tahuti, now called thought too. So we see uh, Judaism took uh, God Kanum fashioning man out of clay and mm -hmm. called him Jehovah. But notice the God Kanum fashioning man on the potter's wheel mm -hmm. out of clay. This is where Judaism took a portion of this to make up their Genesis story with the Sanhedrins around 250 BC. From this relief right here of God fashioning man and woman on the potter's wheel. And they took other concepts of atom from Heliopolis creation story or the city of On to make up their Adam as a man when actually it was Atom the sun. Mm -hmm. And we see European Christianity took from the goddess Isis and Horus and made up the European, again, let me express, the European version of Mary and Jesus. Copied directly from these re reliefs right here. So you got Greek philosophy where he took from Tahuti and called it Hermes Trismegistus. You got the Jehovah uh, Genesis creation story and the Bible where they uh, took from Canum fashioning man on the potter's wheel out of clay and they turned it into making man out of clay, Adam out of clay. And you also got Christianity right here showing Isis uh, uh, lactating or breastfeeding the holy child Horus who was born of a Immaculate Conception and Virgin Birth. Mm -hmm. okay. Three concepts just from this one relief. Wow, you see? All okay. carved in stone. As you can see the line, one dark, one light, showing where this temple was under the water. Mm -hmm. Nobody could come back and read this. 
And that's why over here, if you look against this wall right here, much of it, they try to chisel it all out. But our ancestors wrote endlessly as though one day we would forget our story. One day we would not know who we are. One day that the only thing that we, we, we put on our genetic memory bank would be an alien, a conqueror's story. In our mind, our story would not be told. And that's why Justinian in the 6th century AD came in and closed these temples down because they were copying Christianity, the theological concepts from African people. And we'll get more into that during the lecture when we uh, uh, have the lecture series this afternoon. I want to even go further to show you, sisters, that y'all sacred. You are goddesses. And that's, that's the problem with the brother today because they took that concept out of his consciousness. That's why the, the rap groups around there calling her the bees and stuff. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Okay, now look. Ice is holding the Ark of Life. We know what the Ark of Life now is a symbol of her uterus, right? So here, again, I show you showing where the Holy Child is coming from her womb. Oh, See the loop? That's why she's holding it, because she wants the first immaculate conception of the first holy birth is going to come from her. So she's holding the Ark for life. Can you see it? Not too much yeah, glare there, right? Yeah. No, that's, that's, yeah, why, yeah. that's why the Europeans, when Justinian and the boys Theodosius, they came in, they tried to chisel it out. Mm. Couldn't deal with the real Immaculate Conception, but they weren't talking about one Immaculate Conception. Our ancestors were telling us on these release that every woman could produce an Immaculate Conception, provided that she was on the spiritual level and the man was on the spiritual level. The both of them coming together produced Immaculate Virgin Birth, which means a clean birth. But notice they chiseled out the, off the top part of it because that represents the womb. But the other part they kept there to represent the crucifix. You see? That symbol that they didn't take or didn't chisel out was a symbol of the cross. They didn't chisel that one out. So this is another picture of Constantine. Constantine's vision of the cross, which he is pointing to this symbol, Sec Vincius. And this symbol we shall conquer through this symbol we shall conquer supposedly Constantine got the cross out on the battlefield another picture but now that we know that Constantine came here now we know where in fact Constantine got the cross from huh right off of your ancestor uh, uh, temples has nothing to do with uh, this is blowing here it has nothing to do with no uh, crucifixion or human sacrifice Europeans corrupted it now, we have no understanding or meaning of what the cross means today. And chisel out the ankh, which is a symbol for life.